you know, ETC because uh, the lady is uh, very young and uh, we did the, the plating, you know, quickly. And certainly, you know, the, the anesthesiologist said that, uh, you know, he, she, the patient is not good. You know, you need to fix it very faster and stop the operation. It's uh, amazing. And uh, we continued DCO in all external fixator. So what do you think? You know, the, we mix the ETC as well as the DCO at the same time. And so it was uh, starting with the ETC and change to DCO. So probably this, there is a new terminology of EAC, right? So early appropriate care. And this is a preoperative chest. It's quietly, you know, the nothing and normal. And this is a day zero. You see that the, a lot of the problems, you know, the upper, you know, lobes in the both sides. And this is a day 25. You see that this is a decelerated in the rigidity. And, uh, you know, she was a very nice, you know, the, in no, before the injury. Now the whole intelligence is quite low. Seems like this is a, you know, one of the fatal fat embolism is a, is a cerebral fat embolism what happened to her and uh, she, she could work, but she had a joint contracture and severe uh, limping and decreased uh, intelligence. So any comments in this case? I, I appreciate. So, uh, Daval, you mentioned that you would do damage control orthopedics for this case. Do you think it would have made any difference to the outcome in this particular patient? Or because you mentioned fat embolus syndrome, and it, it's one of these concepts that we think about, worry about, but we're never quite sure when it's going to happen. Uh, so, whenever we have done uh, X fix in, in all four limb fractures, two or three observations have been good. The, the ICU time has been less. Patients have, you know, uh, spent lesser time than ICU. And um, we, we, we haven't had worsening. Like I had one case exactly similar to what uh, uh, here CW has shown. Only fortunately is after two months of ICU stay, this guy has recovered to, to completely normal. But we did early total care and event exactly into what CW stored. So, um, if it's all four limbs, all both tibia, both femur, I think I think it's safer to do damage control. So, so Joel, uh, if you didn't know the outcome, right? So we will rewind and forget the outcome of it, and it looked clear, and you had four uh, four long bone injuries, and the blood pressure seemed to be okay, and the low ISS. What would have been your approach? I would go for uh, fixing the open fracture first, and after every step, I reassess this patient. Pet embolism does happen in patients who had no f surgery at all. Uh, yeah. In World War One, before, without fixation, they had uh, fat embolism. You can't tell that this patient had fat embolism from uh, surgery or get fat embolies because the, the, she didn't have her long bone fixed. And uh, uh, the uh, CW steam done minimally invasive surgery on the, on the uh, right uh, leg. Very interesting. Uh, not, you, not reaming the medullary canal. The other important thing that fat embolies doesn't happen in uh, patients who are not in shock. So in healthy people, you can infuse olive oil and nothing happens. So they have to have, uh, have, to have a shock to uh, uh, generate a fat embolism. So, and also the other comment is that younger patients tend to have more severe inflammatory response and acute lung injury. So the reason being young is not necessarily uh, uh, excused to, to go ahead. Some of these patients get much sicker. Okay, so the, can I go ahead and another two cases remain? Absolutely, CW. Yeah. We might yeah. only do one, but let's see how we go. Yeah, the, you know, you know, especially in the bilateral femur fracture, you know, DCO is the, it may help to control the inflammatory the insult, and probably it may prevent FBS syndrome. 
And at least, uh, I think you know, it may lessen the severity of the FES. So the bilateral femur fracture is, uh, we know that uh, it is, uh, it has a higher risk of the systemic complication. We may say that it is a borderline patient with uh, this uh, bilateral uh, femur fractures. So we know that uh, in a significant high percentage of a severely associated injury as well as a blood loss. And even you know, absence of acute associated injuries, uh, FES or you know, thromboembolism may precipitate the clinical situation. And we know that these are the, our borderline patients. You know, the bilateral femur fracture is one of them. And uh, we need to have a research station and re-evaluation. And if it is uncertain, we may go to the DCO. The, if it is uh, stable, we can go to ETC. It seems like uh, we have a clear cut, you know, to manage uh, this uh, bilateral femur fractures. I have uh, another, you know, bilateral femur fractures and the right tibia fractures. The patient is, uh, you know, only the, the extremity fractures. Uh, ISS is nine and borderline. And, you know, he is uh, quite a lot. He can tell the, his name and the, all the, you know, the, you know, the stories. And what is your decision? Please, <laughs> any comments? So, Naratip, what, what, what would be your decision? Yes, sir. I think that in this case, the patient came up uh, with some, uh, well, borderline blood pressure, but I think we can uh, resuscitate this patient uh, because his uh, conscious is still good. And again, uh, in this case, if we can stabilize his vital sign, we're still able to fix it. I think it will be good. Any so other opinions? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Professor. Uh, where, yeah, where yeah, please. Yeah. And Daval, what would what would be your thoughts? So I think with two femur in my book, I I, I think a damage control is safer. I would I would not err on nailing all this at the first go. Okay, so we have a uh, quite a separate opinions from our expert panelists. You know, ETC or DCO. And we did a DCO, the axonal fixation, in the older, you know, the femur fractures as well as the tibia fractures. So, you know, what can be the, our the next definite fixation? So we can choose the whenever possible, or the at window period, you know, from the our the literature, and the when stabilized completely. So, but unfortunately, in day five. He was quite unstable. You know, the, all the saturation is going down, aggravated, and uh, he cannot remember all the story and now. And then the, we need to start uh, the ventilator care. And the, we had a re-evaluation, and the chest is improved. And now he is uh, something in the borderline. And we had a fixation and femur and tibia, but we could not do the, the left side because, you know, the, there is another the re evaluation and uh, it was not good in the operating theater to continue the, our operation. And then the left side, we continue the X fix. And now is uh, day 26. Now he is uh, getting stable and uh, we had a re evaluation. And then in day 27, uh, we had a fixation. Uh, he had a HOFA, and I, I expect a good lecture from the Tirachai. And then, so now he's, uh, you know, in this condition and uh, very stable. Okay, so any other comments in this case? Yeah, uh, CW, one of the things you've highlighted is flexibility in approach. Yeah, David, would you or Jolt, would you like to make some comments about, you know, the flexibility that uh, CW has demonstrated in terms of being uh, a plan according to the patient status rather than a philosophy of treatment? I think Jolt's uh, made some good comments here in our chat group, and that 
so much of this depends on the, the patient's physiology, both at the time of their injury, the time of their uh, early trip to theatre, and then how they recover after it. And rather the, the sort of flexible thinking where we're monitoring our patients and trying to identify what's their major injury and deal with that in a time appropriate fashion is, is really the, the best possible care that we can give for these patients. And um, the reassessment is, is important. Other important things for me are how do I mobilize my patient? How do I sit them up? And what's better for their lungs and their belly? Um, and so I have a tendency to fix fractures where I can sit patients up and out of bed more comfortably. And, uh, and that's probably where I think about starting, if I was going to order things, where I would start my order from. CW, I have a query for you. When you're uh, fixing the patients, Jolt's made a comment about, you know, it not necessarily be being dependent on the number of fractures, but more dependent on the physiology of the patient. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's right. You know, the, we need to, you know, think about that, you know, you know not the, just the number of the fracture, num you know, the, in, the, in the extremities. You know, the more important thing is uh, the many, you know, the criteria that we need to think about the physiologic status. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, the, that opinion from the Joe. And, you know, the, I may continue the, you know, the another case. And since, you know, the, as Joel said, you know, the ETC, you know, the made the you know, second hit, I think that was, uh, over, you know, overemphasized. And then the, we are thinking about the new plan of, a, you know, bespoke plan of the action based on the reassessment and the reaction to the response to the injury and the surgery. And probably this is, uh, you know, kind of a, E EAC, so we can call it the early appropriate care. And uh, now, you know, there are many references about, uh, you know, the, to think about the timing of a uh, surgery in the polytrauma. You know, the, we are hearing that the many, you know, the voice of uh, using the early appropriate care and pitch, you know, the resuscitation to improve, you know, acidosis is quite critical to reduce the older morbidity and mortality. And this is a final case that I can continue. And you see that another femur fracture in the young patient, as well as uh, IS uh, separation. And what is your, you know, the decision? So I have uh, about five minutes and we need to quick go through very fast, but just a short uh, comment, ETC or DCO? Naval, which one would you choose? I think this fracture, um, unless, especially for the pelvic ring, if you don't, uh, you know, do, um, you know, put in screws and, and put in an X fix, it'll be a combination like appropriate care for the pelvis. Um, so it won't be called as DC or complete for you. It'll be a mixture of things here. Jolt, I've had a, co a comment from you, Jolt. It's a brief one because. You know, when we talk about ABC, when you have an open pelvis, that's a really internal hemorrhagic event. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, even in ATLS, uh, now they're talking about CABC. So uh, we need to treat something which is obviously uh, reversible. If this pelvic fracture is open, uh, that's basically in an open femur fracture, this patient is dying from these injuries. All right. So, can I go ahead? Yes, CW, please do. Okay, so, the, you know, as your comment, and uh, we need to fix that, you know, the femur open fracture, as well as we had, a, you know, axe fix on the, the, the pelvis, and we had, a, you know, the IS screw for the anti shock and they're fixing the, you know, separation of the IS joint. And then, so that can be, you know, the, we have the ETC as well as the DCO, and it's a combined, you know, the terminology of EAC from the death size comment. And that is a definite management of a mechanical unstable fracture on, within the 24 or the 36 hours of injury. So as long as a patient has a, you know, good response to the resuscitation, 
the using the all the you know the criteria so we can do it and then this is on second day he, he was uh, quite stable in this you know the, in ICU and then the, we had a definite fixation of the pelvis in the two weeks later and this is about six months uh, follow up you know with a good healing and good function except you know uh, his neurology from the initial injury all right, so the, I may summarize my talk in you know, the EAC. You know, the, so we know that the, now it is uh, the acceptably, you know, having the low rates of the, the complication and the safe in most patients with the multiple uh, trauma, polytrauma patient, as uh, Jolt said. And there is another terminology of a uh, safe, definite surgery similar to the, the this EAC. It's uh, another dynamic approach for the severely injured patient. And this is a flow chart. So we know that the borderline and unstable and in extreme patient, and in borderline and unstable, the, we need to have a research station and the reassessment. And the, if it is a stable, we go to the SDS or the EAC. If it is a borderline, we reassess and the, you know another and a stable patient can be the surgery and borderline we continue the evaluation and uh, getting stabilized and this is a uh, you know the recent very recent you know the management now now we already started from the you know dichotomy to of a DCO or the ETC and to a you know the we are having a departure to the EAC okay. And this is my summary slide and take home message. In current management, the polytrauma, you know, it provides the patient is responding appropriately. Research station is continued in the OR, while the major fracture is a, uh, fixation is performed. And safety of the treating the polytrauma femoral fractures with the nailing is quite established. But when it is doubt, we think that the DCO is that you know, probably the safest one. Thank you very much. Any comments? Thank you, CW. Thank you very much for your uh, for your cases. And um, in the interest of time, we'll just move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. So thank now you. I'd like to um, introduce uh, Catherine McDougall. Uh, Ka Catherine's the uh, Deputy Director at the Prince Charles Hospital because um, she's a new presenter at the APLA and hopefully this is a, one presentation amongst many in the future and the Senior Lecturer at the University of Queensland. And other than spending her spare time talking to us, she's also a Specialist Reservist with the Australian Defence Forces. So welcome, Catherine. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Marini, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, that was uh, such a great previous presentation. I, I think you're going to find this quite a different change of pace. <laughs> um, the question I was given today is, management of the elderly NOF patients is emergent treatment necessary? And these are my declarations. So the learning objectives for this session are to understand the issues surrounding emergency, tr emergency treatment for elderly NOF patients, to review the evidence, be aware of the guidelines that exist and understand the common modifiable factors that contribute to theatre delays. So the way I've prepared this, I was asked to do case-based um, uh, and I think case-based with this particular question is a little bit tricky because one of our realities is it's not so much about the x-ray, it's completely about the different patients. And so the case-based part is really about the individual patient factors rather than the actual trauma. <clears throat> so over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to cover the question in detail. What's the problem with emergent versus non-emergent treatment? What are the potential solutions? And then the reality of what actually happens um, the way I framed it is to uh, speak for maybe 15 minutes and have the opportunity then for discussion. So emergency surgery itself is well defined. That's surgery to treat trauma or acute illness subsequent to, a, to an emergency presentation. 
The way that works in our hospitals is that it doesn't mean a patient has to be managed within their initial hospital hospital stay. They can go home and come back. Um, but it, it must be related to an acute, acute illness. The way we categorise broadly is sort of A, immediate, B, within four hours, C, within 24 hours, and then D, within 10 days. And for all of you who work in our hospitals, we'd understand that, in fact, one of the challenges with the NOF patients is with these standard categorisation uh, allocations, they usually fit between a C and a D. Um, and obviously there's big disparity in that space. So we're talking about the low energy fragility factor, completely different to the fractures that you've just seen. And my question then is, so what is emergent? Broadly, uh, in the data we talk about, is it less than 12 hours, 12 to 24, 24 to 48, or greater than 48? And I think in truth, if we're asking what emergent is, we're looking particularly in less than 12 hours. So in treating the elderly NOF patients, do we need to treat them within 12 hours? Does it make any difference? So we know specifically that, a, say, a subcapital fracture is managed completely different in a young person compared to the elderly. Um, and we point that out because this, this uh, talk today is related really to this elderly lady. So we're not talking about the young person with the fracture, no, it's the elderly patient. Currently, what do the guidelines say? So within, within Australia in 2016, um, the hip fracture care, clinical care standards were developed um, and they're part of the Australian Commission of Quality and Safety in Healthcare. And their statement is that a patient presenting to hospital with a hip fracture or sustaining a hip fracture while in hospital should receive care, surgery within 48 hours. The NICE guidelines are similar, but in fact, slightly more general, that surgery should be on the day of or after, the, or the day after admission. So looking, I guess, closer to that to sort of 24 hour period. And the Academy um, of Surgeons put out guidelines saying that moderate evidence supports that surgery within 48 hours does improve the outcomes. So in orthopaedics, we're talking, when we're talking about outcomes and morbidity, we're very used to talking about uh, surgical-related morbidity, so concerns about wounds, con concerns about fracture healing, um, deformity. In fact, what there's a lot more at stake when we're talking about the elderly NOF patient, and what's at stake particularly is mortality, and we're going to focus on that today. But as well as mortality, is there a difference in morbidity? Um, morbidity, again, we talk in this group more commonly other infective um, circumstances, chest infections, UTIs, um, cardiac events, thromboembolic events. Does it affect their length of stay? Does it then therefore become a health, a health economic um, discussion? Does it affect their function or does it affect their independence? So what really are the risks? And this is the case-based part because in reality, it's not particularly about whether something is an intertrochanteric fracture, a subcapital fracture, a subtrochanteric fracture. The complexity is all about the different hosts. And in fact, our first elderly lady who lives independently in the community that takes only one antihypertensive is completely different to the lady who has significant cognitive impairment, has in fact been off her legs for a couple of days in the nursing home with low-grade fevers and probably a UTI. With the increasing prevalence of anticoagulation, particularly the NOACs, this has caused, a, puts us under enormous pressure sometimes to be able to reach the standards that we've been asked to reach with respect to getting patients to theatre in time and the balance of risks. Patients who have heart failure um, or other cardiac issues often need further investigation. If they come in with a, an infection that's reasonably acute, the question is, are we supposed to manage this infection prior to the operation or do we just crack on? And then again, whether the, um, the patient is mobile and independent does also affect our ability to uh, operate on them. 
So the case-based approach is all about the complexity and the host factors. So what does the evidence say? This is one of the largest meta-analyses um, that, that exists and where they looked at over 190,000 patients. And overall, they certainly determined that timing does matter and that patients operated within 48 hours do have better outcomes. But is 48 hours a magic number or is it actually less? And in fact, in this Danish um, retrospective review paper, they looked at nearly 4,000 cases and determined that determined that um, sorry, I've just lost my, lost my slide. That there was a significant difference in thirty day mort mortality even after twelve hours. So, uh, how does that affect us in an everyday sense? More recently, in injury, uh, an article by Morrissey and group looked at does every hour to surgery count? And they reviewed um, the evidence and as well as looking, doing a retrospective review of prospective data. Uh, and they found that ASA in its own, on its own did not make a difference, which had been um, mixed evidence previously. They certainly found that surgery within 12 hours made no difference but surgery more than 24 hours increased the risk of mortality 1.8% for every hour of delay. We understand that with all these studies, there's an ongoing selection bias. There's the certain patient who is able to get to surgery within 24 hours or even within 12 hours, um, and they tend to be the less complex ones. And for more complex people, particularly the people on anticoagulants or who come in more unwell, in fact, that's always going to be pushed out. So whilst they found that uh, surgery after 24 hours increased the risk, there are issues still, inherent risks within any of these type of studies that make it harder. One of the only morbidity um, studies that we found that, that looks specifically at this is that Interestingly, maybe the preoperative waiting time increased the risk of periprosthetic infection in the patients treated with arthroplasty with the femoral neck fracture and delaying surgery more than 48 hours um, increased the risk of getting a deep infection, a periprosthetic joint infection. And also then they had worse outcomes after that infection was managed. So, uh, you know, there, there are some orthopedic specific complications that are a factor. And a group from Geelong then looked more at the surgical timing. So if a patient comes in on a Friday evening, there's, uh, you know, on-call staff, uh, less staff that are less um, familiar with the setup, often junior staff, were the outcomes different for cases that were done over a weekend and after hours? And in fact, they found that they were not. So if mortality is significantly different, there's some links that morbidity is, interest, is different. What about length of stay? And whilst there are plenty of studies that demonstrate that uh, waiting more than 48 hours for a fractured NOF to be managed does increase your length of stay, the overall evidence is mixed. Um, and there's a lot of other factors that are difficult to um, confound, that, that are confounders that affect that. So if that's the evidence, then how well do we actually do it? Um, in our ANZ Hip Fracture Registry uh, 2020 report demonstrated that the mean time to surgery for fracture NOFs in our country is about 33 hours. There's variation between the different states. And then we looked at how many um, cases actually got to the got to surgery within 48 hours and if you look from the last three years 2017 18 and 19 really there's not been very much improvement so we're talking about you know 70 percent again with some interstate variability so why is it if the guidelines all say we should be doing it within 48 hours if the evidence is starting to suggest that we need to be getting there even faster than that what are some of the reasons for delay? What are the uh, risk factors that we need to modify for? 
In Australia, the three key reasons that delay patient and off patients from getting to surgery within 48 hours are delay due to theatre availability, due to the patient being unfit, and due to issues with anticoagulation. <clears throat> Access to theatre is something that requires systems change. All of the recommendations suggest that the fractured off patients need a dedicated list. What makes comor their comorbidities um, worse and issues more, more prolonged is if they are recurrently fasting on emergency boards. Uh, and unfortunately, the way a lot of our systems are set up, that the fractured NOFs also just go on an emergency board. With respect to a patient being deemed medically unfit, the gold standard is ortho, an orthogeriatric team approach, a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and whilst there are some resource restrictions for everyone being able to do that, there's no doubt that that has improved the overall care that's decreased mortality over time. And then there's the delay due to issues with anticoagulation. And I personally believe this is a real problem. So we understand that your vitamin K antagonists, um, you know, your warf warfarin's reversible. Uh, there's really good evidence that we operate through antiplatelets, but it's your NOACs that can cause problems. They're not reversible. Um, they're often very difficult to monitor. But there have been several sites now that have developed their own guidelines, and this article um, uh, uh, listed on the, the bottom left-hand side has demonstrated their approach, and they really... Um, are able to proceed to surgery after 24 hours from the last dose. Um, all these patients get a general anaesthetic, so they are avoiding spinal anaesthetic. With dibigatran, uh, there's a big concern about renal function, and so there's a dose-related response. Uh, but the days of having to wait 24 or closer to 48 hours for your NOAX to be washed out, so to speak, uh, have definitely changed given the, the, the balance of risk of delaying the patients for a longer period. And there's certainly sites now that have demonstrated good results with this type of management plan. So <clears throat> the question was, management of the elderly NOF patient, is emergent treatment necessary? Strong evidence that the outcome is better if we can manage these patients probably between 24 to 48 hours. And um, there are modifiable factors some of that involve a systems approach to enable these patients to get to theatre more, more quickly. So that was my review. I appreciate um, it's not a case-based review. Well, it's case-based and a different type of case base. but I think when we're talking about uh, management of this group, it's actually all That's about the, the patient. It's all about the complexity yeah. of the patient. I'm, I'm, Thanks very much. That was great. Thank you very much for that. And I think I think you've brought up some great points for uh, orthopedic surgeons to consider. So I might throw it over to uh, Daval. Daval, does anticoagulation affect the timing of you taking a patient to the operating room? Uh, not or, with uh, uh, or a fractured neck of femur, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not with uh, aspirin. I would not wait. But with the other things like so the uh, the the other other group of drugs, um, I would definitely uh, wait. It's more often sometimes the anesthetist who is the challenge with uh, the anticoagulant, especially with aspirin. But just an interesting question from what I've heard from you is: Does it make a difference for the patient's uh, own mental well-being uh, if you operated within twelve hours? I've had a couple of cases where we did what is the classic hip attack. And, you know, the evidence is not shown that both are, you know, there is no, no evidence of operating within uh, six hours with that. But patients seem to have a lesser memory of the fracture. So they sort of kind of get on, get going much better with early surgery. I know it's not possible every time, but if you can do it, should you do it? Uh, Catherine? I know the health the healthcare systems are challenging everywhere, so you know it's not possible to prioritize a neck of femur so quickly as you, as it's shown by the statistics. But the question is, should we do it if we can? 
Did, did oh, you mention I, I, Sorry, Catherine first. Thank you, Narika. Uh, I think um, whilst I'm not aware of any evidence that exists around the cognitive, cognitive status particularly about how, um, how the patients cope, I don't think there's any doubt that if, if you have the ability to manage the patient safety, safely in a, in a short amount of time and they don't require optimization, for example, a well patient, then that's very appropriate. I think, um, and, and that certainly happens sometimes even within our public systems, if a patient happens to come, come in in the morning and there's space on the list and they don't require anything, there's no doubt that you're better off just getting ahead and getting that done. But if that patient comes in at 7 or 8 o'clock at night and, you know, your time to access the surgery is 10 p.m., no, uh, I think on the balance of those risks, there's no benefit that's, ev that's evidence. And, in fact, all of the studies demonstrate that there's no difference in less than 12 hours and one of the one the danish registry one i didn't actually point it out when i was discussing when they were looking at um statistical significance or mortality uh they looked at greater than 12 hours greater than 24 greater than 48 but they didn't actually look at between 12 and 24 or between 24 and 48 or greater than 48. And so I think in truth, we don't really know the golden hour with respect to the significant comorbidities. But I agree with you, if, if everything's ready to go and you can do so safely with no one fatigued, then it certainly makes sense to operate as soon as you can. But do you need to? I think the answer is no. Noratep, sorry, I, I cut you off before Noratep. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so I think uh, uh, Professor DeWall is mentioned about the hip attack program, which is compare the patient who operate in six hours uh, and yes. this uh, protocol, uh, which operate within 48 hours. And I think that there are, uh, if we talk about the six hour, which is has been categorized as So uh, the result is not different when we compare with the standard protocol. So I think that there, of course, I do agree with Catherine that the there is no evidence which support that the emergency surgery uh, with this group of patient will help us uh, improve the outcome of treatment. So uh, the standard protocol is still working according to the literature right now. And for the uh, anticoagulant, I do agree that it's still a big issue, especially the corpido gale, because uh, for the aspirin, we have plenty of uh, literatures that, well, we can forget it. But the corpido gale itself, uh, in my uh, uh, practice, is still cause me a problem that I have to delay the surgery because uh, the anesthesiologist isn't uh, comfortable to go on with the early surgery. This is one of the issue. Yeah. So, um, David, one of the challenges, one of the challenges with anticoagulants is we don't really know. Um, so, in Melbourne, some of us have just been pushing ahead and just doing the the neck of femur fracture on the following morning, re regardless of the anticoagulant they're on. Do you think it makes a difference if you're nailing as compared to? Uh, doing a hemiarthroplasty in that situation? Uh, so I don't have data one way or the other to answer that question. Um, and it's a challenging long-term long, long -term question. Um, from a surgical point of view, I'm not particularly afraid to operate the day after, but I don't really know if I'm doing the right thing or not. And I think we need more information to answer that question. Um, I think that the things around anaesthetic concerns around which way to give an anaesthetic for these types of fragile patients as well is it may be overstated and it may make no difference whether we're doing a regional anaesthesia or a general anaesthesia sure. and we can be sure. dictated by, sometimes by our colleagues to which way we're going to look after these patients intraoperatively and I'm not sure that that's based in data either. So. Um, and it may be safe to give them an anaesthetic either from a spinal or from a general. Catherine, what are, what are your views related to, uh, do you just crack on, and, uh, forgive the pun, and uh, get the operation done <laughs> the next morning? <laughs> we, um, we, crack, we 
operate through Clopita Grill because the half life is like um, is too long. Um, wait, you'd be waiting ten too days. Long. Yeah. So we operate through aspirin, Clopita Grill. We reverse warfarin because you can do so reasonably quickly, and we're pushing towards the twenty four hour from last do- dose from the NOAX. So I think they're the trickiest group, um, but they're. With increasing, I mean, we and we've progressed from forty-eight hours to saying that they're right to go within twenty-four hours from their fir- from their last dose. I agree with everyone's comments about um, anaesthetic pressure, and maybe again, that's one of the benefits of getting your multidisciplinary team, your set lists where you've got your anaesthetist, are then part of that guideline, um, because those patients all get a GA, um, whereas most of the others do actually get a spinal, uh, and and then we go ahead. And you know, it's anecdotal, but I haven't seen big concerns. Um, rate you know so far with say wound breakdowns or ooze um, the patients on the dibigatran that have the renal failure they're the ones that both the orthogeriatricians and the anaesthetists are very worried about and that's the small group that that get delayed at least 48 hours um, and that's from a combination um, of sort of, a, of expert opinion um, but we pretty much do what what that study that I demonstrated uh, does, and I, I know um, Perth uh, in uh, over in Perth, their um, their protocol is very specific for that as well. They just operate through. Um, the, just after can, I question, can I please ask a question to the other panelists? Um, I really thank Catherine for the work that she's done through the fracture registry and highlighting the issues that we have in Australia. Really, the three big ones being no acts, theatre availability, and patients being medically unfit as our challenges. Because we're an international society, uh, are these the same sorts of challenges people are facing in all of our member countries? Are, the, are these the barriers that uh, that you're hitting in Thailand and India, or are there other barriers that uh, that we're missing that that you guys are seeing as well? So I think theater slots is the is the biggest challenge after medical medically optimization or medical challenges. But again, it depends on what sector the patient is. So if it's a private healthcare in India, the patient is likely to get fitter sooner, or the anesthetics would be less challenging than would be in a, in, a, in a teaching hospital setup. Somehow there is a big difference between that fitness level. Um, but we work towards 24 hour optimization optimization and 24 hours to surgery rule most of the times except bearings where somebody cannot get fit for the other reasons but we all work towards a 24 hour rule and somehow that has that has been doing well okay. i think the hip attacks only i've tried a couple of times it's done good only for a very selective subset of the patient. And I think, as you said, very rightly, I think in Australia and in bigger, where the state funds the healthcare, I think the theatre, getting into the theatre is your biggest challenge probably. For an elderly May I comment female. something about the hip attack, which I also joined? It, it's a very good Lancet study, uh, high-level evidence. However, one thing I don't understand, so it's led by a cardiology team so this hip hip attack study end up doing a subgroup analysis about patients with um, higher troponin so those that have uh, poor cardiac maybe uh, more clogged up vessels from what an orthopedic surgeon would understand those patients are those who benefit the most from the uh, earlier surgery so if those patients are already on the anticoagulants such as uh, Plavix or aspirin, then probably the best timing to do it for those patients are very early when they're still on the coagu- anticoag- I mean the antiplatelets and it's still working. And maybe that's the subgroup of patients that we should focus on doing um, like emergency treatment based on that study. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Look, I think I think it's a huge challenge. So one one of the things we've highlighted is the anticoagulants. The other thing, uh, Catherine, if we can just touch upon before our time comes to an end, is you know since we have the studies that are now showing increased mortality rates if you wait past a certain time, then uh, surely it's the appropriate time for hospitals, clinicians, and health services 
to ensure that, uh, you know, we're providing best practice for our patients by ensuring all of them are done prior to that time. What, what are your thoughts on that in terms of a more general approach across the region? Because there are still patients that are waiting four, five and seven days when you look at different sort of studies and different levels of data, and it may not be for the right reasons. Thanks, Marini. Um, I agree, and I think um, the evidence within the studies but also the evidence that exists within things like the hip fracture registry gives us the impetus to be able to, at systems-based level, um, really demonstrate the requirement for the change. And I think the solution to that really relates to uh, having a particular NOF um, space on your trauma list or an allocated list for fractured NOF patients. I, I think that that is the solution. Um, and I agree with you. Um, the more evidence that exists, our, we have a lot more strength in being able to sell that argument um, to the health you know, managers, surgical services managers. And also... And so I think um, that competitive edge of, of what a registry can provide um, to be able to say, well, this is where you are, your average is not doing so great and, and no health administrator likes that either. So, you know, get your reports for these type of things, um, take them to, to your health administrator and demand the change that's required. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. That, that was a great discussion because one of the things we don't realise and creeps up on us is that... Uh, you know, we, we probably have over 2 million fractured neck of femurs globally and, and the incidence of fractured neck of femurs in the Asia-Pacific region has been increasing, you know, two or threefold over the last 30 years. So it, it's a problem and especially if we're going to manage outcomes and uh, the, the survivability of the injury, I, I think it's a great talk. So thank you for the data and look Thanks forward to the your opportunity. Uh, talk. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Harpal Singh, Sally, to the uh, virtual podium to talk to us about uh, uh, some case-based discussion on subtrochanteric fractures. Thank you. A very warm good morning to all of you in the panel and in the audience. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me begin by thanking the Asia-Pacific Orthopedic Association and the Trauma Subspeciality for having me here on such a big podium. Without wasting any time, I'll start with my presentation. So uh, I'm going to speak on subtrochanteric uh, fractures, and this is going to be a case-based discussion. I'm gradually, I'll start with a very simple case, and then I'll try to introduce some special scenarios uh, with a lot of opportunity for discussion. I have personally excluded any theoretical part so that we can have more discussion. So I would request the moderators and the panel members to stop me wherever they feel is good, you know. So the aims of my talk are that you get used to looking at subtrochanteric fractures, understand the Their biomechanics, options, learn the tips and tricks. There are too many ways to skin the cat. Whatever is good in your hand, do that. And then we'll conclude this talk uh, with a few slides. So starting with my first case, it's a 22-year female. She had a road traffic accident, some facial injuries, presented uh, right away after trauma to my hospital. And these are her radiograms. The x-ray femur with hip is quite obvious. We have a long medial fragment. The pelvis is uh, normal. So any thoughts on this uh, uh, Anything Daval, else that you would like to be done? Daval, do, would you like any further information? Uh, 
we have a distal x-ray femur is any other thing all long uh, absolutely i think that's very important Uh, it was normal. The okay, distal X-ray is normal. Take my word for it. It's normal. Um, well, I don't know whether a CT would help or not, but it would uh, definitely uh, give you a little better information of the fracture. But the question really comes with this: is uh, what position and how to reduce? That's the two yeah, questions. Exactly. These are my thoughts. So I was going to fire these questions at you. So uh, one of the panelists, what do you prefer? Let's talk of first uh, table, you know, a radiolucent table or a fracture table for such a patient. So uh, what's the majority vote? I prefer lateral position nailing for these. I commit. So how many Noritep, of us would prefer Nor a lateral position? Noritep, what influences your decision as to whether you perform supine or lateral na nailing? I think that there is, it will be a size of the patient because uh, if the patient was obese uh, or have a very big muscle, uh, the lateral position is might be a little bit more easy for us to find the entry point. But uh, in general, uh, if the patient is not the obese, I prefer the uh, supine position because it was easy for us to correct the length and the rotation. If we can compare with the other side. And do you have a preference? Are you do you, do you have any decisions uh, decision making nodes regarding uh, on this case a fracture on table or off table? Or I prefer doing off table. I will use the lady and table. Uh, because it's easily for me to manipulate the uh, the proximal fragment, which for, uh, I'm not use the uh, the fracture table. And Daval, do you think uh, when you look at this fracture, do you think there are going to be challenges in the uh, reduction that, that requires some special tricks? Yeah, certainly. I think there would be definitely a need for a. If I can get it percutaneously with a couple of circlage wires, well, okay. Otherwise, I wouldn't hesitate to do a, a clamp and a mini open, especially with a subprochandric, because I think get, getting that to a good, uh, this thing would be important. So, or, Is or circlage would... the standard? I would like to know from the other panel members. Um, yes, to me, circlage standard. If the wedge is this large, especially it's medial wedge. So the medial part is very important for supporting the, the femur because of the offset. So I would make sure the medial side is buttressed. And by circlaging it, it helps a lot to reduce. CW, would you use a uh, circlage wire as well? Oh, he may not be able to hear me. That's all right. We we can move on. Yeah, you can use. Uh, you can use. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a master himself. Yeah, you gotcha. The medial fragment is quite far away. Yeah, and it's like a simple piece, simple fracture of the medial and lateral cortex. Then, uh, first try to reduce it. Maybe you use. Can you use the collinear? Oh, if you have the circus. Percutaneous, then you can use the, the percutaneous surplus to reduce this medial fragment. Because it's very difficult if this fragment is displaced. And then when you insert the guide wire in, it's always out. Yeah. So this is what was done. Uh, I prefer generally not to touch these fractures. Uh, I'm not a very big, uh, at that time when this case was done, we didn't have the minimally invasive instruments for uh, encirclage and I prefer not to open these and do a circlage, full open circlage. So that's what I did. Uh, any comments, anything differently that others would like to do? Uh, can I? So, you know, the, it, it, it looks yeah, it looks like, uh, you know, we have a various, you know, the alignment. 
you know, the, the, I agree with the Tira Chai's and other people's opinion to have a circular because it helps the alignment. You know, the, this uh, small virus, you know, that we may have a delayed or non-union of the, this uh, subprochandry fractures. And I also, you know, the, 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 you know, agree the opinion of the narrative, you know, if we have uh, the lateral position, you know, we can have a good entry and we can, you know, prevent this uh, virus positioning. So probably, so you know, we need to have a, you know, the, preliminary wire over the collinear clamp, and that, that really helps the reduction status. Thank you. Thank you, CW. So we, we yeah, we think um, uh, the wire would be a good idea. So uh, that's how the fragment got incorporated, the fracture ignited, patient is walking full weight bearing, five years of follow-up. Uh, I know that, there's slight virus. That's the problem with the entry point, and I accept my limitation on that. I don't think it's anything to do with the fracture geometry or with the implant. It's a surgeon surgical error. But since it was within the acceptable limits, so I accepted it. Uh, patient does not have a limb length discrepancy and no gait issues, and he can sit cross legged which is important in Indian scenario. Any comments on this X-ray? If not, uh, if the moderator yeah. tells me, I'll proceed further. Yeah, Harpal yeah. is the sorry amount of virus uh, important. Like how much is permissible, or is there any is it studied? Like can you get uh, away with like say seven degrees, five degrees? Generally, I would not accept any virus. But these are all polytrauma patients that I have. So once uh, you know you don't like to go back in again, uh, try to do the first time it. Uh, there's, if you look at the inner cortex of the uh, femur, the nail is almost parallel to it. So that's my way of looking at it. I rather disregard the, this step off. I would say if the nail is parallel to the inner part of the outer lateral cortex, I would accept the alignment. Okay. And second, both of my screws are well placed. If there was enough virus, the screws would be going in the upper quadrant. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just comment that yes, it's very well done, but uh, the patients that I see in my place are very different from yours. Your patient is 22 years old. The typical subtrocks I get, they are 50, 60, sometimes they're we'll the we'll go to them. So the reduction plays a role there. Yeah, I agree. We are True. going to, towards that. I said we'll go towards the complicated ones in the end. Okay, we can move to the next one. Then. Yeah. yeah. So now we come to a young male who is having a blunt trauma abdomen, blunt trauma chest, bilateral chest tubes, a renal injury, a splenic injury, and has been, uh, you know, monitored and maintained uh, non operatively by the general surgery team in the surgical ICU. And after 48 hours, I am. Called in to say that you can manage this patient for the skeletal injuries. Patient is stable. The hemoglobin is not falling anymore. So go ahead and do it. So, uh, Noratip, what would you do in this situation? It's 48, 48 hours, I think, yes. after the injury. And so it's a pro proximal, uh, probably a proximal third shaft fracture. Yeah. In this case, the patient has bilateral uh, lung injury, so I think that, that the position of the patient should be supine because if we place on lateral position, the anesthesiologist will not happy with it. Uh, so I will use the nail uh, with our fracture table because this is the uh, common scenario that the proximal femur was deformed from the pulling muscle, uh, so it will be much more easy to mobilize it during operation using lady ocean table and uh, of course the patient is still young and we use the reconstruction nail uh, to fix the fractures uh, i would try to close it uh, with the uh, maybe some uh, reduction guide first to to uh, reduce the proximal fragment remit and then i think that uh, we can get a good alignment a terror chai, you're the uh, probably the MIPO 
person on the the biggest mipo person in the group. Is there a role for plating in this situation? Yeah, I may look at the canal carefully. If you look, I'm not sure in the distal part, it's quite narrow. Very narrow. I have to make sure that this, we can pass the nail. You have to rim until 10 at least. Yeah, I have to check carefully the, the mirror canal. Yeah. If it's small, then I will play it with the Mipo technique. Apple? CW, what do you think of this, um, the, the reduction? Yeah, still virus. <laughs> so, you know, it can heal, but it takes a long time. And, you know, the in, even in the previous case, the, you know, the patient was uh, in good function, but, you know, when they running, they have a pain. You know, it uh, seems like, you know, if it is not consolidated in like a normal union, so the, I I usually like to prevent the virus, if, in, especially in lateral cortex. It should be parallel to the distal and you know proximal. So probably if I see that the X-ray in the C arm, you know intraoperatively, I may use the, some blocking screws, you know, the, to have a new position of the entry. Otherwise, uh, this will co continue with this nail condition. So. We need to have a new entry to have a correction of the virus. So my question is, if you look at the post-op film, which is in the uh, surgical ICU, this one on the left, yeah, the cortices are cortices are aligned. No, on, but still in virus. virus yeah. There is slight virus, but the cortices were aligned. Even inside the theater, they were aligned. You look at the medial side; it's well aligned. But post-operatively, when we took uh, a patient started walking and the fracture was uniting, I saw this. So mm -hmm. the reason I brought out this case was, can we add something to improve the stability even despite having two screws up in, into the neck? Uh, so the virus in the tension power is quite strong. So we cannot overcome it. So the, the first stage that we have operation, that should be done very correctly for me. You know. CW, do you have any uh, thoughts on there? There is a, uh, a, I suppose, a group of people in North America that are using some concomitant plates, some adjuvant plates sometimes to have yeah, better alignment in the subtrochanteric area. Yeah, yes. What uh, are your I, thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, you, you know, if it is not possible, you may use the small mini plate. If it is not uh, damaged too much, you can use it, but we still have a good solution using the blocking screws and the new entry. You know, usually it's sold that. So I like the, you know, idea of a Noratep. I don't like to use the fracture table anymore, you know, in the subtrochanteric fractures. But if you have a good entry, you know, the, you see that the, even the lateral view, you see that there is a, you know, the anterior angulation that also have a, another tension, uh, anterolateral, you know, the, you know, the you know, tension is quite really great. So the reduction is quite really important, important, whether you're using the blocking screws or mini plate and whatever you like. But the entry, you should have a correct entry. Otherwise, the nail will make another virus again. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, avoid virus at all costs. So, Harpal, I think the, uh, the difference between the x-ray on the left and the right may just be a little bit of rotation and that's why it looks yeah. a little different so sure okay we can move to the next case if you like so this one is a young 44 year male he is father of a pathologist met with an accident in the middle mm -hmm. of the night was brought into the hospital in shock uh, with difficulty in breathing flail chest bilateral uh, hemodynamically unstable landed up being electively intubated within one hour of admission, went on assisted ventilation, and this is the x-ray picture. Uh, Daval, what would you do for this one? I think we need a CT, the hip looks out. 
tell you, it's not. I, I, the hip does look unusual, huh? Yeah. No. I think there's a posterior dislocation, maybe. Yeah, absolutely right. It was a posterior dislocation of the hip with a subtrochanteric fracture. So, how do we proceed in such patient? <clears throat> Narratip, what would you do? What would be your order of events? Okay, okay. I agree with Dr. Duval that uh, we have to do the emergency CT scan. And of course, after we gather information, because we want to know that uh, is there any fragment inside of the joint that we have to go in or and is there any fractures at the posterior wall? And I guess there is. Uh, but after we get the CT scan, we have to proceed to reduce the fractures at the uh, operative room. And uh, in these kinds of situation, I will use the insert the chance pin uh, to the proximal fragment to reduce the hip back into the socket. And uh, after that, uh, we can uh, fix the fractures if uh, the implant is ready. Uh, after we, we reduce it back, we can fix it. But uh, I'm not sure that our, which time that the patient was come. It was in uh -huh. the... Late in the night, late in the night. Late in the night, okay. So uh, if the patient condition is not stable, especially uh, relative to the doctors and come into the night, maybe I will uh, temporarily fix it with the external fixation and wait until uh, the instrument and the team is ready. Did we have the CT, Harper? Uh, the CT is not available. He had a small chip fracture of the posterior wall on a CT, which didn't need any surgical management. There were no intraarticular fragments. The point here is uh, that I wanted to highlight the patient was so unstable in the beginning. The anesthetist and the general surgery team didn't allow me to take the patient to OR for 48 hours. So... I, I documented I that in the file. I documented in the file that hip is dislocated for 48 hours. It means uh, on that day, I told the general surgeon, you know, the onus is on you. He says, you write down that it's more important than the life of the patient and you take the patient to the OR. So in that, in that situation, Harper, let me just ask the audience. David, uh, David Dewar, yeah. Um, so the patient's in intensive care with a dislocated hip and it's unstable to go to the operating room. What options do we have? That's a really, that's a very difficult scenario to be in. If they're ventilated, uh, in, in my place, if they're ventilated in intensive care, uh, I would be really discussing closely to see if I could uh, move them temporarily to my theatre to do something percutaneously to reduce it. And there would not be a significant difference for that patient between those two environments in my place. And the idea that Neurotep mentioned before with a shans pin yeah. and a yeah. T-handle yeah. chuck would be something that I would be looking to do and then manage the, uh, the femur in traction temporarily. Uh, I'd be very uncomfortable to leave this sitting as it was for, for 48 hours um, in my place. But Joel also had a comment here. Yes, Joel, I was going to ask you, actually, Joel, you're a little bit older. Is there a place for a chance pin in the intensive care? Well, I don't think it does much uh, in intensive care, and I, I really don't know what's the, uh, what's the issue, uh, issue with unstable. Why is this? If the patient is unstable, where is, then you need to do something with that. Uh, so you need to be careful with this general surgical or ICU unstable uh, matter because... If the patient is bleeding, looks like he's bleeding from this. Yeah. If the patient has a severe head injury and it cannot be uh, ventilated from chest injury, that's a different thing. But if you don't have those, I think these patients uh, still the priority is to, to fix this and reuse it. And there, you can't do anything with this on ICU. So the, your, your best shot is to take the theater, the patient with somebody who knows what they're doing and uh, address the problems why this patient is unstable. 
because you're going to get be uh, looking after these patients after 48 hours, not the ones who said initially that they are unstable. Okay, Harper. So, so Dhaval, uh, Dr. Dhaval would understand, you know, in India, the way it works is the general surgeon will talk to the family and tell them, okay, it's he's very unstable and is may or may not survive. And when as an orthopedic surgeon, you go, you want to say that I want to take care of the hip. They say, we are not consenting for it. They will refuse consent. They would go with the general surgeon to save life than with the orthopedic surgeon to save a hip or a limb. Am I right, Dr. Dhawal? Is it yeah, the same experience yeah, yeah. with you? Uh, well, I, I mean, I agree with you. I am, I am on, I I'm hearing you, but it's challenging. Yeah. So yeah, what, I what understand I, completely the, the, the uh, local situation and politics. It happens everywhere. But what the general surgeon does against the instability, probably nothing. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's the kind of a concept what needs to be changed. And, I, and it's not a criticism. It's just a matter of uh, we need to look at these things very, very differently. So... So, okay, 48 hours, patient is in the OR now. So, what position would you choose for such a patient? With a dislocated hip, you might have to open it, and Nart. a subtrochanteric fracture. Nart hip, what's your approach? Yes. Uh, I will use the lateral position because in case that I need to do the open reduction, uh, I can use it on the... Uh, lateral approach that I'm familiar with. Uh, and uh, but I think that uh, we can reduce it without open uh, the joint, uh, and I will nail it because, as I mentioned before, that uh, the this is a very short uh, fragment and is deformed, so it will be more easily with the lateral approach to find the appropriate uh, entry point. And uh, from the distal part, I think that we can insert the nail because it's it's look not too narrow. So I still prefer the lateral position. The position, yeah, sorry. Should I think the lateral position you almost committed. But the question about the nail is the only because I think this looks flat. So maybe once it's it's mm -hmm. rotated, you will have enough length uh, for, the, for the blade to be positioned. I think the challenge really is the position of the blade in the in the neck from the lateral cortex. Because are you going to the fracture? So my next query is, we all I would want to put a shank screw in into the neck to reduce this. With the hip dislocated and rotated and flexed, how do you target the entry point for the shank screw and how do you make sure you're going into the right track? Mm And our tip, what would you yeah, do? I think that uh, we have to monitor using the uh, fluoroscope to find out because uh, it will go through the back because it's a posterior hip dislocation. Uh, I think that uh, we're still able to palpate the uh, greater tocanders and then we can use the pin locally, per percutaneously locate the locations of the pin and then uh, insert percutaneously under fluoroscope exam. So that's what I did. I went along with the fluoroscopy. I put a shan screw into the uh, two. I actually had to use two shan screws. One you can see the here, the drill hole, and next into the neck. Put a bar of the uh, external fixator along with the clamps, and then pull the head back into the socket. And I was able to do it closed. Of course, it was in lateral position. And then the nailing was closed, uh, manipulating with the shank screw as a joystick. We were able to achieve a closed nailing in this patient. Now what happened, the patient was nailed, sent back to the ICU again. Patient had uh, some increase in counts and was getting unstable. So I was called in again to have a look. And this is what I observed uh, my this is the entry point for the shan screw and this was the locking screws. There was some fluid and I opened up the sutures in the ICU, couldn't take the patient back to the OR again. Uh, uh, the Whatever was coming out didn't look good to me. 
I sent in for the cultures and uh, sensitivity. Before sensitivity, I got the report was E. coli was growing into the wound. And there was some redness and induration. I'm not sure if it's clear on the picture, but there was some induration. Although the whole procedure was closed, still, uh, there, probably there was some breach or something happened, uh, which I couldn't pinpoint. Uh, there was a problem. So the next thing, this was the lateral position that we did. So I took the patient back to the OR under anesthesia. I opened up the entry wound, all the wounds, did a washout, debride the dead tissues, Sorry. and uh, continued to do wa repeated washouts for this. So, uh, Harpal, we only have a, a minute left. So if you could just sort of uh, move along to the end of yeah. this case. So this was the kind of look and then put him in a vac for a few days. Uh, the wound got okay. Then we did a scandry closure. And this is how he, he's done. He's perfectly normal, drives a two-wheeler, can sit cross leg, does all normal activities. Uh, slight evidence, you could say, for AVN, but hip is perfectly normal. He doesn't so even live while he walks. Thank you, Harpal. Thank you very much for your uh, their, their tough cases. So we'll have to move on to the next presenter now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay. kindly. That was a tough case, I think, and uh, a terrible infection for the patient. So yeah. Now I'd just like to invite Christian Fang to the uh, virtual podium to um, share some cases on femoral shaft fractures, Christian. Okay, faculty, an honor to be here. You can all hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so so these are my declarations. So I'll just share you some technical cases and a few one on decision making. The first one would be quite straightforward. So this is a typical case we see all the time. Femur fracture, he's a golfer, and then um, that's, the fa that's the injury. So we nailed him, all right. Most of you will choose a nail. There's no debate about this for shaft fractures, diaphyseal fractures. But that's what we see sometimes uh, post-operatively. So I'll just bring forward, that's the pelvis. Um, after, at three weeks, he is trying to uh, get on his foot and actually tried to do some golf swings. And then he found out that the uh, foot position is strange. And those are the x-rays. So I can invite someone with, an, with a good eye to comment on these x-rays. Naval, you have a good eye. Uh, do you mind, um, are you happy to comment on these x-rays? Yes. Um, is there some rotational malalignment? Yeah, how how did you detect it? It's I'm such just, a just trying to match the cortices at the fracture site. Okay. Um, mm. So matching okay. cortex is is one way, definitely. I, I deliberately showed a knee, and the knee you can see compared to the uh, lesser trucks. And yeah, so let's, the yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. That is. Chris. Yes. Can I have a can I have a comment? You know, yes. the, do you, you know, decide the rotational control using the APA X-ray or the lateral view? I use the lateral, but I will have a poll for everyone later. Uh, okay. That so is just... the, you know, the, the, you know, for me, you know, the, especially in transverse fracture, the, you know, mm -hmm. it's actually difficult to know that the rotational, you know, correctness. You yes. Know, the, uh, I really prefer to have the checking the lateral view. You know, last less trochanter shape sign, I think that, that is the wrong one. And although it is on the written in the textbook, so the, we need to have a, a new con in the text textbook using uh, the lateral the views. Yes, please uh, have that in the AO manual. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yes, so I think you we all have a very good eye. These are the problems. Uh, we look at the fibula mid-axis. So on the right side, it intersects not with the tibia. On the left side, intersects quite well with the tibia. The position of the patella is not central. So you would assume the right side is externally rotated. However, the lesser trochanter goes behind. So it's quite deformed, quite externally rotated. Uh, so if we go to examine the patient, that's how they look like. So he does have a 30 degrees uh, shift in the rotation clinically. So the next step is uh, 30 degrees. I think uh, to, to many, this is not acceptable. Now it is at um, only three weeks post-op. I think the answer is quite straightforward. Um, Prof. Tira Chai, how, how are you going to uh, make sure we get a correct uh, alignment afterwards? Do you have the CT scan? Yep, here they are. Yep. I measure them for, for you. Yep. How many? How much? 70 degrees. 30 degrees. Tira Chai? Yeah, 30 degrees. 30 degrees. Then we just yeah. measure the Cobb's angle between the upper and the lower slice. Mm -hmm. So the difference is 31 degrees to be exact. Yeah, can you go back to the, the, the X-ray of the long? Yes. So it's only a month from surgery, not too long. Yeah. It's more easy to remove the locking screws. Uh, mm. Rotate it back, and I prefer if I look here. Yeah, I remove the proximal locking screw and make an internal rotation and a locking uh, with two locking screws on the proximal. Okay, so um, how do you make sure that it's actually the nail is rotating because the 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 nail actually has a curvature. So rotating the proximal part may be sometimes unpredictable. And if we rotate the distal part, it's sometimes easier. Uh-huh, very good, yeah. Yeah, so probably the, we, may, we may need to have uh, some guideline using the shunt screws from the lateral side, the one in the distal femur and the other in the proximal femur. And you make you can make a you know the, the parallel shunt screw fixation, and then you can check it in the intraoperatively, you know, the, using the smartphone app, and then checking the the oh, angles. That's I my see. method if I have right smartphone app. So the the measurement uh, yeah. tool. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. really useful. So the level, like mm -hmm. like this thing. That's right. That's right. I oh, do it. Okay. Actually, that's a yeah. good trick. Yeah. And you use shunt screw. I think that's so important because if we use K wires, sometimes they bend and then yeah, it's it inaccurate. Yeah, shunt yeah. screw is much better. And it's even shunt screws, even shunt screws, if your you know, arm power is too strong, you can bend it. <laughs> so make so, sure not to hold on the shunt screw. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Hold that, on the leg. Yeah, hold on the leg and not to using the you know the power on the you know the shunt screw tip. Right? Yes, those are very good tricks. So I make this case for it's a basic one actually. So we do the derotation as we planned. So I think uh, I follow Professor Tier Chai. We try to remove the proximal screw because it's it's easier, simpler, and distally we don't have. Um, much left. If we remove that screw, it's, it might be difficult to put in something new. So just talk about this. Um, if we look at the rotation, we know that the femur sometimes is at a different angle. So if you look at the lateral view, it can be tricky because of the uh, plane of the C arm. So, so looking, determining the NT version actually de uh, depends on getting a very correct lateral X-ray in the lateral condyles, and then moving your C arm in the same plane up, getting an ND version. So this is a basic technique case, and we know that the cortical signs really doesn't work because the femur diameter doesn't change much, only until you see the uh, linear aspera. So for the uh, participants who still prefers this method, I think uh, it, it is sometimes risky. If you look at the C-arm, 
rotating femur, nothing changes. So it's actually very hard to match. So I, I completely agree with uh, Professor O that the lateral method is much better. You look at the 3D of the femur, it's easy to make out the antiversion angle. So like this one, this X-ray is a pure, perfect lateral of the knee, and we get a slight antiversion in the hip to uh, have your correct rotation alignment. So these are the methods of doing the derotation. We still use the K wires, but uh, make sure not to hold on the K wires. It's to hold on the leg. But the Shan spin method, I think it's it's better. So uh, this is corrected. So just implications, the rule of 15, the chance of this is 15%. And when it's more than 15 degrees, there's a problem. You might go back to uh, revise it. Any discussions over this case? Can I just ask a question regarding positioning for these patients yes, who are concerned about uh, rotation? What position would you have them in and would you use it on a traction table or, or off traction? Uh, to be honest, the traction table is easier for this kind of fracture. And the traction table actually doesn't let us compare to the other side. So that's a, a, that's a big minus for the traction table. But alternatively, if you do it lateral, the position doesn't allow that either. So the thing is to not reverse the patient from anesthetic, bring him down the traction table, check the rotation clinically before uh, stopping the GA. If you find some problem in 15% in of the patients, then you can have the chance of doing an intra-op uh, 3D, 3D CR. We, we fortunately have that and then you can compare both sides and do the revision straight on. That's one trick. Uh, another thing is um, be mindful not to put so many screws. So just use the minimal number of screws. So you always have the chance to come back. And in the consent making, we tell our patients there's a 15% chance of this. You might have to come back for this uh, derotation. That's, that's included, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other... Any other points? Christian, is there a lesser risk of malrotation with retrograde nail? Retrograde nail, I think it's better, yes. Uh, because you do it supine, you can see the other side to compare. But but the risk of malrotation still exists in there also. Yeah, I so far don't have a good solution. I still have a 15% risk, no matter how careful I am. I, I wonder, in the group, do you have a good trick? My preference is to do them uh, on a radio-loosened bed without traction, so I can compare to the other side. Um, but I have lots of hands in my institution, and that makes it easier because you need additional help if you're doing it off traction. You need a, a junior to help apply manual traction to the leg. And so more hands are required to do it off traction. It makes it a bit trickier, but then you can compare. Yeah. Harpal? Yeah, so we do it on a radiolucent table, but after I do the locking proximal and one distal lock, I usually flex the knee to full flexion and see that the back of the heel is in the middle of the thigh. I, I use it as a hip and knee flexion test. In case there's a rotational deformity in the shaft of the femur, the heel would either go in or go out. It won't be in the middle of the back of the thigh. That's a rough estimate. So you are not off by more than five degrees. Okay, shall I move on to the next case? Um, so this case is about the decision making. So that's a patient motorbike crash two months ago, uh, open fracture, treated another country, but then came to us with this sinus track. You see it's uh, this pus coming out and that's the x-ray for the patient. It looks like the fracture didn't actually heal yet. Just to complicate the issue a little bit more, he also has this bad elbow injury, which we're not going to focus on in this case. So here are some of the x-rays. So we have an infected non-united plated femur in, in this in this patient. So uh, panel, <laughs> just uh, I want to ask you what's the most straightforward things that you'll do in your mind? 
Uh, I have one question, Christian. Yes. I look at the screws at the distal femurs. I think is not in the good position too because the screw uh, length is very short. So I just want to ask you what about the clinical examinations of the rotation of in this case. No, I tell you, you have such uh, good eyes. Yes, the rotation is wrong. It's like 45 degrees. I forgot it's internal or external rotated, but it's just wrong, pure wrong. <laughs> sure, sir, it's very important because we talk about non-union and yeah. infected. Uh, oh, it's not non-union. It's uh, it's not united yet and infections. Or if the implant was still in place, we can uh, attack with the infection just only the infection, but if the position is not in a good alignment, we have to revise it. It's like dealing with the implant, the infection, uh, the alignment, free problems. You you got to remove the implant. Are you going to put it in immediately or an X-fix to bridge it? No, uh, because the uh, external fixation, I think that it will be a little bit difficult for us to control the distal alignment uh, if we use the we want to use the external fixation it should be the the ring construct and uh, of course with the femurs i think it will be a little bit difficult for the patient uh, so i think uh, there, there is the other option if we want to don't want to put the external fixation we can use these kinds of place but put it externally like uh -huh. the, uh, external fixation so we can get rid of the chance of infected. And of course we have to go in and, and clean the fractures and I will put the antibiotic semen inside. Mm -hmm. So a typical mask. Who, who would risk the chance of putting in implants? I, I just want the hands from the panel. So David will, what, how would you tell your patient? What's the risk of like uh, not able to control the infection if you put an implant? So there are so many subtleties in this case, and it's a really tricky case. Section. And so okay, I, would, I wouldn't immediately um, uh, dismiss having hardware in this patient, uh, and I may consider having hardware with an induced membrane technique if that gave me more stability, because I. I I would feel that I'd need to have stability and reduction uh, to control this infection adequately. Uh, but clearly the current uh, fixation is inadequate and is needs to be removed, but uh, I would probably consider an induced membrane and I would consider stable fixation to manage it. So stable okay. means uh, internal implants, I guess. And then you're gonna <laughs> clean it up. Wait, potentially. Close. So how many times of uh, debridements are, are needed? So, or is there a definite end point from your point of view where you stop debridements well, and just keep the drugs? Well, so it needs to be an aggressive initial debridement and that's your best one by a mile. And there's a bit of data around recurrent debridement, recurrent washout leads to worse outcomes. There's, pretty, there's some selection bias in that data, but still your initial one needs to be aggressive and to remove everything that's dead and devitalized in that initial uh, debridement. And the aim would be not to be doing subsequent debridements of infected or dead tissue. You only fix it on that first go and be very aggressive, then have your membrane and move forward from there. Okay. Any other, other opinion from the floor? Yeah, I will, I will do the expect first because I'm not sure how much infection is inside. Yeah. You see two one piece, big piece of the, the sequestrum that you have to remove it. Yeah, I may put the anterior expex crossing the knee for a while. Yeah, that means on the lateral side, it's still clean. I can do it later after the, the, the cross infection is gone. And I, I put a bony uh, semen antibiotics to induce membrane at the same, yeah. Okay, so gentlemen, we have a consensus, I think. So this uh, patient has a high ESRCRP, knee range very stiff, only 30 degrees, malrotation 30 degrees, that's the size. Actually, this bone is not connected, not healed, so we suspect, uh, like Prof. Chai said, is a 
sequestrum. So problemless infection, non-union, malreduction, stiffness. Um, so those are the stage procedures. Uh, so I'll just show you the video. We have to remove everything. You see that defect there? That's with all the devitalized free floating bone removed, wash it out. And yes, we are brave. We put in an implant uh, in the first stage uh, without a disfixator because uh, we judge from the soft tissue. We think there's not, not a lot of uh, pus or dead tissue. Putting in an implant, there is good uh, soft tissue coverage, so it should be fine. So the culture comes back to be multiple. So this is supposedly actually introduced during the injury. Uh, and from the dead bone, it actually grows something different from the, uh, from the calus. So, um, and then using the same technique, we uh, also make sure the alignment is correct. And then that's the uh, cement, it's a junk chunk of cement in there. So I think most would actually do a masculine technique. I just want to ask one question. What is your end point in removing the cement and putting back uh, bone graft? What, what's the time frame that you prefer? I usually go to OR, you know, the every two weeks or two or three weeks. And then before that, uh, we need to check that all the laboratory and uh, even in OR, uh, in the, in the debridement, and uh, we send a specimen to the pathology to check the, you know, the WBC, you know, white cell count on the high power field. So if it is uh, more than, you know, five or 10, you know, we need to re debridement again. But otherwise, you know, if it is clean in, in the lab, lab finding and, the, you know, the pathology finding, so we can go to the next step of the reconstruction of bone. Yeah. So the labs are important. CRP, do, yeah. do they have to be completely normal before you decide to put graft? So, uh, at least, at least, you know, the, I, you know, the, that is uh, one only thing that we can believe in the, the you know, the infection lab. And the other thing is, uh, you know, as I said, you know, pathologic, you know, the, the report. You know, you know, we, we are, it's really important. You know, we need to get the, you know, the sample. Report. Yeah, sample. Yeah. Mm. So sample CW, before graft. CW, let me ask you something now then. So if you're doing membrane induced osteogen, you know, if you're putting the cement in and coming back the graft, and if you're going in and debriding intermittently, do you take the uh, cement out each time or do you, because it, it's often asked, you know, this question, or do you just leave it? And debride the soft tissues. Yeah, I, ne I need to take it out. I need to take out all the cement because you know the we never know the what is uh, in the background. You know the we need to re-debride but the older cement as well as the uh, intramedullary area and the all the dirty area that can be suspicious. So every time I need to change. Yeah. What is your concentration of antibiotics within the cement? Is there a uh, limit? I have no idea. There is no consensus about it. But if I can have, you know, the, you know, the, you know, one pack of a cement, you know, I usually put the, at least the one vancomycin plus, usually because uh, we usually have MRSA plus mm -hmm. and the cephalosporin together. You know, yeah. I do have a very high dose. So it's 10% by weight <laughs> of the thing I put in is antibiotics a lot. <laughs> But usually they don't allow the insurance, you know, they don't allow it. You know, you, you need to <laughs> put your money inside. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I just highlight a little interesting point there? Uh, the bacteria that, that we get in infection changes depending on the time course from when the implant went in to when, uh, to when we see the infection. And the later that is, the more likely it is to be a, uh, uh, Coagnegative staphylococcus, so a staph epidermidis in Australia. And so the addition of vancomycin particularly appears to be important for us for chronic infection and um, above other antibiotics. So generally for us, the addition of vancomycin appears to be useful um, in our local infections. Who puts in a drain after cement, uh, I mean, masculine technique? Or who doesn't put in a drain? 
because learning from the joint replacement people who do prostalax, they don't put in the drain. I put it. I uh, see uh, Prof. Tirchai, do you put in a drain? Yes. Yes. Uh, David? No. No. Marini, do you put a drain? No. 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 no okay. Drain. So we're divided. I, I put a drain. No. So I think both things work. Well, I'll consider not putting a drain then. <laughs> Save <laughs> one trouble. So less <laughs> bleeding, at least. That's, that's, that's one thing I learned from you guys. So... Yeah, so we go back at eight weeks. This is a sizable defect. So there's some discussion about how to get graft to fill this thing. Uh, but there are, of course, many options. So um, yeah. let's not waste time in this video. So, But actually, removing uh, the fragments, you get a very sizable defect. And in this particular case, we harvest graft from the posterior eyelid crest. So the patient is uh, lateral. Posterior will give you more graft. I still believe in the good old cheap uh, autograph, and it can be mixed with allograph from an old lady with a femur fracture. We just take the femur from the last, uh, not the last case, last month's case, and then mix it with this guy's bone. And then I think local antibiotic is very important. There's been more evidence showing that uh, local antibiotics actually helps. So that's vancomycin mixed to the graft and on laid into the uh, the wound mm -hmm. a lot of graph you see it's like money if if this graph is money you'll be so happy <laughs> huh. there's never uh, enough there's only more <laughs> and then uh, so these are the other options of course vascularized bone graft uh, bone mm -hmm. transport i want to ask the floor who prefers uh, this method in this uh, era, transport or vascularize? For me, you know, half and half, you know, the, I do the induced membrane and I also do the bone transport. And especially in the tibia, you know, the, you know, the, I like to have the bone transport. But femur, the, we have a good soft tissue and a good blood supply. I think you know the it is a uh, one uh, reasonable uh, answer to use the induced mm -hmm. membrane in the femur tip. Anyone tried the newer uh, bone transport nails, the magnetically controlled ones? Not yet. <laughs> Those seems very fancy, but it's very very expensive. So I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping an eye eye on that. Mm -hmm. Christian, if it's a suitable patient, is Ria an option here? Yes, RIA is an option. Uh, so, but uh, look at this femur because there is so much inside. There is also uh, screws inside. So RIA has to be done on the other leg. If we do something on the other leg, it means the patient has to be supine, and th this gives us no chance to get the uh, posterior alacrus. So uh, RIA is we've tried it in a few uh, cases. I can show you something later on. I find it less. Uh, optimal that what we actually believe in. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, a success. The bone graft just heals and patient has a total elbow with the infection controlled. He is fine. So we've discussed all these points in non-union when it's infected. The stability is very important. It's highlighted and then debridement masculine technique in a typical manner. Um, I might go to one more case here. Do I have time, Marini? Christian, we might just uh, just to ask people, did you cover what length of mascule would be the extent of the mascule technique with the panel? Like how much can you do as a mascule before it's too much? I have a one case that I had a success in the 12 cm. That was uh, my maximum, you know, the defect. Yeah, Yeah, my maximum is ten because the problem is the the donor side morbidity. That yeah, ten for me. Naval? Yeah, ten probably, not more. <laughs> Do you yeah, mix with allograft? I've never used uh, rear. I would prefer bone transport. In India, we see mixed infections who come in very late and multiple surgeries already done because I work in a tertiary level hospital. So then 
either I will go for a vascularized fibula or I'll go for a bone transport. I, I've never used RIA. I think those are very reliable ways to, uh, I'm going back to those methods actually. So I'll just show you one very quick case, very, very quick. Chris, so this, we, won't have, we won't have time for this case, Chris, so we'll just, uh, we'll just leave it. It's just a series of x-rays that, now this is a patient with a uh, RIA and it doesn't work. You see two, three, four months, the defect is still there, but we wait longer and longer, one year, two year, three years. It works only because the patient is 18 years old. That's the only reason that mm. I can think. Finish this case. <laughs> That's impressive. That, that was a good case to see actually. Thank you, Chris. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes it's better to be lucky, huh? That's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Christian. That was a great uh, discussion of cases. And, and now I'd like to invite Terachai to the uh, podium for, to talk thank to you. us about Hoffa and its uh, variations and management protocols. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you see my screen? It's all good, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, I will start. Then the last one, we have 30 minutes. Uh, the objective of this uh, discussion will be the surgical approach, how to select for the Hoffa fractures. Uh, what is the screw direction, AP or PA? Yeah, and how to select the approach and show you some case. Okay, this is the, I call the, the, the mapping of the surgical approach visibility, which we published uh, two years ago. Yeah, you can follow it. And in this picture, you can see uh, for each approach, what area you can see, like medial palapatella, subvatage approach, posterior approach, direct medial approach, whatever. Yeah, so this is important that what do you want to see? Because sometimes then you can see the fractures you cannot reduce or you cannot fix. So I try to give some guidelines, yeah, but not in every case that it fit well. First, I talk about the, the, the implant now. Yeah, you can use, in the past we said, okay, 6.5 cancellous screw is good, but right now, we know that the small screw is good enough because you fix the subchondral bone, right? But you need to prepare really long screws or the headless screw. This is good for the uh, countersink of the, of the head. And if you have the last fragment is clear, that is possible. You can put the screw from anterior to posterior. This is the uh, standard approach. However, in some case, if you have a small fragment of the, the hoffa and you try to put the screw from anterior, that means the thread will catch only small pieces. Yeah. So you need the posterior to anterior screw. This is more stable. But the problem is how to approach, how to see these fractures because you cannot see it well from the conventional approach. Okay, now, we know how far is a little bit difficult and sometimes it's challenging. Okay, from this x-ray, yeah, this is the first case. Two months after the injury, she has left knee pain and cannot move. And then the patient come, okay, who will help me? From just only this AP x-ray, what did you see? Anybody can help me? Daval, what do you say on this x-ray? I think there's a lateral uh, offer that's probably been missed. I think there's a double. Yeah, very good. Because you said, oh, where's this? this is the patella. And this also another patella, right? It's like mm. that. Yeah, in the lateral, it's clear. Right? And you see, this is the callus. It's already two months. And yeah, that's why the patient cannot move. Yeah, and this is a CT scan. Okay, someone help me. How you approach this type of fractures? 
narrative? What is yes, what are, your approach I think to this? In this case, uh, we see some chaos formation uh, yeah, on the top of the fragment because it's already two months, and uh, the the piece this is a bone is not not a, not too small, but actually we have to go there directly uh, and break the colors to reduce it back to the place. I think that the costal lateral approach will be appropriate in this case because we can place the plate if you want on the epic of the, the, the fractures and also we can fix it with a screw from the back. Mm -hmm. So you put a patient on the prone? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Any, any more options? Naval, would you use the same approach? Prone posterior, yeah. Oh, prone, prone with a posterior approach? Yeah. Uh, what is the limitation of the prone posterior approach? <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone can help me? Chris, help me. Are you there, Chris? Chris? No. I'm here. Yeah. You're asking about the approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one or how I to favor the back to forward uh, screws uh, for the half us because especially for this case, it's actually more oblique, the fracture plane. So a screw from back to front would be very good. I would flex the knee and then to open a incision actually posterior lateral behind the LCL. So behind the LCL is where I will put the screws, but then you have to also reduce the fracture. So at the same time in front of the LCL, you can see the, uh, the knee joint directly uh, and then do a uh, anatomical reduction there. And also a plate is needed, a buttress plate. Two screws are never enough to hold this kind of fracture. Yeah, okay, to make the story short, yeah, because I, at that time, yeah, it's long time ago. At that time, we said, okay, you can expose with the lateral palapatella. You can see the fragment from inside the joint and you can break it. Yeah, and you can extend a little bit more on the shaft because it's like a distal femur that you can approach on the lateral palapatella approach. You see the joint and you see the posterior cortex of the distal femur. Yeah, so I use this approach, yeah, and reduce, yeah, you see, this is the approach that we can make, we have to make a little bit longer, lateral palapatala patala approach, because this is a large fragment, and you see, this is a posterior spike, right, we can clean it, remove the callus here, yeah, and you can fix with the screw, even anterior, posterior, posterior to anterior. Yeah. If you ask me right now, yes, I will put a buttress, small buttress here yeah, as well. Yeah. And this is the, I fix, because this is big enough, I said it is more easy to point the screw anterior to posterior and a little one cross from lateral to medial. Right. So in this case, it end up with five screws. Yeah. And this is six, uh, five months. And this is the range of motion. Okay. Any comments from this uh, neck rated case? Any options or comments? So, Prof. Siraja, if a if you did a girdy tubercle osteotomy, you wouldn't improve the approach here? Uh, right now, I do not do any tubercle osteotomy because you can extend much. You see, the, the incision is go up a little bit quite high here. Okay. Yeah. Now, tubercle osteotomy may not be the good option. Yeah, You can extend up here and then you see more. Yeah. Okay. No more? Okay, I proceed. This is maybe straightforward. It's the case, maybe somebody can have seen it before. Okay, what is diagnosis? 
Atavan, what, what do you think? That's a medial uh, offer, I think. Uh, yeah. And again, um, the only challenge, really the CT, but the challenge would be, I think, combination on the posterior cortex. Okay, that's good. It's very good. Like you see the CTs. Huh? Yeah. yeah, this is the CT scan. And the size of this fragment is quite large. You have to compare maybe uh, like 40 to 50 percent of the AP diameter. Please, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you see the this uh, ACL erosion, but we don't talk about this uh, ACL erosion. Yeah, and this is the sagittal CT scan, and this is the three dimension. Yeah. Okay, how about this case? Approach, reduction. So, Naratip, what would you do in this situation? <clears throat> in this case, sir, I think the different uh, part uh, of this case compared with the previous one is the comminution because uh, when we face with the uh, comminuted fractures around this area, I think that the, uh, the plate is needed uh, to prevent the collapse of the fractures. So, uh, I will place the plate on the lateral, lateral uh, using the lateral approach. But 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 the problem is uh, there will be the MCL which is crossed uh, over in this area. So I have to uh, use the plate and control it to the posterior medial cortex to prevent the irritation to the MCL. So uh, I will use the uh, direct medial approach to 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 fix these fractures. Uh, and put the plate on the posterior medial uh, corners of the, uh, the the fractures. What, what what sort of plate would you use, Naratek? Would you use a like a T plate or a smaller fragment plate or a mini fragment plate? What sort of plate would you use? <laughs> oh, you're muted, Naratek. Sorry, oh, if we sorry. could unmute Nar yeah. Naratek. Okay, uh, I will use the reconstruction plate uh, that can I can control with. Uh, but in case that uh, there is a, a small fragment, of course, the small fragment says uh, the hand the hand plate, the distal radius plate should be prepared uh, because it may be able to fix the the small pieces of bone better than the uh, reconstruction plate. And I say something, I think this is a very good case for 3D printing. That That's a lot of my work. So these mm -hmm. comminutids in particular fracture, you yeah. see the problem selecting the good implant and a good uh, approach and the comminution really, it's difficult to judge even on the 3D uh, reconstruction on the screen, on the computer screen. But if you hold it on your hand, everything becomes so clear. <laughs> How about reduction techniques, Chris? Like, um, are there any tricks to this? Is it? Yeah, a lot of this is, uh, I, I will follow Noratap, use a direct medial approach, go more posterior, go posterior to the MCL, in fact. And then uh, because the gastrocnemius is pulling on that fragment and shortening, flexion actually helps the reduction a lot. Yeah, because this is, you see, is quite controversy that how even the, the, the experienced surgeons still have different idea for the approach, right? For, for my study, I think if this or my uh, surgical approach, if this is, you see, if you measure the size of these condyles, AP diameter is almost like 50% of these condyles. That means you can see the fractures from the front or the, from the anterior approach. Yeah, so this is the Palapatala approach again. Yeah, and just dissect, and then you open the joint. Yeah, with the defraction of the knee, yeah, you can reduce and you can see it because this is last fracture area from the, you can see from the front. 
right? Even with the clamp, you see, it's possible that you can clamp the fracture line here, around here. Yeah, and with these pictures, yeah, we should not forget because this is the different view that we never see in the normal. Yeah, because when you make a defraction of the knee, yeah, you can see it quite well. That's AP diameter is almost 50%. That's mean, yeah, we may not need to go to a difficult surgical approach, right? And this is the fixation. Yeah, the fracture is here. If you look carefully, the fracture line is come to here. Yeah. I'm not sure with how, because there is no metaphysical fragment. Yeah. If we put a plate, maybe it should stop over here. Uh, so in this case, because it's young patients and AP screw, you can catch with this uh, big fragment, the thread is catching. Yeah. And with the combined long screws from medial to lateral, yeah. Then the fracture is stable enough. And this is the five months. Okay, any comments for this case again? Any questions? That, that looks good, Tarachai. Did you get him moving right away? Uh, this is not my case. It's in the in the pool, but I, I think yeah, you can move the knee if you. I think it's stable enough. Maybe delay a little bit for this uh, fixation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just yeah. may need to delay the the cruciate ligament. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Then this is the case from CW. Yeah, he may help me. Seventy-eight years old. Okay. Now. We have only these two pictures. Uh, anyone can help me? Uh, Nar Narate, no. did you have any yeah. idea? Yes, sir. In this case, sir, if I classify as a lateral classification, it will be type two, uh, maybe two B, because uh, the fragment is not big, and of course the the. If we fix it from the front, we will have the problem with the stability because uh, the thread will not catch the distal fragment. So in this case, the fracture is located on the uh, posterior, uh, posterior medial. I think it will be the better way to go from the back. Uh, I will use the approach go from the posterior border of the MCL and fix it from the back to the front. Okay, do we have any more options? Anybody want to help me? So I no, want no. to look at the AP of the knee to see uh, if there is uh, osteoarthritis because she's 78. Sometimes uh, this should not be, it's okay, it's okay, Chris. Okay, yeah. sometimes um, the joint guys would say a replacement acutely is an option. They can straight go to weight bearing. Uh, but I never tried that, but but I believe some of the cases it, it can be done. Yeah, I think that in this case, if you look carefully, the cartilage is quite nice, right? It's quite nice. Naval, would you do anything different? Or? I'm just, th just thinking whether doing it from prone posterior is an option here. Sorry, you just broke up there. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, Deval may be having a connection issue. Um, uh -huh. Along the ridge. I cannot hear you. Sorry. Yeah, David, David, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, I'm, David. Uh, I'm sort of a little bit between Neurotep and Christian. Uh, in principle, I try not to do arthroplasty if we have good cartilage options, uh, even though she's elderly. And I wouldn't, if my solution was going to be a reduction and fixation, I wouldn't, I would just do that without trying to consider further arthroplasty options. 
And I would use the incision that I would use to best fix that, which for me probably would be a, uh, a direct medial approach and I would work around the posterior aspect of the MCL. And looking at our articular structures, they look okay. So I think I would probably follow, it, follow what Noritep's saying and directly fix it from a medial approach from the back and maybe use a small plate. Okay, good. The challenge is to put the leg screws. How to put the leg screws from the back to the front? Oh, uh, you can go through the cartilage or go sideways. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can go from the cartilage. Okay, just make it short. Okay, you see these pictures, right? This is the medial palapatra approach. You can see the fractures. Yeah, and if you make deep friction, maybe you can fix it, but you, the, 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 it's really small. It's really small. Yeah. Yeah, and with this picture, you can see, you can put the screw from front to back. Because with this approach, you cannot put from back to front. Yeah, and then it's, you can fix it. Yeah, but quite risky if look carefully. Yeah, really small trade that cash on this small fragment. Yeah, but fortunately, it's healed. It's healed. I want to ask, how do you protect this patient? Do you keep it in, in the cast? Does it allow him to flex for a few months? <laughs> okay, see the bill. Can you help me? I cannot remember this case. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's yeah, we should not do this. I think it's just to show that, yeah, because we, we don't know much about the approach. Now we go to the next. Yeah, it's like a uh, small medium half uh, fractures. Like I think yeah. uh, I think our time is up, Tarajai. I think so. Okay. We yeah, we're uh, running out of ten time. minutes. Ten minutes, yeah, yeah. ten minutes? Yeah. No, uh, it finishes at 13. Oh, yeah, sorry, you have 10 minutes. Sorry, Terry. Okay, okay, take okay. Time. okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just show you this case again. Now, you use this approach. You can fix from back to front. And this is perfect, right? I just show you a very uh, anatomical study. This is called a direct media approach. It's very easy to fix the posterior medial of the condyle. Yeah. This is the posterior MCL is here. Yeah. And then you go posterior to the MCL. Now you open the capsule and you see all the whole condyles here. Now this is not a difficult approach, but maybe we are not familiar with it. Yeah. And with the flexion and extension of the knee, you can see more area of these posterior condyles and you can fix directly with the screws. As Chris asked me, right? You can fix from directly here, posterior to anterior. And normally the fracture line should be around here. Yeah. Now go to the last case. I'm not sure. This is a really uncommon fractures. Yeah. Just to make sure, okay, this is a CT scan. How to approach? Anybody can help me? Mm -hmm. We will not talk about conservative treatment. It's not, it's not complete fractures, right? Uh, the, the fracture is not complete? Uh, it's like not complete, yeah. Yeah, just cast him. <laughs> no, you cannot. Yes, because he has this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to fix it. <laughs> oh, oh, Chris, you, you will fix just only tibia. <laughs> yeah, just fix the tibia and then... <laughs> <laughs> Why Probably not? the surgeon has no more energy after fixing the tibia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how to fix it? This is the posterior lateral and small fragment. Yeah, it's... Daval, what would be your approach? Can you fix this? Is splitting the uh, lateral head of gastrocnemius by a single screw. Yeah. Like you do in the uh, this thing for the 
is it possible with just splitting the lateral the origin of the lateral head of the gastro yeah i mean just needs one screw to but you know put it down. you don't need a plate there yeah i think so, we, we can put the, the screws yeah but i just because it's really uncommon and i will show the approach right for okay. this uh, small posterior lateral hoffer yeah and this is in prone position it's like a posterior lateral tibia plateau but you go up here you palpate the lateral of the bicep yeah this is the bicep femoris coming down and then you identify the bicep here this is the common peroneal nerve right? and the lateral gastrocnemius is here so we just retract the lateral gastro we go medial to the lateral gastro and be careful on the medial side this is the popliteal artery is here right? but we don't go there yeah we just protect it with the retractor this is the posterior capsule of the lateral femoral condyles and if you want to go up here you can dissect and put the posterior capsule on the upper part yeah you can do the capsulotomy now and you see the condyles yeah we go up a little bit approach now you see the spike here mm. right the non dispress yeah we can stop here by putting the screws and it is enough but because of the the very rare condition i i will try to use that okay is possible yeah that you can put the buttress plate here this is a good option if you have a dispress of the posterior lateral and then you can buttress and put the screws now is front to back directly compress the fracture with the this cancellous screws and you also have the buttress and this is the post up because this is quite long because we fix the posterior lateral tibial plateau as well yeah and this is for months yeah and this is and the sure okay he can sit he can walk okay so in my summary to make it short i just want to demonstrate that if you have the fragment last fragment of the medial condyles just more than 30% or the lateral condyle more than 20% of the ap diameters most of the case you can see from the palapatra approach yeah and fixation may be enough from the front to back yeah if you have a small fragment around 20% or 30% of the medial or lateral femoral condyles then i may suggest you use the posterior lateral or the direct medial approach to fix from back to front yeah however there is some area right okay take home message diagnosis is crucial you need good planning fragment size is important the configuration and the combination determine the approach yeah in some case that you have comminuted fractures or multi prana fractures yeah you require the combined board in some case yeah yeah check pagal yeah call it you can move again pagal 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 who do we need to mute there if we could uh, Val, if we could mute that microphone mukul okay. neta yeah now this is a summary last fragment posterior to anterior screw you we have more this may tell you less than 20% or less than 10% of no, the zameen jaa wo karu cha ek aage zameen dewa then you make a posterior retro approach okay if you cannot remember then you take this uh, look at this article and then you will see all the detail thank you very much thank thank you very much darachai and i think that's going to bring the end of this session to a close uh it's been a tremendous session i've learned a lot and i'm very grateful for all the presentations that everyone's done they've been 
there's been a lot of hard work in all of those presentations and uh, I appreciate all your experience. So I'd like to say thank you to Jolton, CW, Catherine, Harpal, Christian and Therachai. Uh, they were fantastic talks. Uh, also to our, our panellists who we've been asking lots of questions of throughout this session. So uh, to Noratep and Deval, thank you. It's, it's been excellent. And, uh, and also thank you to Marini for uh, setting this up and and, and uh, moderating this session. So, so uh, thank you for all attending session one. Uh, session two is just about to start, so I'll, I'll hand over to the moderators, Christian and Sarah. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It will be Saeed moderating in, instead of me. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you. So just, uh, this is John Mukhopadhyay from Patna. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be joining a little later because we have an AO upper limb uh, pre-course meeting. I think Frankie is also going to be there as well. So I'll join at, in about an hour's time as soon as I get out of that. Okay, Marini? Yep, that sounds great, John. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. See you guys later. Hi, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hey, Frankie. Good to see you. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to open the second session on on humerus and elbow and uh, welcome uh, Saeed Al Tani from uh, good friend orthopedic surgeon and Sarah Cole from uh, Queensland, Frankie Leong from uh, Hong Kong and Leah uh, Maliana from Indonesia. That um, will be moderated by Saeed and uh, Sarah, and uh, the cases will be presented by Martin Richardson, M K Wong. Rajesh Malhotra, Frank, uh, Frankie will produce a case, and then uh, Inho Jian, and then John Mukhopadhyay will be coming uh, back for the uh, terrible triad. So, Saeed and Sarah, uh, we look forward to hearing some great things about and learning about the humerus and the elbow. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we'll go with the ladies first. So, Sarah, maybe starting. So I think Martin Richardson is presenting the uh, the yes. first. Case. Would you like me to introduce um, the esteemed Martin Richardson? That'd be great, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is he live? Is he with us, or am I waiting until he's ready? Are we live at the moment? Yeah, live. Yeah. But, uh, I think we are waiting for Martin. Hmm. Yeah, he just replied my email earlier. He should be okay. Maybe a technical issue for him. Maybe you can get the next presenter to start and then he can come back the second one. Yeah, is M MK, are you online? MK, oh, you're on mute, MK. Are you happy to do yours uh, first? I'll have to introduce him later. <laughs> M MK, I think you're on mute. He's not on mute, but his mic is not connected or All somehow. Right. <laughs> okay. You may have to go to okay. your voice settings. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't know it's a, a case presentation. I have a lecture. Uh, is that going to be a problem? If it is, then I'll, I'll have to start a bit later and get a case. No, 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 no problem, MK. Okay. Because uh, I've got quite a few that needed a total elbow. So uh, it's quite interesting. Okay. So I, I'll just give the lecture. So do I do I start now? 
Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes I uh, yeah. think uh, we need to move on with the time yeah. here, so okay. we will, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, let me share the screen. Thank you, MK. Not a problem, moment. Um, uh, okay. Share screen. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? Ah, uh, yeah, we yes, can see. We can see. Okay. Yes. yes. So okay. I, somehow I can't see it. Okay. Um, right. So uh, my lectures on the distal humerus, intraarticular fractures, and complications. Uh, I'm uh, Prof Wong from uh, Singapore. Uh, I belong to a couple of medical schools, uh, but there seems to be one more every 10 years. So uh, I'm from Duke, I'm from NUS. I'm currently heading the uh, St. Kang Hospital, which is a stone stroll from the uh, Changi Airport, which is suffering the quietest period of its life. So learning outcomes is uh, quickly, we go through the uh, surgical anatomy of the distal humerus. And uh, with that, we need to understand some reduction principle. Uh, and follow on, you can understand the surgical tactics uh, that will be appropriate for the individual fractures. And uh, the key really is to fix the articular surface first and then uh, connecting that to the shaft. And then we'll go through some literature about the expected outcome. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about some uh, potential complications. So the anatomy of the distal humerus is uh, complicated. Uh, it's got a couple of uh, joint surfaces as depicted in this simplified diagram. Um, it's also got a few tilts and twists. Uh, the portion uh, of uh, the trochlea is pointing forward uh, off the uh, sagittal plane. Degrees valgus to give you the carry angle. And uh, there is a coronoid fossa which is uh, uh, good for only parking the uh, olecranon uh, and the coronoid and, and nothing much else. It's basically a thin plate of bone. So if you need fixation, you will really need to access and uh, stabilize the lateral column, which consists of the, the lateral column as well as the epicondyle. And the medial column consists of the epicondyle and its column and they all have some offset relative to each other. So as Christian said, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it is useful to have a 3D printed situation of uh, the fracture to allow uh, you to wrap your head around the actual problem uh, because uh, on the ground, when you've exposed the fracture, it is rare that you could see all around it. So you have to have an idea what's, uh, what's where you can't see, uh, if, if for want of a better way of putting it. Okay, so the evaluation for classification uh, usually is very useful to look at the uh, skin, uh, soft tissue envelope. Most of us has been in uh, practice for a long, long time and I have a huge team under me uh, but I find it extremely useful to have a physical examination of the limb prior to surgery uh, because uh, wrapped up in a back slab, uh, it, you know, things were hidden and sometimes not well documented. Uh, and we've totally gone digital. And, and uh, I'm not sure about your system, uh, but everybody makes their own little entry and they are not unified so sometimes somebody saw something and he's written down in a note that you didn't access and then lo and behold you're going to be rather surprised during surgery and that 
sometimes can radically change what you need to do. So I always do my own physical examination, looking at the soft tissue envelope and kind of decide uh, whether it is uh, a good time to go in and uh, what else do I have to do uh, to close the soft tissue at the end of it. Uh, neurovascular examination is extremely important, uh, not least because if something occur after surgery, a uh, patient wouldn't be blaming you if it had happened already prior. Uh, X-ray examination, uh, the standard AP lateral, but uh, if it is crushed in such a way, uh, it is quite difficult uh, for most of us to uh, key in the pieces. So a bit of attraction sometimes gives you a much better view. You will need the uh, AP view, the lateral traction view, and of course, most of us will have access to a CT scan. So CT scans are helpful in understanding comminution. Uh, and uh, as the previous session about hopeful fractures of the knee, uh, sometimes you can't uh, appreciate the hofa till you're in the joint. Uh, so the CT scan can pick that, that, those things out. Uh, you will also have an idea of how bad the osteoporosis is uh, if the fragments look uh, very penciled out and uh, the uh, individual uh, bone um, uh, lines are not very clear and then you, you basically have an osteoporotic patient at hand despite he, may, he or she may not exactly fit the profile of one. Um, I've had the uh, fortunate or unfortunate uh, encounter with patients with previous deformity, whether it be it from osteogenesis imperfecta or just a previously very interesting life where people fall off from buildings and aircrafts, uh, pre-existing deformity are useful to know beforehand. Uh, then a quick one, uh, there's always the AO classification for communication of the severity of the injury. A type A is extra articular, type B is partial articular, and a type C, which is what uh, we are talking about today, is totally intra-articular, and depending on whether the articular portion is simple uh, all complex and the metaphysical is simple or complex, you get basically C1, 2, or a 3, where almost everything is uh, not in its original place. So, what do we want out of a fixation of a distal uh, humeral fracture? Uh, because it's a joint, you need to get an anatomical reduction and a stable internal fixation of the articular surface. Uh, if you've achieved that, then you will follow it on with a stable fixation of that joint block to the metaphysis and the diaphysis. And if you've achieved both that aim, then you can have a early range of motion of the elbow. Now, that is quite important because... Failure to achieve that will result in a very stiff elbow whereupon uh, you may need to uh, go in with, at about the six-month period and again asking permission of the ulnar nerve uh, and uh, extracting some uh, hardware perhaps and definitely arthrofibrolysis uh, uh, arthro of the joint. And that's... <clears throat> usually not an entirely uh, happy uh, uh, endeavor. So uh, if you can fix the joint block stably to the metaphysis and diaphysis, then uh, you are able to move the elbow and secure the functional range of motion of between 30 and 120. Finally, it'd be nice if uh, you can restore the articular uh, axial alignment. Uh, but that actually is not uh, a very important landmark because uh, the uh, human species are able to really uh, accommodate quite a fair bit uh, of uh, malalignment of the upper limb. Uh, 
as I alluded to previously, uh, in my patients, uh, I seem to have quite a few that has severe osteoporosis. And uh, in that situation, a total elbow arthroplasty in an elderly patient is certainly a very effective uh, uh, mode of uh, treatment. Uh, granted that the total elbow uh, the, uh, in the trauma situation really doesn't that have that great a track record uh, of survivability, but uh, in a low demand patient, uh, it gets them up and about uh, very quickly to self care. Uh, back of bones technique now, uh, that, in my mind, uh, has always been there to help. Uh, I've always been surprised by the outcome of the back of bones technique. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, a fair bit of discussion with the patient and a very hands-on care where you examine the limb every, uh, every two or three days and uh, you, with the help of a brace, uh, get patient to uh, carefully uh, mobilize with and without fixation. So you're aiming for a fibrous union with enough stability for self-functional care. So in a very elderly patient with low demand, the back of bone technique actually um, performs rather well. Uh, it also performs well uh, in a patient group which you absolutely do not want to get involved with. Uh, patients with uh, multiple drug abuse, uh, with uh, poor skin due to whatever dermatological or other reasons, uh, poor diabetic control, uh, surgery sometimes can be uh, uh, a, rap a rapid uh, slippery slope down to hell. So a bag of bones may just be the thing you need. So questions to ask. Uh, while I look at the examination of the patient is, uh, what is the severity of the soft tissue damage? Is it possible to go in now or do I need to perform damage control with some sort of external fixator, hinge or otherwise? Uh, is a patient having a, a B or C type fracture? Uh, is the articular surface uh, disrupted and how badly is that? And uh, then the next question is knowing these pieces, can we uh, reduce and fix it stably? Uh, I used to do the cases in a lateral position, but uh, I have since moved to the prone position because uh, as the diagram showed, uh, I was far more able to peek into the front of the joint from a posterior perspective uh, if you could flex the elbow a lot more. So clearly in a lateral position, you are unable to flex as much. Uh, the approach basically uh, uh, cir uh, circul uh, circulate around the issue of the ulnar nerve. Uh, the very first order of business is to look for the ulnar nerve, dissect it out, and ask its permission to be moved. So that's always the first uh, thing to do. And it's best to look for the ulnar nerve uh, at about the 10, 12 centimeter from the epicondyle. Uh, round the epicondyle, the ulnar nerve is uh, quite stuck to the epicondylar soft tissue. And uh, with the fracture, having shifted that landmark for you is disingenuous to try and dissect it out directly there straight away. So I trace it down from about 10, 12 centimeters uh, uh, around the uh, muscle and intermuscular septum. Uh, the radial nerve usually doesn't figure a large part in the dissection because it's about at the mid shaft level. But if for whatever reason, the comminution extends to that region and you need to span uh, the shaft, then you have uh, to be aware uh, where is it in relation to the periosteum? It is not usually stuck to the periosteum, but rather to a thin layer of muscle about 8 to 10 millimeters uh, uh, above the periosteum. So the first order of business, identification of the ulnar nerve. Uh, now, 
to really look at uh, the individual uh, uh, comminution of the uh, troplia, uh, the standard of care is the olecranon osteotomy. And to perform that, it is wise to increase the surface area of contact by doing a V osteotomy, uh, as depicted in the picture. The cartilage, uh, inner cartilage break is conducted with an osteotome. Uh, so you saw down to the subchondral, and then you crack through the cartilage with an osteotome. Uh, this is so that uh, you don't uh, saw through and also damage the trochlea uh, uh, by doing the osteotomy. Uh, personally, I try not to perform a olecranon osteotomy. If I, uh, from the CT scan, is able to determine that there's only a single fracture line in the trochlea, uh, then uh, leaving the olecranon intact gives me a template upon which the trochlea can be reduced to. So if you take apart the olecranon, then uh, you have to kind of figure out where things go in relation to each other because now the opposite surface, or if you want to uh, call that the negative more of a positive, uh, it, it's gone. So uh, once you've taken out the uh, osteotomy, you really have the whole distal humerus uh, in your field. And this one is not looking good at all. Uh, in fact, if you think about the approaches that's available to you, there are quite a few choices. Uh, there's the olecranon osteotomy. There is the tricep splitting, which I prefer. I do two splits both medial and lateral to the olecranon. And there's also the triceps reflecting, which uh, is used to do a uh, total elbow arthroplasty. And of course, you can also uh, detach and then reattach the triceps, uh, which I have no experience with. Um, the decision that, uh, uh, or rather the bits of the condition that may point you one way or the other is whether a patient has suffered in addition, a tricep laceration in a, a one form or the other, uh, whether you're thinking of doing an arthroplasty, and how much of the articular combination do you need to see before you can fix it? And finally, the bone quality, uh, if it is really very osteoporotic, you really need to have uh, full access before you can try and put them together. So the principle of reduction is always the joint block first. Uh, yes, it is useful to uh, know where to connect to the columns so that your preliminary fixation are not directly in line with the uh, connection to the columns, but nevertheless, uh, the priority is the joint block. Once you get the joint block together, then you can decide how do you want to connect to the column. So it's all uh, well, uh, with interfragmentary screws and multiple K wires, uh, skinny or otherwise K wires, threaded or otherwise. So uh, okay, we've had yes. a we've had a question about where is the exact anatomical landmark to do the olecranon osteotomy? You able to take us uh, walk us yeah. through how you work yeah. out? Uh, let me go back there. So the landmark uh, where you want to exit uh, would be at the, uh, it, it, can you see my uh, arrow or the mouse? Oh, no. I think it's no, this. Oh, this, one, this one. I got so many screens. Can you see the uh, arrow now? Thank you. That's perfect. All ah, right. So uh, this is the, um, uh, uh, the coronal plane right at the uh, equator of that is where you want to access uh, the uh, joint surface. But uh, I prefer to go a little bit more distal because, uh, oh, sorry, I prefer to go a bit more proximal because in my mind, the area uh, distal is the weight-bearing area of the olecranon. 
and therefore it would be helpful to spare that cartilage uh, uh, for patient's future function. So round about where my mouse is, is where you want uh, to center the osteotomy, right there. Do you ever find yourself too proximal? Which? Oh, too proximal. Uh, well, it depends on the, what you intend to fix it with, with the current uh, things that you can fix it with. Uh, uh, that is not too much of a problem. So uh, proximal uh, is, is, for me, not too much of a problem. But yes, you, you really don't want to complicate your uh, osteotomy too much because uh, a non-union of that is an iatrogenic complication. So just go at the equator. Uh, you can't really do any worse than or better than that. Thank, thank okay, you. I move on. Right, temporary fixation. And of course, uh, once uh, you've uh, got a reasonable uh, stability, so notice I said reasonable stability. I left out the word alignment and uh, anatomic in a way. So you really need to be anatomic with the joint surface, but the rest of it, uh, sometimes you need to make some compromises uh, you really don't want to leave large uh, cortical, tricortical areas that are not in continuity, uh, especially in the more elderly patient. That's uh, literally a landmark uh, leading to failure. So uh, you may want to actually collapse uh, the, the distal to the proximal to get some stability in bony contact. But we, we have to, of course, realize if you do that, uh, the olecranon fossa, if it's obliterated with uh, a cortical bone, then you're going to lose flexion and extension. Okay, so uh, the current options we have are all locking compression plates. Uh, I think the days of uh, trying to bend a uh, recon plate uh, with uh, cortical screws, uh, I'm glad those days are over. Now, I noticeably did not talk about uh, whether it's a 1990 or 180 fixation. Uh, me and Jesse Jupiter had a, a long discussion on this, and he basically said, you know, you, you do whatever you need to get it fixed. Uh, the, the ideology doesn't really matter. So if there is just a piece of fragment that you need to secure, and sometimes you see, you know, looking at the, um, uh, the second example of the x-ray, it is basically uh, 90, 90, and 180 all in one patient. So uh, don't get too hung up with uh, which concept you're going with, uh, but just uh, do whatever is needed to get the stability that is needed. Um, let's... Right, so this is the slide, uh, you know, that uh, basically says, uh, you know, just do whatever you need to get it stable. So why would you need a posterior plate? A posterior plate uh, on the lateral aspect allow the screw right up to the tip of the capitulum. That's the furthest part of a platable situation. So if you have a fracture, there's extremely distal, I think uh, you, you have to make sure uh, that shot goes in. Um, the medial and lateral uh, implants, uh, at least from the uh, AO and synthase, just doesn't go as distal, uh, purely because we aren't able to design a plate that has an anatomical fit to every individual in the seven continents. So it ends uh, short around the epicondyle. Uh, the variability beyond that is just way too much for uh, a plate uh, to be designed to hug the situation. So yes, there are some rare situations where you need to be able to contour your own plate, but Realize that the uh, recon plate is way weaker than a molded 
uh, anatomic plate. And uh, the elbow, surprisingly, uh, has a huge torque. And I have, uh, in my earlier days, uh, witnessed quite a few of my senior colleagues uh, with a, uh, a, a recon plate that failed dramatically within six weeks. So uh, uh, beware that if you have to bend a plate, recon, as in this picture, uh, you may want to coach the patient on his rehab in a very careful fashion. So the posterior plate allows screws right up to the distal tip of the capitulum. The lateral plate is meant to be a buttress, uh, and it goes usually up to the epiconda. Uh, the medial plate uh, also cradles the epiconda, and it gives you ability to secure uh, uh, in a 180 uh, fashion uh, medial to lateral uh, column. Oops. Uh, the osteotomy uh, fixation could be a tension band, uh, or it could be an intra uh, medullary uh, nail stroke screw type of construct. Uh, I don't have a particular um, preference, uh, but uh, these are the two simpler ways of fixing uh, that. So uh, it is helpful to pre drill. Uh, the intramedullary screw, if you intend uh, to fix it with a uh, 4.5 or a 6.5 intramedullary uh, screw with a tension band. Oops. Okay. Right. Um, okay, this is a case. So uh, this is a case that demonstrate a few uh, principles, if you are um, faced with a tough uh, situation, he's an Austrian working in Singapore, uh, and uh, he came off uh, a bridge uh, in his uh, mountain bicycle, and he basically uh, flew off both man and bicycle, and frankly, he doesn't know how he landed. Um, and uh, I didn't know how he landed either because uh, on the uh, back slab and uh, um, x-ray, it, it's uh, basically a mess. Uh, the CT scan uh, is helpful, uh, but uh, maybe here Christian will say uh, uh, having a 3D printed model uh, may be a little bit more, uh, in uh, in uh, may yield a bit more information. So... He ends up with a uh, couple of compromises in his fixation. Uh, one is that he has a hofa kind of uh, fracture on the lateral uh, part of his capitulum. And therefore, that screw is actually uh, bicortical. And clearly, that uh, gives him some grief uh, when he tries to fully flex his elbow. But at that point, uh, I have literally no choice but to do this because there's just no way I could fix that anterior hofa. And a uh, olecranon osteostomy was performed and I was reasonably happy with the articular fixation. So note that this is a 1990 construct and the uh, Lateral uh, posterior plate allows a very distal fixation, and it also allows a uh, coronal fixation, all right? Uh, there's no other plate that really allows that. So that allows a coronal fixation to a plate. Uh, but that was not uh, the uh, end uh, of a rosy story. Uh, he went on uh, to test his fixation, he wanted to go back to the gym. He started put, doing push-ups, and uh, and he, he had some complaints. So I had to bring him in about uh, four to six months where I had uh, to remove uh, one of his plates. And uh, luckily, at that point, his uh, capitulum has healed. And uh, he went on further uh, for the segmental portion of the medial uh, to have a plate uh, and that was removed a year and a half later. Uh, 
uh, uh, he, he's happy with this uh, function, having flexion from 15 to 120 degrees, and he's still very, very physically active, uh, trying to kill himself on the various uh, sports that he loves. So the complication of fixation uh, is quite a bit. Yeah. We're a bit short on time. Oh, okay. To- yeah, yeah. Okay, a quick one. Uh, there are quite a few complications of fixation. Uh, on the literature, there's a 12% post-traumatic arthritis, 9% non-union, and note that the iatrogenic problem of olecranon non-union, and uh, 15% neuropathy, whether pre and post uh, the uh, the surgery, and 100% of them would be whinging about uh, stiffness of the elbow. And luckily for Singapore, we have very little heterotrophic ossification, but certainly that's a problem uh, in the the European and the American uh, areas. Okay, so this is a uh, mild union uh, where the alignment is uh, a bit off, and this is a non-union. Okay, so just a few words about uh, total elbow arthroplasty as a as a salvage. Clearly, this is only in the elderly age group, which, for whatever reason, my hospital see a lot. Um, the key is that if the patient goes first for a fixation and then a subsequent uh, salvage arthroplasty, uh, you're gonna get a lot, a lot more uh, poor outcome. You, because you then will be working with broken hardware, a contracture, and a basically an unhappy patient for the past several months. So it is far better if uh, you can't restore the joint on table, uh, do a primary TEA. So if you compare the outcome of uh, irreconstructible distal humerus fractures in elderly patients, uh, the uh, ORIF group uh, has a slightly worse result, uh, 75 versus 100 good and excellent result. Uh, but the arthroplasty uh, group has more uh, ulnar nerve neuropathy. Um, and the other classifications are basically different. One, you worry about loosening and long-term longevity. Uh, on the other fixation group, you worry about non-union. Uh, if you look at the, uh, oops, that's just too fast. Uh, if you look at the uh, outcome uh, in terms of the scores, uh, definitely uh, the TEA group has a better and quicker recovery of their function. The only problem, uh, uh, the only problem is uh, the total elbow really has a um, has a poor uh, survivability uh, survival curve compared to the total knee. So if you it does have a survival curve. Uh, and uh, for younger patients, it is not really a good choice. All right? Okay. So in my uh, experience, there are several things that will really immediately indicate to you a total elbow may well uh, do much better. If you have coronal fractures in an osteoporotic, uh, in the current uh plate uh, choices, you're going to be hard-pressed to have a stable fixation of those. Remember that uh, this is basically shells. Yeah, you have a, a, a orange that doesn't have a pulp. So your screws has to go bicortical, and that's not going to do well in the joint situation. So coronal fractures and osteoporotics, uh, that's to me an indication of primary TEAs. And the other one is the metaphysical comminution. So uh, on the right radiograph where my mouse is circling, you can see that uh, the distal uh, fracture width and the proximal fracture width doesn't match up, which means by the time you fix this, you've got to get a whole segment of cortical discontinuity. So either you are uh, able to do a tricortical graft from the pelvis, uh, which is uh, an autograph. Uh, I'm not too sure patients love that when they are 65. Uh, uh, you, you are best served if you, if you just replace this. Okay, so the take-home message is uh, 
th this is an area where you, you need to have uh, 3D printed knowledge of the anatomy. Uh, you need to then with that 3D print, uh, do a proper preoperative planning. Uh, and that would include uh, uh, a thinking of how do you adequately expose for the cartilage uh, reduction. Uh, you've got to be familiar with all the reduction and fixation methods, uh, tools and otherwise that will be helpful during surgery. Uh, the principles are the same actually for all intraarticular uh, injuries. It's just that this is a very difficult fracture with a short distal fragments. And if you have poor bone stock, you're going to end up with a high rate of complications. Okay, uh, I think that's that's it. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much. There, are, There's another few uh, topics we can debate here about um, total elbow replacements, but I think we probably should try and keep a little bit closer to time. Um, sorry Dr. about that. Yeah. No, no, that. no, that was excellent presentation. Thank you. Dr. Rajesh Malhotra, are you available to um, share your screen and come online? Thank you. Excellent. Well done. Good. So, um, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, the APOA and uh, all my friends who uh, thought me worthy of giving this talk. I'm going to talk about the fracture care in elderly. I'm going to tell you how one shoe doesn't fit all. So the fractures in elderly are different ball game. The fracture patterns are completely different. And that's because they have poor bone density and poor mechanical strength. They get uh, fractures very easily with trivial trauma. And then osteosynthesis and rehabilitation are very challenging with the attendant increased morbidity and mortality. And the challenge is to restore the pre-injury level of function. And we have to actually somehow try and avoid uh, they are becoming unable to function independently, which is a great loss for them and for caregivers. It's important to have medical history, cognitive history, and functional history, particularly the ambulatory status, because that will determine what kind of treatment we are going to give them and the living arrangements. And the optimal fracture treatment is definitely a prerequisite to maintaining quality of life. So no single shoe fits everyone here because the fracture care has to be personalized. They need medical evaluation. The comorbidities have to be taken care of. Survival is actually the primary aim and we have to reduce the morbidity. So the, uh, the shoe size and shape here is the patient factors. The quality of shoe is what the surgeon can give to the patient. The comfort is the patient's choice. The durability of the shoe here will be what is the long-term outcome uh, of the treatment which you are giving. And of course, there are cost and resource specific factors. And usual perspective of the orthopedic surgeon is to, to uh, obtain the stable fracture fixation and prevent secondary loss, uh, address possible impaired fracture healing, and find a balance between minimally invasive and restrictive surgery. Um, so this is the summary of what is optimal care. When you get an old patient with a, with a fracture, the first objective is to keep the patient alive. And that includes the acute medical management. You have to fix the fracture with its attendant surgical challenges. You have to keep the patient mobile, which may need multidisciplinary uh, rehabilitation. And then you have to keep patient from returning to your fracture unit, which needs the osteoporosis management. And the surgical indications here are quite different because the functional demands of the patients are different. The long-term results are not that important as in a young patient. You want just, uh, they are not going to possibly live for as long as the younger people and uh, you are not worried so much about the long-term results of the procedure. The surgery is most difficult, more difficult, less predictable and the risk of complications including the medical complications like delirium, hyponatremia are much more common. So you have higher risks and lesser benefits. That's what we have to keep in mind. So I'll tell you the different um, principles from 1st to 12th. 
uh, uh, which have to be observed. So the first one is treating conservatively is not neglecting. So there's an excellent role of conservative management in elderly patients, in spine surgery, in spine fractures, upper limb. And in this COVID era, when we have to limit uh, the surgical interventions and in resource limited uh, settings, there are no absolute indications for conservative treatment, but that we know that in acute osteo the osteoporotic vertebral fractures, more than 90% patients do not need any surgical treatment. And you may even use the, uh, the uh, indigenous base braces to get the patient out of the trouble. Uh, there are increasingly casting and bracing op options for uh, limb fractures. Some of them have been developed by my department. And then you have the modern braces with uh, mobile joints, which actually conserve the movement. So it's not that uh, choosing conservative treatment means accepting disability. You can obtain range of motion. So the usual indications for conservative treatment are the stable and undisplaced fractures, the displaced fractures, but which are stable after reduction and medically unfit patients. For all other types, the evidence is evolving. So this is a classical proffer trial, and I think every orthopedic surgeon should know about it, which showed that in patients with displaced proximal humeral fracture, there was no significant difference between the surgical treatment and non-surgical treatment at two years. What is more, the same results were, uh, were maintained unchanged at five years. So uh, this is something which needs uh, introspection, whether we really should be operating on every proximal humeral fracture which we see. This is a study of reverse shoulder arthroplasty versus non-operative treatment. And except for some lesser pain initially, no tangible benefit of reverse shoulder arthroplasty over the uh, non-operative treatment. Now, this is a 66-year-old patient of ours, history of CA breast with pericardial fibrosis. And you can see could get reasonably good uh, results with conservative treatment. Now, what about the distal humerus fracture in the elderly? Now, conservative treatment in these fractures also has been shown to preserve independence and provide satisfactory clinical result without stiffness or instability. Uh, but you have to be prepared to accept the suboptimal x-rays. We have all talked about the bag of bones, and we know that this is a treatment which, is, um, uh, which aims to conserve the distal humerus fractures in a low-demand patient. And it has been reported to have a modest functional results, uh, but avoids all the complications or risk of complications in the surgery. Another review, non-operative treatment of olecranon fractures, another common or not uncommon fracture among the elderly. And there's evidence to suggest that non-operative treatment of olecranon fracture provides acceptable clinical results. Now, this is a classical study, which is often quoted and which showed that uh, the surgical arm of the, uh, of the trial had to be stopped prematurely because of the high rate of complications. So uh, you can conserve them very well, as also uh, um, reported in this EFORT open review, that it provides reasonable function and satisfaction in elderly population. Uh, another systemic review, displaced olecranon fractures in patients older than 70 years may be effectively managed with non-operative treatment. You may actually buy the complications like the pulling out of the implants out of the osteoporotic bone when you try to fix. On the other hand, you have this patient who can get reasonably good function even when conserved in spite of the ghastly looking x-rays. So remember that olecranon fractures in elderly can be conserved. But what about a distal radius fracture? Now, the older, uh, low demand patients may not benefit from the surgical intervention even when there is significant deformity because there's no significant difference in the outcomes. So uh, you can conserve distal radius fractures in the in the uh, old people, especially if I have a patient who has multiple comorbidities, I have no hesitation. What about the ankle fractures? Now this um, ankle injury management trial, the AIM trial, which com uh, compared the close contact casting with open surgical reduction and internal fixation showed that the close contact casting gave a clinically equivalent result to open reduction internal fixation at reduced cost, although there were higher uh, malunions, but then more infections in the surgical group. A word of caution here, however, in diabetic patients, especially which have impaired sensation, whether um, you treat conservatively or surgically, if the fixation is unstable or the fracture remains mobile, they have a very high risk of going into sharp wood joint. So I would much rather fix them rigidly and uh, uh, try to avoid that complication than to try conservative if it's a diabetic, which is uh, 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 which has got a person who has got severe diabetes. Now, there are some challenges with the conservative treatment. There is insufficient stability, which may result in uh, the... Uh, 
secondary displacement, uh, the patient compliance may be an issue, especially the adequate mental and physical health for weight bearing and mobilization is required and completing activities of daily living may become a challenge and there is a decreased mobility. Now, the second principle is that the conservative treatment is sometimes best for patient even when the literature, literature suggests otherwise. This is a 62-year-old female mother of a doctor, no history of trauma, pain in right hip for four weeks, x-rays were normal, MRI showed tensile type of stress fracture. Now, the classical teaching is that you must always fix the tensile uh, type of uh, neck fever uh, fractures because they displace, but the T-score was minus 6.9. Now, with that T-score, I didn't have the guts to put in an implant, which I am sure will would have pulled out so i started the patient on non weight bearing mobilization teriparatide subcutaneously with oral vitamin d and calcium supplementation the patient improved and three months later everything healed so not every tensile uh, stress fracture uh, if especially if you uh, apprehend the issues with fixation needs to be fixed now, the third principle is don't fix it always, even if it is broken. Now, the classical example is the acetabular fracture in the elderly. And it has been shown that the open reduction internal fixation of geriatric acetabular fracture leads to, um, leads to very high complication rates and very high mortality. So it may be well advised to fix them primarily, especially if they are old and have got multiple comorbidities. This is an adult male who had uncontrolled diabetes and, um, and the uh, bad chest. So his uh, uh, fixation was postponed for two weeks when he was brought to me. And I thought that with this kind of fracture, which had already delayed, went ahead and did this. And then we have a large series. This is the uh, octopus cage by, um, by one of the companies. And this is now withdrawn. But then we had a large series and we reported on the acute total hepatoplasty in acetabular fracture in elderly in journal of arthroplasty. Another example, when the things look really very bad, you can use this porous metal shell with a birch knife cage and do a cup cage construct and that can put the patient back on their feet. I would not uh, risk uh, an internal fixation when it is doomed to failure and then subject the patient to another surgery. So sometimes you may have to avoid fixing and uh, and then just go for the reconstruction straight away using the arthroplasty. This is a cup cage construct which we published in the hip and pelvis. The next is that the multidisciplinary and geriatric co-management is absolutely essential. This is a 72-year-old male with Parkinsonism and depression. He fell in the bathroom, could not be hospitalized at the time due to COVID, and the family was scared. He developed pneumonia, intubated for seven days. After that, he had a combination treatment from uh, um, geriatric medicine, pulmonology, and critical care who helped him recover from pneumonia. And I, I uh, operated on him with an uh, uncemented dual mobility, mobility shell and uh, un cemented uh, stems. So this was in 2001 Mayo Clinic proceedings where they've highlighted the issues uh, um, in the medical care of elderly patients with hip fractures. There are issues with preoperative clearance, deep vein thrombosis from uh, delirium, nutrition, uh, the um, uh, urinary tract uh, uh, infection management and all. So they recommended that you need a close partnership between the orthopedic surgeons and the clinician to avoid the optimum care. And the literature has been full of multiple reports. This is about 24,000 patients, again, saying that you have to work with geriatrician. As orthopedic surgeons, we may not like taking help from the others. But for these patients, not only geriatrician, but you need the whole lot of colleagues to help you uh, out of trouble uh, in order to give a multidisciplinary approach to improve the quality of the care. And that has been shown to reduce the morbidity and mortality. So that's a very key thing about uh, treating. This is the latest 2020 article, this is a key factor to decrease time to surgery, reduce length of stay, improve uh, clinical outcomes and reduce mortality and lower the cost. So very important message there. The next one is the fractures in elderly need very special approach to so think of stress riders. This is a 72 year old lady, mother of a doctor and a lawyer. She had a fracture neck of femur, which she didn't realize had been not been walking and she had a nail in situ and then took the x-ray distally. You see the nail is tending to come out and now, this is something where the nail had been in place for close to 20 years. So there were issues with removing the nail, then what kind of hip we are going to put and what to put the stress risers. So we were lucky that we were able to pull out the nail. 
Following that, in a minimally invasive manner, we put a bristle femur locking plate, which needed to be contoured, and then the top screws were uh, drilled but not put in, and then we did a cemented total hip, and she could stand and start walking. So we did not risk any fracture, which would have required something a similar construct without the patient being able to walk because of the fracture. So we actually preempted and avoided the fracture, and this is the follow-up, and we could publish this as one of the uh, tips to avoid uh, fractures. Another example, almost similar fixation done two years back in an 80 year old female, she hasn't walked since because everything started failing because of the osteoporosis. Then somebody removed the screws from the neck, she remains bad, again, tending to come out from the distal femur. And I'm sure you can now guess what I would have done. So this is what uh, I did, remove the nail, put in a plate and took care of all the stress risers and did, him, did a hip replacement on her. And she started walking and did quite the same. If we had a very osteoporotic bone, we would try to go right till the base of the greater trochanter. And we would also like to put in a screw in the neck to prevent a, uh, a fracture through the stress riser or at the end of the implant or to uh, avoid risking of femoral neck fracture. The same thing holds true now about periprosthetic fracture fixations in poor quality bone. They have to go all the way either to the dist uh, distally to the knee or proximally to the uh, base of the trochanter in order to not keep on operating these patients for repeated uh, stress fracture. Another one, this one had a very uh, deformed femur. So the distal femoral locking plate had to uh, be contoured manually using bending press, but you can see we would not like to risk a fracture occurring at the distal end of the implant. Another example here, and of course, all of you are aware about these mounts, which can help you uh, uh, put the uh, fixation uh, uh, in the periprosthetic fractures. And again, the principle is the same. Don't leave any stress risers in any condition. Make sure that the whole bone is protected. This was a lady with CA breast who came with a pathological fracture neck femur. We did a uh, uh, total uh, hip uh, cemented for fracture neck femur. She came three months later with uh, with multiple. Uh, uh, she actually didn't come to us. She went to another doctor with a fracture because her femur was now riddled with secondaries. Who did uh, nailing? And this is actually defies all principles. He left a stress riser which of of pathological bone between the two implants, and uh, it is no surprise that it fractured. And we had no option. She was too sick for a total femur replacement, so we put in a long cemented stem with the with the um, uh, cortical strut allografts all around and you can see we could uh, put her back on her feet uh, the rest of the days with, while she lasted. The next one is what I like to call an emergency arthroplasty or, uh, or the special implant requirement. 84 year old lady severely osteoporotic gets this fracture. I'm not in a position to advise her fixation and then avoid weight bearing just replace the distal femur and put a tumor process and then put her up and about uh, the very same day. And so arthroplasty as for, for challenging osteoporotic fractures is an accepted uh, principle in hip, shoulder, knee and elbow. Now you had a talk uh, about the fixation versus arthroplasty in the distal femur, uh, humeral fracture. Hemiarthroplasty and total uh, arthroplasty have both been accepted for fracture uh, neck of femur. Uh, we know that the ORIF has its own advantages, but then there is a higher reoperation rate for uh, internal fixation in patients who have osteoporotic hip fractures. And then because these patients are not previously arthritic and they are very, they have a petulous or, or uh, lack soft tissue, the risk of dislocation is very high. So we routinely do a dual mobility cup, like I showed you in a previous case in in, in patients who need total hip replacement due to a hip fracture. The uh, question is not so uh, comprehensively answered for intertrochantric unstable fractures and jury still out. If I'm not in a position to currently recommend a hip replacement for intertrochantric fractures because I do believe that we got very good implants and we should actually try to fix as far as possible. Knee has um, also been offered for the fractures around knee. The uh, arthroplasty can be technically demanding and you often need the revision components and the complications are common. This is an example. And uh, this needed plating along with the knee replacement, particularly when the patient had pre-existing arthritis. And uh, it has been reported for complex tibial plateau fractures, the total knee replacement does give you a viable surgical option because the most important uh, reason is right here that the patient is allowed early post-operative full weight bearing, which is an extremely important thing for an old patient. 
a fracture of the distal femur and you see that with the use of the rod we could put in the uh, this of course needed revision implants uh, on the femoral side and we could do the total hip and for uh, the same has been reported for uh, uh, distal femur fractures a total knee replacement has been shown and then like i said the modular constraint implants may be required um, in shoulder of course the it has been described uh, but then uh, although it gives uh, really pain relief unfortunately the arthroplasty has been shown to give poor movements and function and of course when you have a messed up situation then you possibly need a reverse shoulder arthroplasty and uh, that has been uh, uh, proven in the literature especially when there is a failed fixation the patient comes with the persisting symptoms you have heard about the arthroplasty as an alternative to fixation in elbow now the osteosynthesis for these porotic fractures in old patients has got a great role especially in the lower limb fractures and there are certain principle as uh, the diaphyseal fractures one must aim for osteosynthesis so you use the weight sh weight uh, sharing implant um, metaphyseal fractures you should try to use the internal fixation with locking plates and again try to use intramedullary implant and intraarticular fractures should as far as possible should give you uh, uh, the uh, uh, provision for putting uh, early weight bearing so there are surgical challenges there is impaired ability of the osteoporotic bone to hold screws and there is a crushing of the cancellous bone this is not at all uncommon situation all of us have seen that so possible surgical strategies are used intramedullary nail instead of all the devices as far as possible uh, we have improved implants now we can fill the voids with the cement so whenever possible use the nails and we know the we have devices which minimize the loss of uh, bone from the femoral neck and then of course the locking uh, the screws into the plate uh, is a routinely available strategy now for stability of the construct which turns it into a single mechanical unit and works for um, almost all locations in the body this is an example of the osteoporotic distal humerus fracture and they can be fixed very well and the patient can be mobilized early what you have to be uh, concerned about is not to turn into a very very stiff construct uh, and that can be your undoing for example the 72 year old lady with uh, rheumatoid arthritis on cytotoxic medication had the fall repaired with a very stiff construct and you can see the it is doomed to fail from day one and the varus collapse due to lack of medial but is another uh, uh, factor which we now know and uh, we uh, we understand these fracture anatomy better now and routinely it is said that you must actually put in a medial uh, buttress screw uh, when you are fixing these fractures with the locking plates and another example here so there are future developments in implants uh, the plates have been developed which permit screw placement in various angles uh, their materials with better strength and all that is particularly useful for the challenging situation of fractures in the elderly patients so this variable angle uh, technology allows you actually to fix these fractures better and uh, it's useful for the wrist as well so that's the other development which is actually uh, helping us far cortical locking can help the secure the purchase in the osteoporotic bone so can the hydroxyapatite coated screws which can augment the fixation and uh, they can actually lead to bone formation and this kind of complications are not at all um, uncommon all of us have seen it you could actually call it uh, deja vu if you like um, but then there the modern um, uh, devices which have got ch coated dynamic hip screws uh, can actually allow bone in growth and prevent these kind of complications so we have ch coated screws for external fixation for the uh, for the way uh, sort of a poor wrist patient we sometimes use external fixator i'll talk about it in a little while later then the bone augmentation is often needed remember that so there's a lot of literature available for that because of the crushing we have these modern implants which can allow you to inject cement uh, and this is when the bone is so bad that it can just cut out we have the features like uh, set screw or the ability to inject uh, cement through the implant which can uh, avoid failure so uh, void filling with bone substitute is one of the strategies for these patients you can use they come in different forms you have to weigh um, the uh, benefits of uh, you know these speed of absorption with the strength and the injectable cements are particularly useful the calcium phosphate cement augmentation is used in these situations and this is an example of the tibial plateau fracture where the injectable bone cement is being uh, eject injected to fill the voids 
Uh, another example, 62-year-old female with split de depression, they will play to all these strategies to help you uh, to augment the fracture site with calcium phosphate cement and uh, like it has been uh, shown in this paper. Another example, distal radius fracture and uh, you know you can use all these uh, um, bone graft substitutes. Uh, you can also use the bone cement to uh, to uh, expand the bone implant surface area, though this is not FDA approved, but uh, really if you don't have uh, or the patient cannot afford the calcium hydroxyapatite cement, you can use these uh, PMMA cement augmentation. The same has been used for uh, spine fixation and in, we know that we augment the vertebrae with the uh, vertebroplasty and the kyphoplasty also. The next principle is that the strut and the allografts can rescue when everything fails. So this is a lady who has had multiple attempts at uh, fixation of the uh, of the periprosthetic fracture. Eventually, he was operated with the distal femoral replacement processes, which uh, after six or seven years actually caused a failure here. And then finally, she was salvaged with the uh, with the um, strut allografts uh, put circumferentially uh, and lasted her another eight, eight years before she had to have a total femoral replacement. This 72-year-old lady had a non-union of the distal femur with osteoporosis and this actually uh, uh, was salvaged with intramedullary femoral strut graft and showed union at seven months. We have a bone bank at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. We use these uh, strut allografts and uh, I mean all kinds of structural allografts and uh, one of the big uses is uh, when you have very difficult situation like this lady had 17 surgeries uh, for a non-union and she had these plates both her fibulae were gone both her iliac crests were gone and uh, I put in removed the plates put in intramedullary steam mint pin and then put these strut allografts and uh, put some bone graft substitute uh, at the fracture site it went on to heal um, we know that the intramedullary fibula is uh, a very useful adjunct to the locking compression plates uh, for the proximal humerus fractures as well as in the humeral shaft fractures. Technology is indeed a great asset. And now we have uh, the computer assisted orthopedic surgery, which has got special place for elderly uh, to minimize the invasivity. And you can have the various forms in which it can be used. You can use it for pelvis, femur, shoulder, spine surgery, and proximal uh, humerus fractures. So I'll not go into the detail, but what is more important is that you can use the technology to our benefit. Uh, minimally invasive techniques are invaluable, like this uh, lady with an osteoporotic uh, fracture. And you can see that uh, through the uh, minimally invasive, uh, these stab incisions, uh, could put these screws into the uh, spine and then do it, uh, do this instrumentation without uh, really uh, being maximally invasive or opening a lot. The twelfth is that the austere environment and resource constraints dictate the customization and innovation. So, um, the uh, because uh, in Asia Pacific region there are several societies which cannot afford and can have uh, the best of everything. They can be limited diagnostic modalities available. So you have to innovate and improvise. And I still feel that for uh, uh, for the austere environment, Austin Moore is a quick and cheap uh, internet, uh, alternative. And we have place for all those things which are rather uh, now frowned upon by the developed world. Uh, uh, like I said, we have used uh, Ender's nails for external fixators, for intertrochantric fractures, or even these kinds of contraptions. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Ferris Haddad, doesn't believe in hemiarthroplasty because he thinks that the hemiarthroplasty results are inferior to total hip. But then uh, hemiarthroplasty can be done in a district hospital in a remote area by a surgeon who uh, 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 for a patient who cannot uh, afford very expensive implants. So um, a lot of literature has been published on external fixation of the intertrochantric fractures of the radius, the interlocking of the intermedial nail without fluoroscopy. And then the K wires remain a very cost effective and easy method uh, in the resource constraint environment. So remember that, you know, when you are treating people, you have to tailor it according to the resource and the affordability. And the same thing has been shown in the in the uh, proximal humerus fractures also uh, with the uh, with in treatment uh, with the K wires. The last feature is that when you are treating fractures in elderly, prevent future fractures because the onus is on us. There are millions of fractures in the old people, but if we just fix them, that's not enough. Our responsibility doesn't stop there. We have to identify the patients with fragility fracture, inform them about the need for osteoporotic evaluation, investigate them further, further intervene and educate the patient, the family and coordinate with the other physicians. So 
we have to stop these at one and in that respect the fracture license service is actually the emerging model which which actually achieves all these goals uh, to prevent subsequent fractures because if you don't intervene you have missed an opportunity the patient will keep coming back with the future fractures the most places the fracture license services in asia pacific region are not available and it if it is available it is actually known to improve outcomes significantly and it has to be a coordinator based approach fall prevention is another important thing we have started a few services in our center which is uh, uh, one of them is save the hip or the other one is uh, sahara which means support which means save the spine and hip and radius in the aged we have the balance master we have the uh, state of the art gait lab to improve patients in all these so we have to improve fragility fracture care because it's important it's not difficult it's rewarding it's becoming standard of care it's the orthopedic surgeons who have to do it so the take home message is that the elderly fracture management is evolving and challenging there is still no common consensus on mode of treatment to be adopted definitely no single shoe can fit all patients with for fracture management multidisciplinary approach with careful medical evaluation is a must time to uh, and the treatment needs to be personalized for the patient the uh, apart from the bone injury the medical care has to be taken and the decision must consider the associated comorbidities and patient related factors aim for survival early rehabilitation and try to preserve maximum function with the with minimizing morbidity and mortality so the best uh, option is still possibly still evading us but i still thank you all for your attention thank you very very much dr nagarta um we're going to move on to a talk by dr franky dian uh if he's available yes he looks available Regular shaft directors. Excellent. Frankie, you're muted. Okay, so uh, this, uh, uh, as Dr. Mahoutra said, this is uh, uh, a lot of these patients, they come in with uh, multiple fractures. And uh, this is an 85 year old lady with a, a known fracture in the right distal femur four years ago. And already we have a very difficult, uh, it's not a difficult surgery. I mean, we, we fix it with a, a locking plate, but uh, we have a little bit of fortunate uh, events. One year after the fixation, we, we follow up her. She was walking well, but we checked the x-ray. Uh, all the proximal screws are loosened already. So uh, it's uh, already this, this patient, we notice uh, there could be something wrong, but she's lucky in this one. She came back. And now uh, she has this uh, simple transverse fracture of the uh, humerus now. So how should we treat this one? I mean, huh? it's a very simple case, but it's, uh, there are, again, I, I don't think the verdict is out yet. So what, what is the best treatment for this? So should we uh, do a conservative? Should we do an intramedullary nail? Uh, should we do an uh, open reduction and compression plate? Or should we do a MIPO? Maybe we can ask uh, uh, some of the panel speakers who, wh wh what do they think? Hey, Professor Frankie, for this condition with the uh, lady 85 years old, I will choose uh, intramedullary nailing to uh, fix the bone. All right. Do you, uh, do you think that for this uh, very osteoporotic bone, the nail, I mean, the size of the nail, would it give enough stability? Um, it could be. Yeah, could be a problem, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, there is no uh, right answer. I mean, uh, we, we tried to put it in a uh, plaster slab, and uh, of course the, the alignment is not good, and she's complaining of a lot of pain, and she... Uh, uh, she wants us to fix it. So the surgeon decided to uh, do uh, 
uh, nipple because it's uh, like a simple transverse, uh, but the bone is not good for compression, and he decided to choose a plate. So uh, he, tr what they try to do is uh, open a proximal incision and then a distal incision uh, after a very good uh, fracture fixation. Uh, he was quite well. So the limitation improves the biology, but the stability may not be the best. So it's not the best for the simple, simple fracture like this. So that leads to my point about hemorrhoid sharp fractures in the elderly. I mean, uh, it's always a decision making whether we should first, uh, we, whether we should operate or not. I mean, there's always the biggest question. Some are just too old or frail to be operated. Some are really uh, uh, demanding and they, they have a painful arm and they want operation. And they will ask you, would uh, surgery help me or is it better? I mean, that's often a very difficult uh, question to answer them. Whether, uh, sometimes it becomes a little bit of uh, philosophical as well. Uh, I, I know my answer, to, but I know if I, uh, I know who is operating on me and what will be the best. <laughs> the best but uh, if uh, just a normal patient, then of course, I mean, uh, you have to trust them. So it's a matter of uh, non-operative versus operative, whether it's a nail or plate. Uh, and we will lastly talk about the periprosthetic. Uh, the MIPO, why, why do we use the MIPO a lot? I think in the past, we don't have the good nail. I think this, uh, again, we have a 78-year-old big, big guy, uh, ADL independent with a really uh, painful arm. As you can see, the bone spike is really piercing through all the uh, muscles and it's really painful. Every time he moves, it's really very painful. So uh, again, the same choice. What what do you think? I mean, what do the faculties uh, think? Yeah. Some you can tell us to put it in a cast. Cast? It's painful and uh, it's sticking in the muscles, and I think it's. <laughs> I, I, I would certainly not think. Uh, I would plan for surgical treatment here. Yeah. Right. I, I would nail it. Nail it, yeah, yeah. I think Mibo can work also here with this patient, but you have to be careful with the bone quality. Right. So we actually do a MIPO for yeah. him. Yeah. So at that time, we don't have the long filon, no. the metaphysial plate. And uh, we, we think that uh, this fragment, uh, we, are, we are still new to MIPO at that time. So uh, we a lot of the senior surgeons are asking me, uh, the professors, senior professor asking whether they will heal with MIPO and it shows that with the big fragments uh, here and there, it, it will deal with a very good uh, callus formation if you leave it. So we have a good stay um, period with MIPO. Uh, as far as the bone healing is concerned, we, uh, we use this technique. And then uh, uh, very, very similar with the previous case, we, we can operate. Uh, we, Later, we do have cases of uh, delayed healing because uh, if, if you do not reduce the fracture well, then you have a problem with healing. But uh, we do enjoy some uh, good success with MIPO. But uh, the degree of reduction, how much reduction is necessary is always a most difficult question. I think it's an art rather than uh, science. I mean, how much gap would you, would you accept? I mean, this by now, I think I wouldn't accept if I do it ne again now, I wouldn't accept probably such a big gap with a locking plate. Yeah. Little like okay. motion over there. But nevertheless, this one actually heals uh, very, very well. And uh, uh, even at uh, four weeks time, we, we do see a very good callus formation. So uh, if you're doing MIPO, of course, one has to uh, know the course of the radial nerve. This is not MIPO, this is uh, another traffic accident case, uh, but just to show the, <laughs> of the uh, radial nerve, which uh, we, everyone has to know. So if you're doing MIPO, just uh, uh, one slide on that, uh, identify the radial nerve if we are going anywhere, anywhere distal. I mean, the, the same applies if you are doing MIPO or, uh, or, or, a, or a nail, even a nail, I think. Uh, I've seen cases where we try to do a minimum, a limited incision, and uh, without seeing the bone, and you, you actually uh, drill on the radial nerve. I mean, it's, uh, so anywhere over the distal shaft region, anything um, uh, anterolateral from anterior to lateral, that ninety degrees uh, uh, quadrant. Be very careful. Try to identify the radial nerve. 
And then the, uh, uh, I think this was the technique uh, introduced from uh, Chiang Mai to Chai shows the uh, anterior plating, which works very well, I think. Uh, I'll show you another problem. This is another 75 uh, year old lady with a, a, a short oblique fracture. Again, uh, we did a plating. This was a compression plating, as you can see the uh, compression screws and the whole thing was stably fixed. The, the surgeon thought that the bone quality is not so bad. So compression plating was done and uh, the patient was uh, really very, very happy after the fixation because she can actually move without much problem. So it shows uh, all the fracture gap. Uh, you, you couldn't actually see the fracture gap. So it's very nice compression. Just one week, okay, she was uh, <laughs> doing it so well that she was trying to lift her up. She was trying to <laughs> lift her up and then... <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, what is the problem here? I think, uh, have we done anything wrong? Should we extend the plate all the way? I mean, it's an uh, anterior plate, so uh, there is a limit to how far, how, how low we can go. I think if you go any further, what you're trying to achieve is better uh, fixation in bone that clearly is not capable of it. Hmm. No, Has you're, anyone you're, seen I, this uh, peri implant fracture? Yeah. Yeah. So sure. I, I would. I would the Sorry, Munkun, what do you say? Yeah. I, I would put a put a second plate. So peri implant fractures. I, I we wrote that uh, classification. So you can't take out the old plate because it's a uh, brand new fracture. So yes. whatever you do, you have to span it. And as you said, you can't span it any further. You end up in the joint. So for this case, you would uh, extend uh, with a plate at the side. So you'd go posteriorly and do it. Uh, you could. You could. Uh, they end up with two wounds. You could also uh, plate right down to the uh, to the side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just extending the anterior approach. Yeah, but you could actually put in two plates from the back, medial and lateral, yeah, okay. which would okay. give much better stability in this. That's true. Or yeah. you can use the hybrid plate uh, yeah. just to overlap. You can also change it, yeah. But we adopt, uh, again, uh, use the posterior approach to, to yeah. try to uh, augment it, as you can see, uh, treat it like a distal... Uh, Radius uh, fracture. Uh, distal uh, humerus. Uh, humerus fracture, yeah. 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 Sure. And I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Munkun wrote up the paper on peri-implant fracture, and I think uh, it's... Uh, so they, they uh, agree, I think we, we cannot remove it because... Uh, it's just one week, yeah. So the traditional teaching, I mean, uh, we often teach our residents uh, in the past that uh, for the humerus, we can use a 4.5 plate. And in the past, when the locking plate is not there, we use a broad plate when we stack it, the holes, and then uh, eight cortices in each fragment. And we do not see this peri-implant fracture that much. But with the LCP, I think there are, uh, we, we do see a lot, lots and lots of these uh, peri-implant fractures. And uh, there are papers uh, publishing and then show, showing all these, uh, if you use a 4.55, because actually the is, is five millimeter uh, hole in some of these bones, which is really thin, okay? So it's a big, it's a big hole. And then a lot of... So uh, that, that's the only one. Uh, yeah. this, have I also brought it? That that's going to be bigger than seven. So Neil is a good choice. Yeah. So I think I think it should be able to get a seven Neil. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> How about uh, Leah? What What do you think? For this condition, I will choose um, plating. A locking plate, mipo. Yeah. yeah. I like to locking plate with mipo. Right. Right. How about the other Said? What do you think? Yes, I agree with Leah. I will go with the uh, bridging technique or bridging plating uh, where I have good fixation on the head. I know the head is osteoporotic, but uh, uh, that can be augmented if I'm worried about my screw fixation. But yes, I will go with the bridging plate. Right. How about this uh, big wedge? I mean, uh, uh, does yeah, it matter? I mean, uh, it doesn't matter if we do a meepo, but uh, how about nail? I mean, would it affect uh, the stability? Because this is a really big wedge. 
is about yeah so that's why so that's why i mentioned the newer generation nail which gives you multiple screw options proximally mm -hmm. would it fix uh <laughs> would, would, i think you have long 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 nails even in that yeah right 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 do we need to reduce it better or well we should get the alignment uh, for yeah, nails the alignment okay get, yeah I think once you get the the length right, it will fit in between. Yeah. Right. Like a segmental fracture on the femur. Right. So I think just a slide on the new new nails as we mentioned. I think why it seems to be working better. In the past, if we put a put a nail through the great GT, then there is not actually not much bone there, and you have a very poor purchase. But if you for the newer generation, the straight nail, it goes through the dense part of the uh, very dense bone quality over there. So it's uh, very, I would say it's not uh, super strong, but it holds the head pretty well. Holds the head pretty well. So it's very good for the uh, fractures that doesn't involve the greater tuberosity that much. Yeah. So this is what we, we did. Okay. Yeah. So for the fragments, I think we managed to compress that fragments, the proximal fragment, a little yeah. bit better. But for the distal fragment, is as you can see, there is a big uh, size nice. mismatch. I think it's a very wide canal, and this fragment is actually moving, moving, uh, and uh, we actually do a very uh, small incision over there and put in a couple of circlage here. Yeah. Okay. And the long long nail all the way down, uh, give the working length, everything seems to be uh, good, yeah. And we're actually pretty amazed that, uh, that I took yeah. this picture when I do the follow-up, it's just three weeks. I was so happy and this patient was actually moving so well with uh, just a few small step wound over there and then one limited for the circlage. Of course, uh, for this young, uh, old lady, I, was, I said young lady, I, yeah. <laughs> this old age, and, uh, uh, the uh, uh, we have to be very careful about the radial nerve and uh, not to surclutch the radial nerve. So yeah. uh, she's very thin. So uh, we actually get down to the bone pretty soon. But if the patient is really obese, you have to be very careful. But luckily, there are the newer gadgets for putting in the surclutch. Uh, but actually, we don't need it in this one because okay, yeah. uh, she's so thin. She's so thin. But Three weeks, I was so happy. I took the picture and write down on, on, on the picture is just three weeks. <laughs> yeah, because I haven't, I haven't seen a maple doing so great in three weeks' time. I, have, I haven't seen a plate because there could be some disturbance with the, uh, with the uh, uh, abductor mechanism. But with a nail, I think the, the whole uh, biomechanics and the, and the disturbance to the GT area is much less. So I think it, it helps the patient. And two months, we do see already callus formation. Yeah. So Can I ask? Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is an uh, old lady. What about the uh, cuff? Because when we insert the nail, there is one uh, to do the cuff. Yeah, rotate the cuff. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, in, in our center, we actually developed a, a percut just do a percutaneously because. Uh, I'm sure if we open up this 92-year-old um, ladies, uh, the, the cuff will be very thin. I mean, yeah. Yes. So, Frankie, one of the... Uh, you, sorry. You okay. didn't remember the cuff there? Sorry? Are you, are you repaired the cuff there? No, we didn't actually see anything. We just uh, percutaneously... Stab incision. Yeah. Very stab incisions over there. We already assume that the cuff are, is already is uh, very much worn out, and there is not much to repair. So, Frank, actually, if you look sorry. at the starting point of this nail, it is uh, it's medially, so usually Central. it's avoiding the tendinous part of the cuff, and it goes through the muscle. So yes, exactly. you just need to repair uh, the the tendon at that stage or at that yes. point. Yes, very good point. We actually look at the C arm. Actually, it's more or less uh, oh, uh, just beneath the AC joint, so it's very, very much medial. So uh, we've done some studies. We're trying to publish it, which shows that there is uh, not so much uh, uh, um, influence on the or damage to the radio, radio uh, on the rotator cuff 
That's uh, you're getting uh, anterior to the acromion and the AC joint. That no, you're getting in there. Frankie? Yes. So one of the technical problems is to get the very central entry point because of the acromion blocking your way. So what are your technical trips to avoid, tips to avoid that? Which one? Yeah. To get the entry so central in the head, superiorly, right. because yeah, I think, uh, we, gets we in the way. Uh, uh, we use uh, uh, K wires as joysticks yeah. to maneuver it so that uh, uh, the head is already embarrassed. So you have to tilt it up, and then again you have to make sure that you uh, have enough uh, room to to extend to extend the uh, yeah. arm so that you get a very good uh, entry point uh, over there. I think there's even a paper on taking off a bit of the chromium to be able to get the right entry. Uh, so far, we we don't need. I've to... avoided it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Last case. Yes. Hmm. So it's a rheumatoid yeah. arthritis uh, with a total elbow replacement. Yeah. Yeah. So with this, yes. So there is a problem. Yeah. So how to fix this? Uh, anyone have any experience? Okay, so this, this clearly needs a revision. You have to get uh, an extra long stem, but I think this is one of the longest already. I, I'm not sure. So uh, we had just did one. Take us three and a half hours, uh, allograph and a longer stem. I think you can probably fix the fracture and hope the prosthesis is still okay. It looks, I mean, it's only the very dis, uh, proximal part of the stem that is involved. So I try to get a couple of circlages and try to miss the implant with my screws on the distal fragment. So it's not going to be easy for sure, but uh, that's one option. I think a very extensive procedure in an elderly patient. Yeah, you're, you're quite right, John. Uh, actually, you can fix this fracture. If you look at the fracture line, it's, yeah. it looks very uh, oblique. But the thing is, uh, this is huge osteolysis along this uh, humeral stem. Shaft, yeah, that, I know that. Consequence of the, you know, uh, loosening. So uh, it's a temporary issue. You can fix the fracture, but at the end, this elbow will be painful and unstable. So uh, as uh, Meng said, uh, the only solution is APC, allograft prosthetic composite graft. Okay, yeah, that's Maybe an option. Yeah. It's uh, uh, allograft and host one together. <laughs> well, right. It depends so, on how unstable is that uh, uh, fixation and the distal fragment. Uh, sometimes we look at the x-ray, we think there's an osteolysis, but when we yeah. go to the operating room, we look at exactly. it, it's still solid. If it's still solid, then we just uh, let the patient uh, treat the fracture and keep her in peace instead of going with a major revision. Uh, it might require even a uh, tumor prosthesis to accommodate for that bone loss. Yeah, it's going to need a huge surgery to replace it again. Yeah, I think we uh, agree. I think we opt for the short term. I think we, we're not thinking about uh, this already. <laughs> uh, 74 year old lady, rheumatoid arthritis, very soft bone, yeah. uh, already have multiple uh, joint replacement already. So uh, she is probably not looking for uh, like a lifelong uh, safeguard. So. Is That's conservative treatment an option? Yeah, I think that's uh, possible, but uh, how to make yeah, sure? That, uh, because a lot of moment I'm going to uh, go yeah, into it's very it, it, it rotates. So the, the flexion is not a problem. It's, it just rotates. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I just threw it up. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, what we did. We span it with an extra long uh, proximal humeral locking plate all the way. Uh, of That's course, uh, we reduce it. We reduce it and do in multiple circlages. Circlages, yeah. Yeah, 
And then, of course, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the, the lucency around that uh, Inho has pointed out, the lucency around is a little bit worrying. So uh, we have actually uh, tried to look up the literature and actually publish our own uh, uh, two cases that we, after fixation, the bone quality seems to improve. So what is the yeah. trick to improve the uh, stability of the stamp? So as you can see, this is post up one year. Actually, the lucency seemed to be improving, which is to our surprise. I mean, uh, or actually, uh, we, we didn't thought about that. So this is our first case. We have a similar case that we actually uh, uh, use the same technique. So how yes. to improve the stability of the stem, actually, and, and also the... Uh, uh, so this one actually uh, two years now, we almost see the reestablishment of the implant bone interface. And the previous lucency line, and now it seems to be uh, better and the patient is uh, doing quite well. So this was the clinical follow-up. So actually, uh, as you can see, she is almost like chair bound all the time. Yeah, she's okay. a, a household walker only, yeah. That she's quite happy. So first of all, proximally, there are the, what we call the use of the sky screws in the proximal part. That is to avoid the stem, avoid the stems in all these, but yeah. to pass the screws very close or just uh, like um, like a polar screw, uh, which is actually uh, uh, just passing through the uh, prosthesis. Just yeah. insert the screws. And actually, if you can see, if you use a staggered hose, a uh, uh, broad uh, uh, LCP, you can actually uh, put one screw put on this screws. side and the other one on the other side, I think. Uh, with some luck, of course. I mean, it's not that <laughs> easy no, said and done. I'm, I'm just I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. But what about distally? Actually, we, we thought about the distally. We use off to improve the stability. This yeah. is where you can put in a screw. And uh, very, again, passing through here adds the anti-rotational stability of the whole construct. So that uh, is a little trick that we have done. And... Uh, so, so the conclusion is, uh, I think we have to avoid the plating, uh, avoid uh, for the plating of the osteoporotic humeral fractures, we have to avoid using the large 5 mm locking screws in the osteoporotic bone. And uh, for the nail, I think we use the straight nail. And in cases where there are large fragments, we can add in cerclage. And for, uh, for the periprosthetic fractures, we can use the uh, locking plate with the cerclage or the so-called sky screws. And then the, between the flange and the stem, we can add in the anti-rotation screws. So I would say that and my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lin. That was a very inspirational, very challenging cases. And it's great to see um, those sort of examples um, to help us when, we're, when we find ourselves stuck. Our next... Um, speaker is Dr. Inho Chan, and he's talking about transalacranon fractures and elbow dislocations. Have you got some cases for us? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, now, can you see me? Uh, yes, is that okay? Can, can you? Me. Right. Okay. Um, I'm Ain Ho John, and I'm going to talk about transalacron fracture dislocation and elbow dislocation. Um, just for uh, our member of APOA, I would like to introduce we just built up our hand and upper limb society within APOA. And any of your audience here, you are more than welcome to join. So, when I was a registrar, I read a book about David Ring. And in his book, he said, pity the young surgeon whose first case is a fracture around the elbow. But if you operate this fracture by using this, yes, you are a pity. However, in his second book, he rephrased the word, it is no longer necessarily to pity the young surgeon, as long as you catch up the uh, advances of the fracture fixation. Yes, that is true. No more a pity if you operate properly. So the problem of this transolacron fracture dislocation, your diagnosis is difficult. How you describe this fracture? 
And as you always say, the elbow is a subcutaneous joint. And just under the skin, there's a bone and joint. And you always need to consider what the condition of soft tissue is. And how to approach and how to reduce the fracture and how to fix it is all complicated issues to answer before the surgery. And let's say that this is a very communicated fracture involving olecranon, and you may fix it with the multiple K-wires, but the problem is you encounter huge heterotopic ossification around, and the clinical result is very stable elbow, stiff elbow. Yes, this is another case, the fracture dislocation, you can fix with the fancy plate, the problem is, unless you really appreciate this uh, soft tissue envelope of the elbow, you land it up with the complications. So how to avoid this complication and how to deal with complication after surgery is the main issue. 32-year-old male snowboard injury. So uh, Frankie, any suggestion for this case? Yeah, I think it uh, looks like a very bad transolecranon uh, huh? fracture. Uh, elbow is really unstable, so it's not dislocated now, but it's very. I think it's. I think it's dislocatable very easily. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So uh, you would prefer plate? Yes. Those are plate. Uh, I would prepare, of course, for this kind of very comminuted fracture, I prepare the uh, olecranon locking plate and also uh -huh. uh, I always in hand the uh, mini mini plates, which I yeah. add in and uh, will use the, I can use the finger plates, uh, the two, two millimeter screws and all these to fix the small fragments and the small fracture. Try to convert it into a uh, two piece rather than like a five piece, five, five piece fracture. Try to convert it, build it up into a two-piece fracture. Yeah, excellent, excellent. What I did was a lateral position, and I did a closing reduction under a general anesthesia and temporarily fixation with the K wires through the plate, and I uh, put past this plate and fixed it with the screw under image intensifier. So you can call it a percutaneous plate fixation again. Hello. Uh, how do I how about this uh, 51 year old male after road traffic accident? He's got an open wound in a fracture site. And Sarah, you have any suggestion for this case? It looks like he's been picked up off the side of the road. There's some soft tissue yeah. swelling and, and uh, it, uh, I'm not even sure if that's open. I think yeah. um, probably my one of my biggest concerns is how necrotic any of those fragments might end up being. Uh -huh. um, I think anything you do that makes it more ischemic is going to give you a problem, but um, I generally, I like a plate fixation, but yeah. I can see the issues. So can you call uh, this, uh, how, how can you diagnose this fracture, by the way? You mean what, what type of fracture yeah. is it? Uh -huh. well, no, I couldn't answer that question for you. Okay. <laughs> no, Sarah, I'm just yeah. kidding. So here, yeah. so here, what I would like to say to you, share with you is uh, when you see a, a fracture dislocation involving olecranon, you actually have to differentiate it. These two uh, type of fracture. One is the anterior olecranon fracture dislocation. This we can call a transolecranon fracture dislocation. But this one is a little different from the posterior olecranon fracture dislocation, which is a, a type two a montagia fracture dislocation variation. So here, transolecranon fracture dislocation, I mean, the proximal fracture, uh, ulna fracture is very communicated, but mostly the proximal radial ulna, radial head, collateral ligament is reasonably good. However, in the Montagia fracture dislocation, always have associated injuries like radial head and lateral collateral ligament complex. So again, if you go back to this case, this you can call it how to restore ulnar humeral articulation. 
you know, a distal humerus, you have a trochlea, and a proximal ulna, you have an electron in the back and coronoid in the front. So whenever you take the x-rays after reduction, keep in mind this is a dorsal cortex. And if you uh, line up this uh, tip of coronoid and tip of electron, this retroversion, you always have to keep in mind. Coronoid tip is a way higher than this electron tip, and this line should be always retro-tilted like this. So any electron fracture you can fix with the tension band wire, but oftentimes you see the K-wire migration and irritating skin, sometimes a skin defect. So whenever you see this community fracture, tension band, once a tub tubular plate is not good enough to hold this fracture. So always you use an electron on plate. And this is a 27 year old male road traffic accident. As you can see, this is a typical anterior transolecron fracture dislocation. Always there's a skin abrasion and soft tissue injuries here. And this is right behind this olecranon and difficult to uh, make a skin incision. So uh, as uh, 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 Frankie said, you can use a, a dorsal plating or medial or lateral small hand T plate at the same time. But dorsal plate biomechanically is a better, but you have to keep in mind this is a thick plate. Sometimes it's a difficult to apply when the soft tissue envelope is not good enough. So maybe this is a small hand T plate on the medial cortex or lateral cortex can be helpful because it doesn't really interfere this soft tissue uh, uh, coverage in the back. So in this case, we fixed the retention band augmented with the T plate. So this is uh, after surgery and we uh, fixed. The patient had a reasonably good range of motion, had a nice sound, good union without any uh, uh, osteosis. So again, this 22 year old girl fell from a height. She said it's about six meters. And this is a more or less a bottle type posterior montage fracture dislocation. Uh, fixed with the plate, as you can see here, this is a bit of a uh, risky. In three weeks time, we took the x-ray again, and then like this. So the patient referred to us what we should do. Three weeks post-op, um, uh, Dr. Sahid, you have any experience with uh, this uh, chronic subluxation? Well, if you look at this, I think the issue with the coronoid, uh, it wasn't reduced properly. Once yeah. uh, you need to uh, go back and reconstruct the coronoid and the anterior capsule uh, to avoid uh, having uh, such uh, subluxation. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. So when we took the CT scan, here you can see the coronoid was not fixed properly. And we did the medial approach and fixed this coronoid again with the plate and screws. So this is after surgery. And as you can see, now the only humeral articulation is better in eight months. Not much osteosis, fortunately. And then one and a half years post good range of motion. And here. So here, what I would like to say is uh, delta river sign. This is a delta river, okay? So if, if you do not have a proper delta river here, this means your coronoid has been gone. You have a deficient coronoid. So look at this x-rays. Any persistent subluxation of on the humeral at 90 degree flexion, you should expect this delta river sign has been disrupted. That means your coronoid has been gone. So is this because of ligament failure or is this because of coronoid failure? You don't need to worry about it because the first thing is how to restore proper olohumeral stability. That is the first structure we should restore. So for failed stabilization, you need to think about collateral ligament and articular component 
coronoid capitellum, but always a bony constraint ahead of soft tissue. So whenever you see uh, this uh, uh, coronoid deficiency, last time what we did was we did the bone graft on the coronoid side and fixed with the screws. Now elbow is stable after all the humeral articulation congruency with the collateral ligament reconstruction. So try to restore all the humeral stability because radio capitella stability is a secondary we can uh, stabilize later on any time. So here I would like to share one interesting case, a 20 year old medical officer. He had a ski injury and had a posterior interosseous nerve and ulnar nerve palsy. It was not completely gone, but he uh, had a definitely motor function. I mean, this is a rather straightforward case and uh, it's a kind of a uh, Montezia fracture dislocation. Dr. John, you have any suggestion to treat this fracture dislocation? Um, you are muted. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think uh, the idea would be to make sure you get a good reduction of the ulna. Uh -huh. It has to be anatomical. That means you have to restore length and usually the radial head would fall back in place. Uh, now, I know there's been some literature about posterior interosseous nerve palsy in the so-called type 3 Montagia variants where you may have to explore the posterior interosseous nerve. But in something like this where you don't have a frank nerve lesion, I would re get it reduced adequately and then hope it recovers over a period of time. So, uh, yes, uh, that's, that's exactly uh, what I did. And I didn't really concern too much about PIN and all the nerve. Mm -hmm. So what I did was uh, uh, anatomic reduction with the plate. And this is an intra-op CT image. And I checked this radio capital. Uh, yes, articulation was correct. And we sent to the patient to the recovery room. And then my resident phoned me, uh, Professor, you have a problem now because the radial head has been dislocated again. So my question at that time was, what did I do wrong? And I checked the annular ligament in Tremont. You see the, my skin incision here, and I made a, a vertical skin incision to, uh, to uh, remove any chance of uh, uh, entrapment. And fracture reduction is not 100% perfect, but it's reasonably good. So what did I do something wrong? So I had a lot of thought and eventually this gave me a lot of inspiration of what this trig function. Yeah, it's trig. Yes. Uh, let's get back to our uh, mathematical class in high school. Okay. Straight. Any, any <laughs> small amount of angulation here and has a huge translation, it can be here. So any small minor angulation here, you have a huge translation here, like a tangent, okay? So if you look at the proximal ulna anatomy, like there's both. always dorsal apex angulation, which we have studied in a CT scan. And the problem and the clinical implication is dorsal apex curve is the conventional plate in a market is a straightforward, but if you look at this uh, bone, bone is dorsally angulated with the varus. So if you tighten up the screw, I mean, there's always a chance that your fracture can be angulated. So proximal ulna has a dorsal varus angulation, as you can see here in this uh, slice. So you always need to appreciate it. In a simple fracture, it's okay. When you see any community proximal on that fracture, you better to make uh, angulation to avoid any unnecessary complication. And this is my uh, last case I would like to share with you. 17 year old girl, she had a very trivial fall and had a sudden pain and went to the, uh, uh, went to the uh, orthopedic clinic. So, uh, uh, Dr. Leah, you have any comment, any experience with that? 17-year-old girl, very trivial fall. Yes, I have the same uh, cases like this. Uh -huh. uh, 
look like in my early years it look like a simple case but actually it's uh, the big case so the patient will be uh, stuck on the radial head side and it could be a ligament problem to this side okay uh, the first surgeon who saw this patient and that this is a simple case, radial head dislocation. Yep. But actually not very common. Can you see any radial head isolated dislocation? This is very uh, weird sure case. Yeah. And then he examined the elbow again after several uh, trial of reduction, but he could not reduce it. And he found opening up in the medial side but he took the MRI, I don't know why, but took the MRI, but at least I can see this is a fairly a traumatic dislocation. It's, it is not a, like a congenital radial head dislocation, it's a fairly a traumatic, as you can see here, you know, high signal changes. So, Dr. Leah, what is your suggestion? You would like to do open reduction? Uh, I like to do the open reduction and fix with the wire in both yeah. sides. All right. mm -hmm. So the first the surgeon, what he did was he attempted several closing reduction on the GA because a 17 year old girl, very scared, you know, concern on the scar. Yeah. But the problem was he could not reduce this radial head. So eventually he forced the radial head back and then put the K wire. It's very thankful that she didn't have any radial nerve palsy. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah. fixed it. Yeah. Three weeks later, took out yeah. the K-wire and popped up again. So now she came to me. Any suggestion, Dr. Lee? And you would like to do open reduction? <laughs> yeah? I still, I still do the open reduction. <laughs> okay. Her and elbow was uh, rather stiff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Rather stiff. And... Uh, and what I found was a little different from what you thought. So this is the CT scan. You see the radial head anteriorly, yeah. immediately displaced. Yeah. Hope you can read my, uh, can you watch what has been done? We radial can see head that. Radial looks. Can you, this, can you see this is a button hold? Button hold to the brachialis. Oh, I so see. Yeah. this radial head has been dislocated oh. and buttonholed. So what I did was releasing the capsule because it's already uh, six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I did uh, uh, annular ligament reconstruction using triceps. So I did the annular ligament reconstruction. And after that, radial head was uh, stable there. So here, what I would like to say is that this is a transbrachialis buttonhole of radial head. So if you see any kind of irreducible radial head dislocation, maybe you need to think about this case. This is a case which I got from uh, Sean Ogerisko because he had this one case, gymnastic uh, girl, and he presented like this. Okay, you can have a dislocation of radial head, but when it is going out, through this uh, brachialis, it is entrapped, and unless you release that buttonhole, you cannot reduce it. So uh, now if I summarize, any chance of elbow fracture dislocation diagnosis is difficult. You always think about the associated injuries. Soft tissue is always concern and how to approach and how to avoid complication. Radial head, olecranon, elbow dislocation is all different, but when you like to treat, treat separate. Okay, so olecranon involving fracture is good, but it is wide spectrum with diverse injury type. Thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Chan. Um, I just had a question. Um, there was a, a few slides there where I think I probably would have done a radial head replacement. Is there a disincentive to doing that or am I being a bit aggressive? With 
Oh, uh, sorry. Say it again. Uh, I, I was controlling my slides and I missed what you said. Say it again. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, I will just also take this opportunity to encourage our attendees to ask some questions. We haven't um, had many questions through um, and we do have a little bit of time. Um, my question for you was there was a few cases there where I would have thought about doing a radial head replacement, but I can't remember if there was any contraindications to that or are there any disincentives to that? Well... Uh, I mean, that was the question we have to ask ourselves, trauma surgeons dealing with the elbows. Would it be better to replace early or would be better to preserve replacement uh, for failed uh, uh, ORIF? I mean, is it the same as the question to the Dr. Meng about the total elbow replacement for distal humerus and the radial head is the same. So in my mind, I was very conservative. I always would like to uh, fix this uh, radial head first. When it fails, we can preserve the radial head as a second option. But honestly, for mm. distal humerus, I have a somewhat different idea. Distal humerus, if you are thinking about total elbow, you better to replace it early as a primary rather than failed, T, yes. uh, failed stability surgery, okay? Radial head is a very, very conforming joint. Even though you have a non-union, usually patients can cope very, very well. Also, many of my patients, they can cope very well with the resection of radial head. Unless you are very uh, demanding manual workers, they can cope well. But the distal humerus is a bit different. So yes, of course, in a community, more than three fragments, yes, always there are indications for radial head replacement. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I was also surprised about the range of motion on that young girl with the radial head dislocation. Is that typical, that range of motion, or, is, or would I be expecting less? Well, uh, I mean, that was very a great case because uh, she's uh, young and very uh, much, uh, uh, you know, uh, active in uh, rehabilitation. But I always try to fix and get a solid union first. But the stiff elbow surgery is much easier now with the arthroscope. So I would like to do a, a stability first. So when you have a stiffness, we can always deal with the arthroscopic uh, uh, stiff elbow release later on. Or even open. Yeah, even though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do a lot of... Apologies uh, to our other panelists. Have you got any questions on dominating Dr. Chan's time? So no, no, no. <laughs> no, that no? Was, those were great cases out there. Enjoyed that. Cases, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, therefore, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our final speaker for this session, oh. who has who has the unfortunate job of talking about the terrible <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John Muko Um okay. I hope I said that well enough. Um, <laughs> very kind, very tolerant, um, uh, and he will uh, take us through to the finish. Um, and once again, can I encourage attendees to give us some questions um, and I will um, try and uh, submit them to our speakers. Okay. And so, I can see and hear you, Doctor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that uh, visible now to everybody? Yes. Okay, so we go on to the terrible triad and we'll go through some cases, some relatively simple, and then maybe if there's some such thing as a simple terrible triad. Uh, so here's the first case. This is a 38-year-old man who had a fall three days ago. He lived in, uh, he was working in another city, but he's originally from our hometown. So he got this reduced in the emergency department and uh, came to us on day three. And those were his x-rays when he came to us. So any comments from any of the panelists on that? Would you do some? Uh, also, he had no neurovascular deficits, no com comorbidities. And uh, let's go back to the x-ray. Uh, the radio head is irreconstructible. <laughs> OK. Anybody? Uh, Frankie? 
You're the expert on the uh, coronoid. Is, uh, <laughs> I don't see any coronoid fracture, but yeah, uh, not obvious on this. Yeah, extremely unstable. So uh, yeah. we'll need a uh, ligaments uh, reconstructions as well. So a standard uh, radial head with a radial head replacement and uh, 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 lateral collateral repair to say the least, and maybe medial, but uh, we will just have to test the stability afterwards. Yeah. So would you do a CT first? Um, I don't think it's necessary though, yeah. I, I see the coronal pretty well. I don't, uh, even if it's uh, could be fractured, yeah. it's just a small tip. So I don't think the, um, and the CT won't have the radio head uh, as uh, Munkun said, it's really shattered already. Okay, so well, he did have a CT. Uh, I'll just run through them because, as you said, that it didn't tell us much except that probably there was a very small tip evolution of the uh, coronoid in one of the views. Okay, so not a major coronoid fracture. Uh, so the question was how we would deal with it. So we went in the supine position, lateral approach. Uh, obviously, uh, there was a evolved lateral collateral ligament, uh, the LUCL. And of course, the radial head was uh, fractured and uh, there was a very small coronoid fragment which we felt did not need anything doing. But we decided on doing an open reduction and internal fixation of the radial head. And this is the immediate post-op x-ray. Uh, any comments on that? I don't have, a, I have an AP and a lateral just 10 days down the line, but this was the immediate in the slab. And uh, this is at uh, two weeks post-op, the x-rays. What about the range of motion, Dr. John? This is just, well, we'll come to that. This is just two weeks post-op. Okay. Okay. So uh, would anyone else have tried to fix it or everyone else would replace it? Seems like the plate is a little bit bulky to me. I think it causes a lot yeah. of irritation on the annular ligaments. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I try to avoid the plates nowadays and try to just use screws, but uh, this one I just felt I could not stabilize with just screws. So we did use the plate and that's the radial head LCP that is available to us. Uh, it's interesting because he actually went back to his uh, to Bombay and I asked a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Agashe to follow it up. And this was him at eight weeks post-op. And these are the photographs he sent to me. So this is what it looked like at eight weeks. And uh, I was lucky that he came back to Patna just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is 10 months post-op. Yeah. Uh, that's the x-ray. There's some doubt about whether that particular fragment of the radial head has healed, but clinically he's doing really well. Okay, so... Is that's his range of motion, that's his pronation, supination. So uh, he's done quite well there, okay? So what do we mean by the terrible triad? I think it was first described by Hotchkiss in 1996. And basically it means a, a posterior dislocation of the elbow with a fracture of the coronoid and a radial head fracture, okay? Now, these fractures can vary in their severity but it's this combination of injuries which usually leads to a very unstable elbow. Uh, and uh, the mechanism of injury is usually a fall on an outstretched hand. The ulna is levered out of the trochlea. The first thing that goes is the anterior capsule and the lateral collateral ligament with additional valgus stress and posterolateral rollout uh, as the elbow slides out of the joint, the radial head and coronoid process fracture, and eventually uh, the last stage, the medial collateral ligament uh, rupture. So it's kind of a spectrum of injuries again, just like was mentioned in the earlier talk about the trans polychronon fracture dislocations. And you need to try and get back both uh, the stability and the range of motion. And just to revise on the stabilizers of the elbow, you have the primary stabilizers, which are the ulnohumeral articulation, the medial collateral ligament, and the lateral collateral ligament. And you have the secondary stabilizers, which is the radial head, the joint capsule, and the common flexor and extensor origin, so the muscle attachments. Okay, so I think um, the treatment algorithm, which uh, is now 
uh, fairly well accepted, although there are some people who would look at it slightly differently, is to first restore the coronoid if it needs to be restored, then restore the radial head, which means either fixation or replacement. I think it's this is the important part is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. I think this is increasingly now recognized. You need to try and get to restore this. Usually in a fresh fracture, especially in the young patient, we can do a repair of it. Usually it comes off from the lateral epicondyle and you can do transosseous sutures or a, a, a suture anchor and uh, repair this. But sometimes you very rarely, as we were discussing earlier, you may have to do a reconstruction. Uh, and then you check the stability. And if it's still unstable, you would go to the medial side. And then uh, if you restore the medial collateral ligament and still it's unstable, think of a external fixator to span the joint, uh, which you can also mobilize them in. So the approach used, again, varies. There are some people who you use the lateral approach followed by a medial one if necessary, which is what we tend to do. But the others who prefer to use a posterior approach so they can approach both sides through one incision. So uh, just a question to the panel, what would they use? Yeah, I, I prefer the two separate incisions if necessary. Okay. Like, Anybody like else? One long, I think there's a lot of dissection and then uh, yeah. uh, yeah, patient always complain there is very tight uh, and then cannot really flex the elbow afterwards. And also, also the work you have to do is mostly anterior on the lateral side and also on the coronoid. So it becomes quite difficult to True. Sort of stretch everything out from the back to do it. But there's some people who still seem to prefer it and say that's a better approach, but... John, can yeah. I comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it all depends on the what kind of a uh, structure you need to fix. Laterally okay. preferred when you have a radial head fracture. For yeah. example, if you if you like to replace radial head, actually terrible triad can be best approach to the lateral because you can see the whole coronoid very nicely through lateral. The problem is if you like to plate on the lateral side radial head, coronoid yeah. is a bit difficult to uh, expose from lateral side unless you have a really big uh, exposure. Yeah. So uh, if you need to uh, tackle this anterior medial sublime tubercle or medial facet, maybe as Frankie said, you need a second uh, two uh, separate incision or posterior approach, medial side and the lateral side uh, separate. Absolutely. So I think that's important. So you need to look at the CT to look at your coronoid fragment as well. Okay. But so especially if you're planning to fix the radial head, sometimes getting to the coronoid from the lateral side may be difficult. So you may have to go medially. And sometimes uh, we've even gone anteriorly. For example, this patient, uh, if you look at, there's a very minor radial head fracture, but this is a fragment lying there. And uh, if you look at the CT, that's a large fragment from the coronoid, which has kind of gone up there. And uh, we sort of studied this CT carefully, and this was kind of a little more medial. And we felt that trying to do this from the lateral side is going to be impossible. We didn't think the medial side was the best for it. So we decided to do the lateral side. The lateral collateral ligament was gone. So we did a repair of that using a suture anchor, and then we went anteriorly. Okay, so we went anteriorly. There you can see the median nerve, the, you, you need to isolate the vessels, and then you can, you are directly on this fragment here. So now you can see the fragment right in front of you, and you can shoot your screws from anterior to posterior. And this is a big enough fragment. We actually put in two screws in it. Uh, that says uh, post-op x-rays showing a good reconstruction. And uh, he came back once at three months, uh, we've been able to talk to him on the phone, but obviously with this lockdown, he hasn't been able to come back recently, but he says he's got a full range of motion, but I don't have the pictures to prove that. So uh, that is what um, you need to, so for the fresh fractures, you need to decide on your treatment algorithm. Uh, so the radial head, you either fix or replace. We try to fix them, especially in the younger patients, wherever possible. 
the lateral ligament needs to be repaired or reconstructed. And then the coronoid, there's some still some controversy. Of course, if it's a large fragment, there's no doubt. But for the smaller fragments, you probably don't need to uh, fix all of them, but you need to look at the stability of the elbow. And if it's a grossly unstable elbow, even just repairing a very small fragment using a suture anchor probably helps. And then you go on to deciding whether you need to do the medial collateral ligament. But the important thing is you need to restore the elbow stability so that you can mobilize them early. Okay, so, uh, sorry. That's, okay, so uh, any uh, comments on that so far? Sarah? Um, can I? Yeah, sure. Please. On your case, uh, the, the case you just mentioned, the isolated coronoid fracture, yeah. that is a little different from the terrible triad cases. Because yeah, I, agree, I agree. It, I, yeah. No, I, but this was not an isolated coronoid fracture because the lateral side, there was a ligamentous uh, injury. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, when you have an intact radial head, and coronoid fractured, this is a virus postural medial uh, injury. Yeah, yeah. And 100% yeah, yeah. you have a lateral collateral ligament injury torn. Sure. So yeah. uh, that, that's uh, for our audience, yes. Yeah, absolutely, Good. I agree. But what I was trying to get at was that you need to look at your coronoid fracture very carefully at the CT to decide which way would be better to fix it. Because it's not always very easy to do it from the lateral side, which, which is what I found. Anyone else has some comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, in the past we've tried the anterior approach. The only comment is uh, some patients uh, have uh, rather stiffness. I mean, because of the anterior approach, uh, okay. they tend don't want to really extend in it, and they have. Uh, rather slightly longer rehab than the, than, than the lateral and the medial approaches. Then. Sure. So, so that would be normally my standard approach is lateral and medial. I agree with that. But this was a different sort of case where we felt that approaching the coronoid anteriorly would be the best way to try and fix it. Yeah. Uh, John. Yeah. Uh, just, just, uh, just a bit of philosophy on my side, I guess. Um, sure, sure. Um, if, if you're faced with a terrible triad and a terrible radio head, uh, I, uh, okay, so the very first case you showed is very well done by a master surgeon. That's so why I think he got away with it. Uh, but if you really look closely, there is a loss of bone support uh, just below the neck of the radio head. That's why on the okay. AP view, the delta river is a bit wider on the lateral side. Sure. And uh, some of my cases that has that ends up uh, needing a lot of casting because then it starts to sublux uh, despite a radial reconstruction. And I can see uh, uh, Dr. Jong is uh, nodding. So uh, if I have to reconstruct the uh, uh, radial head plus the neck, I rapidly give up the idea. Uh, on its own, it takes me another hour and a half to do that. And then, yeah. then I've got to contend with a coronoid. So um, yes. I, I prefer to throw that away and immediately <laughs> I the whole coronoid on the lateral side. And I think this is where I love the idea of the sports repair where I can whip stitch up uh, the tenderness insertion and put a, a dog bone or uh, one of those uh, fabrical fixation stuff through the uh, volar surface of the uh, yes. uh, olecranon and tie it down. So for me, that sometimes is the tiny uh, coronoid avulsion that gives me the biggest grief because yes. you thought you got it fixed. Then you put a radio head in. And lo and behold, uh, in the reduction room, the resident call you and say you have a problem. Okay, so I agree. Uh, uh, fixing the radial head is not always easy, but similarly, the radial head replacement has to be done well as well. 
If you don't get the length right, you overstuff it, you have even more problems, okay? So I think it's both ways. You have to do it properly, whichever you do. Okay, okay so we'll get on with this next case. This is a relatively simple case. Sorry, you saw the x-rays. Uh, he came to us five days after the injury. Uh, this is a, a, he was actually dislocated and reduced elsewhere. We got an x-ray out of the past and then... Uh, so, would anyone want to treat this conservatively? Yeah? We have. So, month. Why not? I mean, uh, looking at it, I mean, uh, the x ray, the, the elbow joint is completely reduced, even without yeah. uh, much protection. And I think that to me, I mean, uh, 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 with this degree of uh, flexion, the joint seems to be located, and uh, uh, I, I would, I would think uh, I would test it and then see if it's really yeah. need the surgery. So you would assess it clinically and base your decision on that. Yeah, yes, okay. I agree. So that's so it was a little unstable when you tried to try to extend the elbow, but in ninety degrees flexion, he was okay. So uh, we uh, went ahead and did the CT. Uh, so you can see the coronoid and radial head fracture. The radial head fragment is really a small fragment. So would you want to fix this or would you just remove it or would you try to, you wouldn't replace this one, would you? Mark? Mm. MK, you wouldn't want to re replace this one, would you? I totally agree. This, this would, uh, would not require a reduction, uh, a replacement for sure. Okay. So again, so you need to be careful of these because the lateral or uh, collateral ligament very often is gone, even in what looks like uh, not so bad an injury. And uh, that's what we found here. Again, we fixed the coronoid here. We could get these two screws again because it was a reasonably nice chunk. But you have to be, uh, sometimes what looks easily fixable can turn out to be comminuted and so very often we go to the suture anchor nowadays. That's the most convenient. You can put these whip through sutures, as MK mentioned. You can aim your screw from the uh, sort of posterior side using one of these arthroscopic jigs and try to fix the fragment. Uh, but I seem to prefer doing this from the bowler side where possible. Okay. And uh, this is him at four weeks post op. Okay, so elbow stable, not got a huge range of motion at this stage. Uh, anyone would worry about this at this time. So everyone would worry about it, but would you do anything differently at this stage? Frankie? No, no, not much. I think uh, apart from uh, now it's four weeks and uh, this patient will need to uh, undergo vigorous uh, physiotherapy. Yeah, but yeah. I think this physios, I agree you need good physiotherapy, but I think uh, one of the problems we find in India is uh, uh, people trying to really passively mobilize the joint and they end up with all sorts of problems. So I think one has to be careful when you say vigorous physiotherapy that your physiotherapist is uh, not too aggressive in the physiotherapy, okay? So I think this is important. I'm sure in your centers, you've got excellent physiotherapists who uh, uh, follow your instructions to the T, but that's not always the case in our situation, okay? So, but luckily, this guy did well. He's, it's at four months, and he just sent his photographs. So... Uh, uh, again, with the lockdown, getting some of the follow-ups a little more difficult, but this is his range of motion. Uh, he's not uh, shown his pronation very well. Ideally, you, you should have the elbows locked when you're showing pronation, supination. But he's got almost a full range of flexion and extension. Okay. So I'm not, uh, how, how much time do I have, Le Leah? I'm kind of losing track. Do I have any more time? Uh, John, you, you, have, you have plenty of time because uh, Martin Richardson um, is unable to attend. Oh, okay. So we have another we have another twenty to thirty minutes if you, if you'd like. Otherwise, we'll start the other. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll finish before that. <laughs> unlike unlike all the other presenters, Sir John has unlimited time. <laughs> no, no, no. 
Uh, so I'll go to one of the older case, sort of the neglected cases, which again is a particular challenge. Uh, so this is a six month old fracture dislocation of the elbow and uh, it was reduced, uh, closed, but treated in a cast and he came to us six months down. That was his range of motion. Uh, that was all the flexion he had. And these were his uh, current x-rays. So how would you approach this? So, uh, Leah, you want to take that? Since you, I'm sure in Indonesia, you see a lot of neglected yeah. cases as well. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of <laughs> problem with the non-union problem in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's six months already, right? Six months down the line. Hmm. The elbow is still subluxed, uh, obviously, and uh, the radial head is gone, the coronoid is gone. Try to open it and then try to uh, open reduction. Okay. With the key wire, both of the radial and the ulna side. Um, the, head, the head of the rails, I will uh, excise it or replace it to the uh, radial head implant. Okay. Uh, anyone would do something different? Dr. Joon? Korea, what well, would you do? Uh, uh, John, yes. Thanks to uh, our medical system, we don't see uh, this very often. <laughs> uh, uh, post cases. Yeah. Here again, I would like to say uh, the, the principles. The principle is to restore proper olohumeral articulation and both collateral ligament intact. So in this uh, a chronic dislocation case, I would attempt a posterior universal approach because I would like to see the medial and lateral collateral ligament at the same time because there's a lot of fibrotic tissue which yeah. is uh, blocking this uh, olohumeral dislocation. But Leah, I agree, you may use this bony fragment from the radial head yes. to reconstruct the coronoid. But here okay. you have to keep in mind the scar in the front and back, under the triceps, under the brachial, you need to release. Otherwise, this elbow will be very stiff even after your surgery. So how to have a mobile, flexible, extension mobile elbow with the reasonable stability that's our number one so maybe yeah. a coronoid reconstruction with the both collateral ligament intact and then i will attempt the uh, secondary surgery for radial head later on great okay so i think these are very uh, but here the coronoid was not so deficient okay so what we uh, so we did uh, explore it from both sides i think in these old cases you where you're mobilizing and you need to see the ulnar nerve and protect it and mobilize it sometimes. So we went medially and laterally uh, or, and uh, we got the elbow reduced. We did a arthrolysis so that we could get a full range of motion. And then we put a hinged external fixator. We didn't want to put a transarticular wire there. Okay, so we used this uh, hinged external fixator. This is him with the fixator mobilizing his elbow uh, and uh, interestingly, he did quite well because this is his follow-up and he uh, eventually regained a reasonable range of motion. Uh, you mentioned uh, coronoid uh, reconstruction using uh, the radial head. So here's an example. Can um, I just interrupt you because we've got... Yeah, a sure. Interestingly, he did quite well so because this is his follow-up and he... Yeah. Uh, eventually regained a reasonable range of motion. Uh, you mentioned uh, coronoid uh, reconstruction using uh, the radial head. So Why? here's an example. Can um, I just interrupt? What's happening? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, he did quite well. So this is his follow-up. And yeah. he, uh, What's happening there? Corona, can you uh, endless uh, loop. You mentioned... Uh, oh, we're gonna Coronoid uh, reconstruction using radial head. So here's an example. What's happening? Interestingly, you did quite well. So this is a follow-up. And then, uh, 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 uh
You mentioned uh, what's happening. <laughs> Some, someone's, someone's put the laptop on and seen the delay transmission also. <laughs> So can we mute that guy? I'm sure. <laughs> and it's the same thing being repeated again and again. There's a delay of about 15 seconds. Someone has put it on. One of the one of the panelists has the laptop on. Put the laptop on and see the delay. <laughs> so who is that? We need to find it. <laughs> It's the same thing being repeated again. Can, can the host mute him? Here we go. Okay, we've got that. <laughs> that was interesting. Okay, so should I, can I continue, Sarah? Yeah, so the question we've got from the um, attendees is, did he undergo the PLRI protocol? With, uh, in brackets, free flexion from 90 degrees, free prono supination at 90 degrees, extension to 30 degrees in pronation only, immediately after the operation. So, well, he has a hinged external fixator on, so that keeps the elbow stable through the range of motion. So, you don't need to restrict. Uh, we would do that for the normal patient where we haven't used a hinged external fixator. Okay, so we, we would allow him. I wonder him if the question might relate to previous case. That might be the problem. Okay. Yeah, so in those, we would always go through that protocol. Avoid extension beyond about 50 degrees in the initial three or four weeks. Yeah. Okay. And if there's any medial instability, we would keep it in pronation. Okay. So that's the other important thing. Keeping it in pronation helps with the healing of the medial collateral ligament. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we were going on to now. Oh my slides have stopped moving. Okay, so this was a patient who presented late to us, and here you can see we've used the coronoid process to, uh, sorry, the radial head fragment to reconstruct the coronoid. So that's the radial head fragment. You can actually use it to reconstruct the coronoid. And here's another example of a late case where we uh, actually use the radial head to reconstruct the coronoid and then replace the radial head. So here's uh, the intraoperative photographs. We're cutting the radial head fragment into a size that would fit nicely on the coronoid uh, we've reconstructed the coronoid here. You can see the radial head being fixed with this so the head onto the area where the coronoid you have to make it congruent with the joint. And then we uh, replaced the radial head. And this patient actually did quite well, surprisingly. I was really surprised with the kind of uh, range of motion and recovery he made. This is not uh, the case all the time. Okay. <laughs> so... so did do you have any priorities with that piece of radial head? Are you sort of trying to get it buttressed right up against um, the humerus or are you Yeah, just absolutely. So that's, as you see here, you need to really get it nicely congruent with the joint here. Okay, so you try to use this part of the articular surface as the extension of your coronoid. Uh, so, and you have to make that sit nicely onto the uh, gap that the previous coronoid fragment has left. Okay. okay. So this is, uh, I think, uh, I would not expect this kind of result at every case coming later. I mean, if, uh, but here somehow did very well. Okay. Dr. Chiang. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Sarah, your comment is very important because uh, we are not dealing with the radial head replacement later on. Yeah. So how to adjust this height of radial head is very important, especially for Absolutely. the kind of elbow fracture dislocation. When you have a medial collateral ligament gone, it's extremely difficult where is the proper height. And also during pronation, radial head has at least a three millimeter up and down. Yeah. So uh, image intensifier is extremely important during your surgery. And as John said, semi-ulna notch, the lateral facet, 
is very yeah. important. Absolutely right. The notch there is where, and and you have to also make sure your size is not bigger than the native radial head. You Smaller can, is better. <laughs> downsize it a little bit, but definitely don't oversize it. Okay. So one last case. Uh, so I think the uh, the late cases are challenges. You need to do an arthrolysis to get movement. You need to deal deal with the stability and the stiffness. Uh, you can use the radial head fragment to reconstruct the coronoid if there's a big defect, and then if necessary, replace the radial head. But uh, not all the late cases need replacement. Okay, unlike the fresh cases where if you don't re reconstruct the radial head or you excise the radial head in the fresh cases, you end up with very much greater instability. And if you use, uh, the hinged fixator is really useful in these late cases. Okay, so. One last case, just to show things don't always go so well. This is a 54-year lady, isolated injury, and that was what she presented to us with. So someone had reduced it, and she came to us with these X-rays. Those are the CT scans. Again, you can see a clear coronoid and radial head fracture, uh, lateral uh, ulnar collateral ligament had gone. So we reconstructed the coronoid using the suture anchors. Uh, then we fix the radial head. So this is how we like to fix the radial heads today, is to avoid the plate where possible. And we try to get two or three screws, which we uh, sort of uh, countersink into the joint. And what we use today are very often the uh, sort of locking head screws, which have a smaller head. Okay, So instead of using the cortical screws, we use these locking head screws, as you can see here. Uh, that's, and we can countersink it very easily into the cartilage. So that's it at the end of the fixation. Uh, coronoid, we did a transosseous suture repair of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And uh, this was uh, uh, x-rays. This was done last year sometime. And uh, she didn't, didn't come for follow-up for a long time. And she came, we got her back recently because of the lockdown. She hadn't come for some time. Uh, she says she couldn't do the physio properly because of the lockdown. But you can see her range of motion isn't great. I mean, she can manage to eat with that hand, which is, again, very important for us in India. But she can't comb her hair, etc. So she does have some functional disabilities. The elbow looks quite stable otherwise. Uh, but not the best range of motion. Okay, so comments on that? Um, John? Yeah? Uh, can you give us uh, your experience how you deal with the heterotopic ossification over there? Th this much? No, uh, not this for... for this, okay, um, okay, so what? Okay, so we do, we do a, so we are... Uh, we do uh, deal with a lot of stiff elbows, both in children and in adults. And uh, so if they've got uh, heterotopic ossification, which is causing a block to their movement, uh, we would uh, uh, think of excising it and doing an arthrolysis. But we would wait for the uh, ossification to, in a way, mature. So we wouldn't do it in the acute setting. We would give them endomethacine for some time. Uh, wait for all the uh, markers to come back to normal, the alphosotase, etc. Although I'm not sure how much difference that really makes the ESR, etc. to come back to normal. And then we would offer an arthrolysis where we would excise uh, the myositis or the heterotopic ossification mass and then mobilize the elbow. We've got uh, quite a few of these cases which we've done in different situations. Not necessarily after terrible triad, but after... Uh, elbow injuries, especially in patients who've also had head injuries. So that's that's the ones who get the really bad heterotopic ossification. Um, is that the situation same in Singapore? Do you uh, defer this uh, uh, HO removal as much as you can so that it can be fully matured and then do the surgery late? Or is it better to tackle? I mean, the, the timing of this uh, yeah, I know this is... Traumatic HO is a quite a debate now. What do you think, Dr. Man? Uh, well, like I say, we are lucky not uh, to see a lot of these in Singapore. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it is important to have close follow up and know this is happening. And uh, I believe early NSAIDs treatment does modify the eventual amount of HO. So the moment you recognize that the patient's inflammatory response is exuberant and not helpful, then I suppress it actively with uh, medication. Uh, but I also uh, believe what John said is to wait uh, until it is very quiet. So clinically, you can already tell uh, if yeah. the sweat and pain is very much reduced, uh, then the patient is 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 ready for the release. But if the if the patient is actively still having a response, then Uh, going in at that point uh, will rapidly reverse your gains. So that is also not a problem. Uh, The key is that after your surgery, you immediately show good photos and uh, you (laughs) tape the patient inflection when she comes out. So she knew you did your work. But after that, I always (laughs) say, God's displeasure with her continues. It is not your fault. Uh, <laughs> certainly do twice it's not a problem but uh, but you have to explain uh, why so Sarah you do the same way for HO you just wait delay the surgery I mean I, th- I think ultimately it's a condition we don't understand and uh, until and and operating on a on a hot elbow you know with sounds like a very um, risky process it's more work. Okay, so I think I think there will be controversies. I think you, how long do you wait is really a controversial issue. And sometimes you may wait too long and then it becomes even more difficult to do what you have to do. But we've done them quite late, okay? So we've had some with completely, anch- well, not ankylosed uh, joints, but complete ankylosis of the joint, around the joint, let's put it that way with bone form posteriorly and anteriorly, with no movement. And we've done them as late as a year down the line and had very good results. So I'd be wary of doing it when it's really active because the chance of recurrence is quite high in those cases. Okay. So I think uh, that uh, uh, that's the last case. I think uh, as a conclusion mm-hmm. just to take home, I think these injuries can be challenging. Uh, Okay, I think uh, if you look at the initial results in the literature, uh, they have been uniformly poor, but more recently we are getting much, uh, we understand these injuries much better. We understand what are the factors which affect the stability and we now know how to deal with them and restore stability and start early range of motion. And so if you look at the more recent literature, I think the results are a lot more uh, promising than they used to be. So I think I will end there. Any more questions? And I'll hand it over to the moderators to to take over. <laughs> Let me just stop sharing. That's uh, that, that's terrific, John. Thanks, uh, Marini. Sarah, everyone, um, thank you very much. Thank you for all your um, hard work. Uh, Frankie, Leah, Saeed, um, MK, Rajesh. In Ho and, uh, and of course, John. And uh, interesting cases. I think there are some challenging cases, particularly around the elbow. What we might n- do now is just give everyone a few minutes to uh, um, grab a cup of tea or stretch their legs, um, do some exercise in the background so we don't all get repetitive stress injury. And then uh, you can uh, put your uh, screens on uh, to stop sharing the video and we'll come back in... 15 minutes on time to commence the uh, next session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks, everybody, and great catching up. Okay, thanks. Hello. Yes, Jamal, I'm here.
Hello. Uh, Avani, uh, Pramesh, please don't start the transmission yet, okay? Hi. Hi, Christian. Hi, Jamal. So you're operating, is it? Yes, I, I show you someone. Hi, Christian. Hello. Hey. Hi, Jamal. Hi. This you know, with the mask and all, it's difficult. Hi. Well, <laughs> yes, yes, we have, uh, yes, we have some urgent cases to do, yes, trauma, <laughs> waiting for the next session to start, right? So, Prof, how are we doing? Okay, uh, how's the consultation exercise? Have you sent it out yet? I, uh, I sent it out the same day, we'll CC to you also. Good, okay, very good. Very efficient. You're backed by a very efficient secretariat in KL. Yeah. But we have a very efficient trauma secretariat also. Ah. You, see that, the, you see that you see the guy standing next to you. I don't know if you've met him before. This guy here. I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're sincerely hoping that in the years to come he will take over the APOA, not the APATS. <laughs> okay, I don't know. He doesn't know about that, though. <laughs> we do, we do, we do. <laughs> okay. so I apologize, I have to go to a case soon. Yeah, sure, so go on. No, we'll handle it. For the session. Yes, but uh, I think everything has been great just yeah, now. Cool, cool. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Jamal. Bye bye. Boys.
this particular session. We have Hakan, who's the immediate past president of the APOA Trauma Society. And we have Yoshi from Japan. Yes. And we have Gouverneur from Turkey. And we have Kumar from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Right. <laughs> and James from the UK, this particular session. We have Hakan, who's the immediate past okay. president of the you know, APOA Trauma Society. And there's a back backup. So the loop is going on. Yeah, no, no, we, we should stop that. So we have what? Who's the first presenter for the next session? Wail Taha. Wail Taha. Is Wail, Wail on? He connected sometime, but yeah. after Marinus. Uh, Let me maybe. call him up. Waiting for you to join in so we can start. Oh. Okay, okay. So how the things going in India, Jamal, about COVID? Oh, you know, waiting for you to join in so we can start. So there's the loop still on. Oh, actually, you know, things are okay. I mean, we, we're we having about like some 65,000 cases a day. No. <laughs> but we're cool with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's like people have just come to live with COVID. Okay. Now, we just had the highest number recorded for 1765 yesterday. And uh, everybody is not even coming out of their bathroom. No, see, the thing is, Kumar, one yes. seven, one seven six five for you would be about sixty five thousand for us if you yeah. just expand it into the size. No ratio, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, but things are okay. Yeah. But you know, it has changed things so so much now. The world has just changed. I mean. My son has to get uh, biometrics done because he has to go to Canada. So I'm supposed to fly with him to Dubai to get the biometrics done. Hmm. So I just have to go there in the morning, get the biometrics done and fly back in the evening. Uh -huh. Flights are not an issue. Even when you get back, there's no quarantine for you or anything like that? No, they pre, pre, pre flight testing, post-flight testing, pre-flight testing, post-flight testing. Right. So it'll just end up for testing. Okay. <laughs> so you get stuff, I mean, things stuffed in your nose four times a day. There are no issues with your son getting into Canada then? There's no restriction or whatever? No, there is a 14-day quarantine. Ah, okay. We're just waiting for Hakan. I think we are ready. Uh, I think Hakan is coming. Okay, good. Uh, we will just ask the back. Uh, Anshul, could you please ensure that we are back online? I think we are. I think we are. Good. <clears throat> That's right. Okay, uh, we will start this, e uh, I guess, a morning session at Jane's place, but an evening session at our place. We'll start the knee and the tibia session.
The first presenter would be Dr. Wail Taha, from, who's from Medina in Saudi Arabia, and he'll be speaking on the bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. Over to Wail. Thank you very much. You can, okay. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the, in the world. Um, so what I'm intending to do, I'm going to give a very brief refreshing about, uh, refresher about the tibial plateau fractures. And then I have a number of cases that we would discuss together. And then at the end, we'll summarize with some uh, review of the, of the literature. I'm going very briefly to talk about the classification since in the past few years, there's been some changes to that. Very quickly, touch on the principles of tibial plateau fractures, ma fracture management. Uh, we'll discuss together in the cases, the different surgical options that we have for management, and we'll review some of the literature. As we all know, tibial plateau fractures are intraarticular fractures. And so when we treat them, we aim for anatomical reduction, a very stable fixation, uh, so we could allow for early mobilization. And at the same time, it is very important, specifically in these fractures, to protect and, and, and preserve the soft tissue as much as we can. In 1974, Schatzker proposed the classification for tibial plateau uh, fractures. This was mainly based on uh, the representation seen on an X-ray. And he classified the fractures into the uh, well-known six uh, types, ranging from a simple split all the way to a uh, bicondylar fracture with dissociation uh, from the uh, from, from the diaphysis. This classification was very helpful in deciding which approach do you use. And based on the two-dimensional x-rays that we used at that time, two approaches were identified, the anterolateral approach and the postural medial approach. And this was, was, was very useful, especially when you have a bicondylar fracture like this, you would approach, you, uh, approach the fracture using these two um, approaches and it will give you a very good and stable reduction. However, with the years, people and with the advent of, of CT, people started realizing that there is a, there is a, a subgroup of, of fractures that we are tending to miss from time to time. And these are the ones that are occur in the coronal plane and in the posterior and in the posterior plane. And these were often missed, especially when you when you fix them, you don't address them and it causes a lot of post-operative complications. And so um, a group from China came up with a, the, the concept of the three column uh, classification in which they divided the tibial plateau into three columns, a lateral, a posterior, a medial, and they added the posterior column to address these types of, of fractures. Schatzker again went back and revised his classification and also addressed these, these, uh, these injuries to the posterior aspect of the uh, um, of, the, of the tibial plateau. And I'm not going to go into any further details since uh, Dr. Hakan is going to talk about this, about these injuries uh, after my talk. So usually tibial plateau fractures result from two types of energy, a low energy trauma, which is usually in elderly patients or those who have a weak bone. And then there's the high energy trauma, uh, which usually happens in the young and is associated with a lot of soft tissue uh, injuries. We use x-rays as well as CT scan and MRIs and sometimes angiography for the diagnosis and the assessment of these, um, of these injuries. It is very important to also assess the soft tissue. And this study that was done in 2005, they, they reviewed a number of 100, more than 100 cases with tibial plateau fraction, and only in 1% of these fractures did they not find any soft tissue injuries inside the knee. So it is very important to assess these patients for soft tissue uh, injuries. Now, the operative treatment, there are indications for emergency operative treatment. These include if there is a vascular injury or compartment syndrome, if there is an open fracture or if there's a dislocation or in cases of a floating knee and in polytrauma. In these cases, uh, we, we tend to operate on them on an urgent basis. However, 
the more usual approach has been that of a damage control. You initially stabilize the uh, the fracture with a spanning X fix, and then once the soft tissue condition is better, we go and and fix do the definitive fixation. Uh, plate fixation has been the most widely used type of, of fixation. We use a buttress type of, of, of a plate, a buttress, the concept of a buttress plating uh, to the column that is uh, applied. And the main buttress plate is chosen according to the injury mechanism. And if there is comminution, we usually use a bridging type of a, a, uh, a plate. The locking head screws provide very good support than the conventional screws, and in some situations, percutaneous insertion is used. The hybrid fixation is very helpful, especially when you have severely comminuted and severely soft tissue injured uh, cases, like in this very severe proximal tibia bicondylar fracture with a dissociation of the shaft. The, um, uh, the soft tissue condition, there was a lot of swelling, so um, we elected to reduce the joint, hold it with, with, with lag screws, and then apply a um, hybrid uh, fixator. So now we're going to concentrate on bi bicondylar tibial plateau uh, fractures. And we are mainly going to try and address issues like staging, uh, what type of plating do we we um, use, and we will talk about the the uh, the outcome. Um, so let's start with this with this this case. This is a 32 year old male who fell down from about three meters onto his left leg, and this he was transferred to our hospital to to uh, to to the hospital about four days after the initial um, injury. Now this is how his um, X-ray looks looks like, and and this is how his his soft tissue uh, looks like. So um, to the uh, to the panel, what would be your thoughts on this on this case? Well, one thing for sure, uh, I would definitely not try and touch this in terms of. Uh, even talk about internal fixation at this point of time. And my 100% uh, uh, worry would be on the soft tissue, where this is a classic example where they say fracture definition has changed over the years, where fracture is actually a soft tissue uh, injury where the bone happened to be broken. This is a classic example of uh, what mm -hmm. we are saying. So like what you already said in your previous slide itself, we have to plan, scan, span. So that would be my approach for this. Very good. I totally agree with you. Uh, so, so my next question is: What would you do about these 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 bullies that we we see on the X-ray, on on the on, in the picture? Uh, personally, what I would do is I would aspirate uh, without trying to de-roof them. I would like to keep the top layer of the skin there. There, but I, so I would just probably do what's called aspiration. Even if I don't aspirate, eventually, regardless of whatever type of dressing you tend to use, it is going to spontaneously rupture. So when it ruptures spontaneously, the I believe the skin below is going to be much more raw. But if we aspirate, uh, even though there are chances of uh, reaccumulation, if you aspirate, at least I think the roof part of it could be sort of spared which sort of forms a dressing by itself. Very good. I, 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 I agree with you. There are two. Yes, yes, Dr. Jamal. At, at the point, I mean, to Dr. Kumar, does it really make a difference if you aspirate and try to keep the superficial layer? Of the well, it doesn't does really make a difference? Well, I, I feel that I, I have, I've seen many of this thing. Uh, it gives me a few days. Let's put it that way. It just helps me buy time. Because I feel the under the top layer let it sort of uh, dry off by itself, rather than leaving it raw. So that's that's sort of what normally what I do. Uh, I just try not to just rip off the whole thing. Chances of reaccumulation are there. I agree. So it does dry off. It does dry off. Yeah. So on that basis, I'd like to keep it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are two types of bullies. We have these, these bullies that are hemorrhagic, and then we have the serous types of, of bullies. If this is a serous, I agree with you, there's not much that we need to do for them. 
Um, there's a lot of controversy. Should you aspirate it or leave it? I don't think it makes much of a, a, a difference. When we have hemorrhagic hemorrhagic bullies, this these are the dangerous ones. This these are the ones that may get very easily get infected. So in these cases, it may be advisable to take them and do something like a debridement. You clean them and, and wash the area and make sure that they that you you vac because this is this is mainly blood and it's a it's a media for bacteria. Uh, to, uh, to, to grow, um, and and I totally agree with you. I would not touch this unless the the, the soft tissue condition becomes becomes um, uh, better and it allows it will allow us to uh, uh, to operate to operate on this. And so the, here comes the value of using an external fixator. Uh, because it will stabilize the fracture and at the same time it will prevent the fracture from moving and causing further soft tissue uh, soft tissue uh, uh, injury and so back to the to the fracture itself so let's say time has passed by it's been like a week or two the the, the area now is better what would be your approach to to fix this this type of a fracture if you look at it carefully, you could see that there is a, it's a bicondylar with a, with a, a, a uh, metaphysial comminution as well. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we had to make a CT to decide the way of operation and also approach. And uh, in the first setting, maybe we should choose a more compatible joint spanning external fixation to investigate if there is any associated uh, ligamentous injury. We, uh, we see that there is a widening in the lateral uh, plateau, but the medial uh, part seems okay. But we expect up to 75% a posterior medial fragment in bicondylar fractures, and we see that there is a great combination in the metaphysial part. Uh, so uh, we have to decide after seeing the CT cuts, I think. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have the CT with me right now. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what we could see on those, on those was, was that there was, a, as you said, there was a postromedial, a big postromedial, uh, uh, f fracture, and there was a split depression uh, fracture in the uh, in the lateral in the lateral condyle with a comminution in the in the metaphysis, um, and and so we the the the, the because of the, the severe soft tissue condition, although it did resolve, but the surgeon at this uh, at this stage decided since the the, the medial is a big. A big fragment. He's going to fix this with a screw, and he applied a uh, locking plate to the lateral to the lateral side to help to help uh, fix this. So um, my question would be: Would you do something different? Uh, yes, yeah. I can. Uh, maybe uh, I should uh, put an additional medial but subcutaneous plate in order to uh, increase the rigidity of the fixation. And if the CT cuts are well, it, uh, if we can go with a combinated lateral, but non-displaced medial, maybe after uh, joint reduction, we can put a uh, circular fixator to bypass the uh, comminuted metaphysial site. Uh, but it will take longer uh, uh, treatment time. But for this soft tissue injury, it could be possible. Yeah, Dr. Gubina, you want to have uh, some... For, for, the, for this particular case, after uh, finishing the uh, lateral fixation, I would put apply a stress on it. If there is a various deformity on the fluoroscopy, then I would add a uh, uh, medial plate in a subcutaneous fashion. But if it is stable enough, I would leave it alone because of the soft tissue damage. Dr. Wahil, may I ask you, uh, do you routinely, I mean, uh, if we can look back at the fracture fragments itself, the severity of the injury, 
would you have thought about doing a CT angiogram prior to or at least at the time of the admission of the patient to be worried about anything? Um, if, 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 if I do have any, um, any doubts about the distal circulation, I would go ahead and do it. This patient came about four days after the initial oh, injury. And so, and so it was, it was, uh, we, we were clear that he doesn't have a distal neurovascular injury. So I, I, if I have any doubts, like if there is, we do, first of all, we do the, um, um, uh, the brachial um, ankle ax, uh, uh, index. If it's less than 0.9, we go ahead immediately and we do the, uh, we do an, uh, an art, an, an, angio, an angiogram. Um, I agree with you. The, 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 once you see this this comminution on the median side, it becomes worrying. Like, yes. should you leave this without fixation? However, in this case, they they left it and it went on to heal well. And so this raises questions about how important is it to put a medial a medial plate? And we will discuss this. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. This is another case, a 39-year-old male um, was involved in a motorcycle accident and he had this isolated, isolated injury. And as you could see here clearly, he had a split depression on the, uh, uh, on, on the lateral, and lateral side. And I don't know if you could appreciate or not, there also is a fracture in the in the in the lateral on the med on the medial on the medial on the medial side, and so at the same time, this patient had a compartment syndrome acutely, so he obviously required a, a fasciotomy, and so I would like to know what would be your approach to such to such a case. He presented like this in the ER, and now you you you've diagnosed him to have this injury as well as a compartment syndrome. Dr. Gubina, you want to? Say uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, after fasciotomy, I just uh, would go for for X-fix for bridging X-fix. Uh, I put I I would like to put my shunts uh, to the distal femur and the above the ankle joint, and uh, manage it uh, with bridging X-fix and uh, get the CT scan uh, for the joint and uh, by some time and plan it uh, for a later uh, in the second operation. Good, so I guess the question is sometimes is that if you do your fasciotomies, how are you going to plan your incisions afterward? Yeah, uh, it depends. Uh, it depends, uh, but uh, you can put your uh, breech plating uh, under the anterolateral, beneath the anterolateral muscle group uh, after fasciotomy also. After removing X fix. Okay, I think Hakan, you wanted to say something. Yeah, Dr. Yeah? Hakan. You need to unmute, uh, Dr. Hakan. Uh, we, we see that there is combination on the lateral side, and in the lateral uh, radiogram, we see that there's also a posterior uh, fracture, and uh, probably it's a posterior lateral fragment. So if you want to reduce uh, without CTs, I am uh, talking with the radiograms, if there is a large posterior lateral fragment, maybe uh, we should plan our fasciotomy because we know that some of these posterior lateral fragments need some posterior lateral approach. Maybe we can change our fasciotomy incision from anterior lateral to something or uh, I don't know, but uh, it's an emergency situation. I agree with uh, Dr. Okchu. We should uh, make an external fixation. But after seeing the CT, maybe we should uh, decide the fasciotomy incision. I, okay, I'm trying to get to the CT to show you the CT since you asked for it. Sorry, lost the slide. Okay, so there is the CT. Yes. Uh, as we can see, there is a, a posterior lateral uh, uh, fragment. So this is here. the medial fragment. This is here, the medial fragment. Okay. 
And this mm -hmm. is the lateral fragment, and there's a piece of the posterior lateral here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is your lateral fragment, and this is your posterior mm -hmm. fragment. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe and we could uh, open the joint posterior laterally and uh, go down uh, to the anterior lateral fascia. And by one incision, we could reduce the fracture maybe. Okay, so w w usually nobody has a big problem with the posterior lateral incision because it's usually the fasciotomy incision is, is very near to where we need to make that incision. The, near, the real issue becomes the lateral incision for the, for the fasciotomy because it's usually very far, it's, it's usually lateral. And if you need to do an anterolateral approach, then you may be compromising the skin. So I think it's very important, as Dr. Khan said, to look at the CT, understand where the fracture is exactly so that when you plan your fasciotomy it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't interfere so in this case this is what they went and they did the they put the two the, the, the they they made the, uh, uh, the they made an anterolateral approach uh, and used uh, a, a a minimal invasive approach just made a small incision here and another small incision and uh, uh, down to pass the uh, the plate um, because they had utilized already a dead lateral approach, so they didn't want to compromise the blood supply to the uh, to to the skin. And so, when we talk about stage management, um, it, it the, this was this was proven to be a very effective way of of dealing with these patients. In two thousand and five, the first recommendation came out to treat these complex fractures with, with a stage management, and they found that the overall infection rate was less than 5%. Five, uh, 5 However, some people started doubting that, and the group from Vancouver looked retrospectively into their, into their um, uh, cases where they do their, their fixation acutely, like within the first, the, first, the first day. However, when you look at their conclusion, they said that this has to be done with a very experienced by a very experienced orthopedic trauma surgeon. And when they looked at the outcome, they said that radiological reduction was good. There was not much comment on the, on the, on, on the functional out outcome of these patients. So it still remains a very um, uh, valuable um, option to treat these um, in a stage, in a stage, in a stage manner. Uh, because of the, uh, Lack of time. I'm going to take one more one more case. This is a 39 year old male. He is obese. Was involved in a low speed motor cycle fall. He had this isolated injury, and he, there is no compartment syndrome. And this is his his X-ray. Okay, this is the X-ray, and you could see that there is a, a medial fragment there, and it is more of a posterior medial. And when they took him to the OR to do a, an, an X-fix. They tried to reduce that lateral fragment, but they could, they could not do, do anything. So they put on the um, X-fix um, and took him back to the ward and, and did these CTs. And so you could clearly see that there is a big postromedial fragment as well as a, fragment of, a, a fracture in the lateral uh, condyle. So the question would be, how are you going to fix this with one plate or two plates? Uh, probably we, we would go for two plates. Uh, uh, for the posterior medial and medial aspect, uh, we put the patient in a floppy lateral position and we, we just go uh, for the uh, uh, reversed L-shaped uh, posterior incision. We just uh, took off the whole gastroc and soleus and see the whole posterior part of the medial condyle and put a buttress after making the reduction, of course, uh, put a buttress plate to the posterior side and also posterior medial side from the single incision. Then you can uh, go for a second incision for the uh, anterolateral one. I think you can do it uh, if, the, if the soft tissues are okay uh, with this particular patient. Yeah, okay. the soft tissue was fine, yeah. Uh, these are the situations that I faced when you're dealing with this posterior fragment. Sometimes the posterior fragment itself is split into two, where the wider part of the posteromedial plate 
cannot actually address both of it together. So in situations like that, what I have done is I've used a distal radius condylar plate and I've used two of them to span it in a V shape like that in order to hold. Because if you put one, it is not able to actually, you know, you, you can't get the screws or even the buttressing effect uh, into all of them effectively. So sometimes it's just a suggestion that, you know, if you have difficulties like that, have your distal radius condylar buttress plates readily available. It's an option to make it in a V-shape on the posterior rather than one plate. But it's no different, uh, no additional incision. It's the same incision that you can use two plates instead. Actually, what I think Dr. Wailta is trying to pinpoint is that in his first case, you did. there was a medial involvement, but there was no usage of a medial plate. In this case, all everyone wants to suggest a medial plate. So how is it different? Well, the probably reason is that in the first case, there was no posterior medial involvement and only a medial involvement could have been taken care of by an interlateral plate. And also the medial cortical buttress was relatively intact and probably stable. But in this particular case, because of the fracture line and a single interlateral plate cannot fix the posterior medial fragment. It has to have two plates. Hmm. So not two fractures do not necessitate two plates. The fracture configuration necessitates two plates. Yes. And, and also because of the body mass and index of the patient, it's too heavy. So you can support the medial part that's also. A, that's another reason. That's a very yes. good point. Very good point. Thank you. And some may just opt for Elizarov instead rather than not opening anything because of the more like a it may, MIPO in this case may not look MIPO. <laughs> So, so these are very good observations, um, and and they 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 did something very similar to what you said. They did a posterior medial approach, fixed it with a plate. You can see that this screw was very long, and this is something we need to take pay attention to. Very often, it happens that you you put that screw in, and it prevents the reduction on the on the lateral side. And then they approach this from the lateral side and put a, their plate there, and there you have a very a very good. Um, uh, reduction. And so the question becomes, when do you decide to put that medial plate and when, when, and on where do you, when do you skip it? Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to go to, to do a, some literature review. And, and, and this is, this is one of the earlier papers that came up in 2007 that looked at the fixation of tibial plateau fractures in cadavers. And, and they plated uh, they had two groups, one where they used only a lateral plate and the other one where they used two plates, one medial and one, and one lateral. And their conclusion was that they, in those that had one plate, they could very easily observe that there was subsidence on the medial, on the medial side. So the recommendation was to use dual plating whenever you have bicondylar fractures. However, in 2016, another um, uh, a, a meta-analysis came out looking at the same issue, but this time in clinic, looking at clinical trials, and they said that there was no difference in the outcome. Now, this was very surprising. They're saying that whenever you have a bicondylar fracture, it is enough to go ahead and put a lateral plate, provided you are using the locking uh, type of, of, of screws and plates. However, they did not caught this in their literature. They didn't look at this, 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 this paper, which I think was a very important paper because it clearly states that there is a difference when you're looking at the medial condyle. Is the, pla is the fraction in the medial condyle in the, in the sagittal plane or in the, or in the coronal plane? plane. If the fracture is in the coronal plane, then you do need to fix it because it's a diff it's it, it, it's a different uh, plane where the where where, where the, the locking screws uh, work. So you need to have that postromedial plate supporting that 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 fraction. And this is to the point that Dr. Hakan mentioned uh, earlier. However, if the fracture is in the sagittal plane and it's a big enough uh, piece, then you would be okay using a single a single plate. Uh, 
So I would like to summarize some of the points that we've discussed today. Uh, Bicondylar plateau fractures are a broad spectrum of complex high energy trauma. CT scans and MRI are very important, especially in assessing the, uh, the bony as well as the soft tissue injury. Malalignment, especially in the coronal planes and instability are poor predictors of outcomes. So they do need to be addressed and they do need to be reduced and fixed. Dual plating is the most stable type of fixation um, and is associated with less uh, biomechanical complications. However, there may be more soft tissue complications. A single lateral locked plate is an alternative fixation for bicondylar fracture, provided that the postromedial fragment is not, the fracture is not in the coronal plane. Hybrid external fixators are also useful, especially uh, when you have severe soft tissue uh, injury. However, to me, the most important point is that no one fixation strategy is good for everyone. You have to look at the patient, look at the, at, at the, the injury characteristics and evaluate those very well before you make your decision. And each case would, have, would need a different, a different way of approach. Thank you very much. Jamal, you're on mute. Thank you, Dr. Tahan. We're just in time to go to the next talk, topic, that is the postromedial fragments, and that would be then by Hakan from Turkey. Thank you. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, uh, we, we heard a nice talk from Dr. Taha and some of the points, some of the important points are discussed. I want to show three cases and discuss three cases. The first one is a 54 years old female uh, admitted to our clinic uh, with a fall from a height. She had an isolated injury and her soft tissues are okay. At first glance, uh, when you see the radiograms, you can see the femoral condyles and tibial condyles are not well aligned. We see that the lateral plateau was rotated and depressed to some extent. And maybe you can recognize there's a transverse fracture line in the medial part. And also in the lateral radiogram, we see that the posterior tibia plateau was fractured, but we don't know if it is lateral side or medial side. And these are the CT cuts. You can see there is a big depression in the uh, lateral side, and there is a coronal plane uh, in the medial side, there is a large posterior medial fragment. So I want to ask my dear friends, which approach or approach would you choose? How many plates would you use? And to begin with, which is the first, uh, uh, which side first you prefer? Uh. The, 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 the big problem here is uh, to see the uh, posterior part of the uh, lateral plateau fracture because of the head of the fibula, it's very difficult uh, to visualize it and to, to, uh, to make the reduction. Uh, but again, direct uh, posterior approach uh, in the prone position uh, <clears throat> may be good enough to see the whole uh, posterior part of the joint uh, by the elevation of popliteus muscle. Uh, I would go for a prone and then try to uh, make a long incision, reverse L-shaped, uh, get the medial gastro uh, with the neurovascular bundle with the soleus, tilt to the lateral uh, <coughs> side and try to reduce the fracture and put two plates, uh, one, to the posterior part of the uh, medial condyle, and the other one is to the posterior part of the lateral condyle. But the fibula uh, makes me unhappy, I know. So you will choose the 
uh, posterior approach and you begin and with the medial side. Medial, medial side, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, what about this depressed anterior lateral or central depressed lateral fragment? I, I will try to, to address the, I will try to open it like a book and try to see it from the medial side and then elevate it uh, uh, to the joint line and then close the book uh, over it. And then put two separate plates that Dr. Kumar said, uh, one for the lateral part, one for the medial part. But again, you should be very careful uh, when you make your dissection in the lateral part uh, for the, uh, because there is a anterior tibial artery over there, it's very close. So you don't make uh, so many dissection to the caudal part of the fracture line in order not to injure uh, the anterior tibial artery. So you will choose one incision and treat all yes. the fractures? Yes. Okay. Is there any other opinion? Um, can we go back to the CT? Okay. So on, on that cut, it seems that the, 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 the posteromedial fracture is coming out usually through the, the typical area. So you may be able to approach that through a posteromedial uh, approach and fix that with the plate. The issue, the big issue, I think, is that central depression and the lateral condyle. And as, as Dr. Governor said, it, it, the fibula is in, is in the way and it's, it's just behind that fibula. So... I have many times done a fibular um, head osteotomy. Um, I've went in through a dead lateral approach, um, isolated the, 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 the peroneal nerve, retracted it, and then did a, 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 a fibular head approach. And then that, frag that, that fragment is just in front of you. And you have whole access to that whole lateral um, uh, um, that lateral condyle, especially if there's an element of a, of a split, then you will be able to address that very, very easily. However, here there's only that, what I can see on the CT is, is, the, uh, is that central depression. So um, still it's behind that fibula. So that would be one of the options I would think about. Did, uh, uh, may I just suggest anyone talked about putting a bone graft for the central depression? Would that be considered? Like I would still go on the dual approach still for this. Uh, but when I say dual approach, the direct posterior approach is a good option. And uh, it is going to be a KIV posteromedial, keeping the safe distance. And definitely in this case, I'll find a window to push in my... Uh, bone graft and try to elevate it as much as possible and uh, probably try and do a sub meniscal arthrotomy just to have a look at the uh, articular surface, uh, how much of uh, reduction I could possibly get and uh, hopefully some sort of a secondary congruency can take place over a period of time with early mobilization of the patient. So that would be my way of going for this. So if you like, uh, I can go on. Uh, yeah, I think like that. Uh, I think this is a big posteromedial fragment, and there is combination in the lateral side. You see, this is the fibula, and I think that I can reach it with, as Dr. Kumar said, another incision with an anterolateral incision. And uh, you see, there are many approaches. Uh, these are the most frequently used approach in the tibia plateau fracture surgery. Uh, I mostly use the L-shaped uh, incision for an anterolateral approach. You can also use this straight parapetalar incision. And for the uh, posterior medial uh, approach, uh, when I'm dealing with bicondylar tibial fractures, when the patient is supine, as our colleagues said, uh, the posterior medial approach described by uh, Dr. Lobenhofer is uh, good for this patient, I think. Uh, you go between the pes anserinus and medial head of gastrocnemius. And to begin with, uh, from the uh, less comminuted side, I think this is the medial side. So I begin with the 
uh, posterior medial incision, you see the hamstrings. You can uh, go between the gastrocs and pes anserenus. If you want, you can plate uh, this, but you see this, this is a coronal fracture line. So you put a plate that will compress this fracture. You need a posterior plate. So also in spine position, by flexing the knee, you can easily uh, approach the fracture side from the posterior side. And after fracture reduction and clamping and checking in two planes, I put some temporary key wires and put some posterior buttress plate. As you can see, this is the reduction and fixation. And then, as I said, by the anterolateral L-shaped incision, I put these meniscal sutures and make an submeniscal arthrotomy. You see there is a minimally displaced lateral ball fracture line. So I don't want to disturb this. And I drilled and make a hole to elevate the depressed part. If I will not uh, be successful, as Gwener said, I will make uh, maybe an osteotomy and uh, make an open book type uh, reduction. But first I try and by the help of this bone temp, as you can see, I elevated the fragment and put clamps and temporary key wires. And we uh, should always uh, check the reduction by direct vision also, uh, fluoroscopy and direct uh, vision. This is the hole for uh, elevating the depressed fragment. And as you can see by direct vision, it's anatomically reduced. And I put some leg screws, some raft screws, and put some 3.5 plate to buttress these fragments. This is immediate postoperative. And this is a four months uh, follow-up radiogram. You can see the posterior slope is also very good. There is no joint uh, enlarging. And you can see this is the L-shaped anterolateral incision. And this is the straight uh, medial incision. This is the first case. Uh, are there any questions about it? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I, I like the l shape incision very much. My question to you, is there an age limit where you use it and where you, do, you decide sometimes not to use it? Uh, I didn't experience any bad <laughs> situations. I most of the time uh, use this l shaped incision because I think that uh, by... Uh, dissecting superiorly, we dissect some more uh, soft tissues around the femoral condyle and it will not, I think it will, it don't help uh, the exposure. We also, uh, we should do a submeniscal arthrotomy. So, uh, and if we want to use a femoral destructor, we can also place it percutaneously. So most of the time I use this incision, L-shaped incision. So I agree, as I said, the incision is, is the approach is very nice. My 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 fear is that in in in, in those who may need a total knee replacement in the future, mm -hmm. will that incision make the approach any bit difficult? Maybe. Ashok, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, uh, I think Dr. Akhan that uh, L-shaped incision is like a, it's very sound based on the angiosomal concept has been shown by Dr. Solomon from Adelaide as well. Uh, only one question like, uh, have you uh, do you think you could have attempted reduction of the postocentral depression through the medial site? Would that have saved another approach? Because the force vector or the reduction vector is much better for the medial side as well. Yes, but um, uh, if I read uh, in this approach, in the posterior medial approach, uh, you can use the temp and also elevate the fracture part, but you can only control by 
fluoroscopic control. But in the anterolateral approach by submuscular arthrotomy, uh, sometimes, as we know, uh, fluoroscopy is good by direct vision. You see that there are some uh, gaps or steps, and some of the authors also uh, recommends arthroscopy uh, before uh, going out from the operating theaters. But as you said, it's an option also. Yes. Yeah, and one, one, and one more question, if I can ask you, like, uh, since uh, if you look at the major thrust of this injury is on the posterior side, like, uh, you have used a, a T buttress plate, uh, mm -hmm. three, five, like, would you have considered uh, using a stronger plate over that area instead of a, a T plate? Uh, this is a 3.5 plate, so I, I think uh, it's enough. Uh, more, uh, and the diameter of the screws, when you use 4.5 uh, millimeter system, uh, they are not, the screws are not flexible. Yeah, I understand. And, yes. I yeah, I didn't, one, yeah. Didn't mean a four or five, but like if you go by the Confeng Lewis concept, like uh, uh, if you look at like uh, uh, he prefers a much uh, robust construct, preferably a three five lock plate over that side. Uh, yes, you can use, but uh, this time, yeah, it worked uh, very well. Lock plates, you should bend the plate because most of the time, because of the angle of the plate, uh, if you don't bend the plate. Uh, the screws will go into the joint and uh, the plates buttress effects will change when you bend the plate. So I think this is, these, these plates are more practical in my practice also. Yeah, I, I do use them a lot as well. Thank you. Uh, in my practice, I, I prefer to, to look at the joint uh, with arthrotomy like you. Uh, not only relying on fluoroscopic shots. Uh, and I'm curious about uh, the idea of the panel. I mean, in bicondylar uh, intraarticular fractures, you rely uh, only on fluoroscopic shots or you also make arthrotomy and see the joint uh, with your eyes. What do you think about it? I think if it's a large enough fragment, I think like uh, if you have a good reduction vector, I think uh, doing a fluoroscopy assisted reduction isn't bad, I believe. Like, uh, But if it is multifragmentary, then pro preferably uh, an uh, arthrotomy to directly see the reduction, definitely it's better. Uh, uh, can I just share something that uh, submeniscus arthrotomy, we must understand there is certain limitation to it. There is only so much we can see and you need to sort of, uh, you know, either wear as well as it and twist it uh, a bit more in other, just to get that, that, that sort of a decent amount of view, at least just for the half of the articular surface. Beyond that, I think, uh, I don't think it's really possible to have a look. So it has to be both. I, I feel it has to be a combination of both in order to get somewhat a good uh, reduction like what Dr. Hakan has got. Yeah. You have to have a very good eyesight to actually visualize it properly with an arthrotomy because most of the time you can hardly see the outer peripheral one third. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so in continuation with that question, does anyone use a distractor to sort of like look more into that? Yeah. And in bicondylar fractures, I usually uh, use two distractors to uh, align the various valgus alignments. In and one of the, uh, sorry, in one of the uh, AO courses that I went uh, regarding this, so one of the uh, surgeon from China, he said the other two that he actually makes an effort to see through an arthroscope. Mm -hmm. So he actually puts it in and he tries to see it through the arthroscope. So I say, wow, that, that's like a lot of uh, uh, mm -hmm. amentarium in the in the operation theaters just to get that little bit of extra view. So Sorry. here is the arthroscope. Sorry to butt in, but uh, Hakan, we're running a bit late, so you got eight minutes for the next case. Okay, <laughs> okay. Oh, well, um, I will. Sh I want to show two cases, then four minutes one case and four minutes one case. Oh. Um, 
This is the second case, uh, 30 years old female injured in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, she had a tibia plateau fracture plus ankle fracture dislocation. The soft tissues are okay. As you can see, the most affected side is the medial side. And these are the eminences and the fracture going to the lateral side. And you see the posterior involvement and there is some medial disruption also. And I want to show you this. Uh, by this shear fracture, as you can see, the, the distal femoral condyle subluxated inferiorly and posteriorly with the fractured tibial plateau. So we should uh, reduce and fix all these posterior medial fragments in order to avoid a uh, knee subluxation. And these are the fractured, uh, fractured comminution size in CT. And this is the ankle fracture dislocation. Uh, I omit this. I uh, choose this L-shaped uh, posterior incision in this case mm -hmm. in prone position. Uh, the cleavage is like the other one between pes anserines and medial gastrocnemius. This is the prone position. This is the L-shaped incision. This is gastrocnemius. After it, uh, after we elevate it, you see this solus. This is the solus. And by dissecting the popliteus, you see these fracture lines. I reduced the fracture and clamped it. Temporary key wire fixation. This is the clamp. We should, uh, one important point is when we use these Hohmann retractors, you can go to the lateral side, but uh, we should stay proximally. If you go down to the popliteus uh, distal uh, border, uh, there is an injury of uh, tibial artery. So we should be very careful about these woman retractors. And you see how lateral can we can approach with this posterior medial approach. This is the first plate. And this is the second plate. And these are the immediate post-operative radiograms. You see the coronal plane is very good. The posterior slope is restored. And these are the radiograms uh, two years after. And this is the ankle fracture dislocation follow-up radiograms. So this is a very similar to the first one. So I want to uh, show all the re uh, slides. Do you have any comments about this? Uh, one tricky point uh, uh, that I want to comment on is the uh, the tricky part of the, that approach is the length of the vertical limb. If that vertical limb, I mean for the reverse L-shaped incision, uh, the vertical limb should be long enough. If it is long enough, then everything would be perfect. You can see everything till the corner of the semi-T tendon. Uh, just one question, Dr. Akan. Like, what was your thought process behind choosing the approach? Like, because the injury pattern wasn't very different, that is, on the medial side compared to the last case. So, like, why a different approach in this case? Uh, there isn't any uh, lateral column involvement. It's only a posterior medial uh, involvement, I think. So, uh, by this incision, I can also reduce and buttress uh, plate with one incision. There isn't any depression in the lateral side and it didn't need some buttressing in the lateral side. Probably if he used a similar approach to the previous case, he wouldn't have been able to put the posterolateral plate. Yes. And uh, I want to show the, my last case, but before our friend, uh, Dr. Terachai have a very great article about this posterior medial incision. As you can see by the posterior medial incision from the medial side to 44% of the lateral plateau, you can uh, 
reduce these fractures and put some plates. Uh, between 44 to 81 percent, you should choose the posterior lateral incision. And as I said, the section below this popliteus muscle increases the risk of uh, vascular injury in the lateral side, the section or putting some hormone retractors. And the last case is a uh, 36 years old male uh, fell from an electric scooter. Uh, as you can see, the lateral side is affected, depressed and rotated. There is some impaction, there is a condensation of impaction on this side and also a rotation in the lateral side. As you can see, by the impaction of the posterior lateral fragment, there is also an impaction in the fibular head. And we can see the altered uh, sagittal slope uh, in the lateral view. And there's some uh, dermabrasions in the medial side. And these are the CT cuts. As you can see, the whole posterior lateral uh, column is involved. And there's also a split fracture, some split depression in the posterior lateral fragment. And these are the 3D CT cuts. You can easily understand from this cut, I think. And what will you? what will you recommend for this fracture and what kind of plate? Uh, it's a difficult one uh, to, to make an open reduction and uh, getting the appropriate anatomic reduction of the joint. But as uh, Dr. Uh, Taha said before, I think fibular head osteotomy uh, would be appropriate approach uh, to make the uh, anatomic reduction. And uh, also buttressing from the posterior side again, as you mentioned, that fragment over there, purely posterior. Dr. Akhan, like, uh, I think uh, one great option is to do a direct posterior lateral. You can uh, um, sort of like uh, elevate and then buttress the rim as well. But uh, I think another alternative option is to do an extended anterolateral or the suprafibular approach because if you look at the posterolateral rim, it is not too displaced, it's just buckled. So you can get pretty good visualization of the articular surface from that approach, but not, you can't see the posterolateral rim butt. So you have to sort of like reduce it and opt for a rim plate. So mm -hmm. that is another option if you do not want to do a direct posterolateral in mm -hmm. this case. Okay. And I am moving to the slides. I, I choose the uh, fibular osteotomy, the extended lateral approach described by Dr. Lobanafer in this patient. Uh, I place the patient uh, in lateral vacuitous position. You see the incision, a lazy S type incision. This is the fibular head, this is the LCL. And after uh, mobilizing the perineal nerve and protect it, I uh, dissect the gastrocnemius lateral head. And this is the incision of the iliotibial band up to the fibular head, parallel to the joint line, as you can see from the diagram. And this is LCL, this is biceps tendon. Uh, we carefully dissect the fibular neck, protecting the perineal nerve, as shown, this is the the section point. And then when doing the fibular osteotomy in order to avoid joint penetration, you can use some K wires to guide you. And after fibular osteotomy, you can uh, now see the full extent of the fracture, the anterolateral and posterolateral. This is the a split fragment, this is the depressed fragment. This is before reduction, this is after reduction. You can put an osteotome and elevate all the uh, fracture line. And I use this 
uh, 3.5 millimeter plate. Uh, unfortunately, we can't use uh, T plates going downwards uh, because we know that a three, point, uh, three hole uh, T plates length is five centimeters. And I will show a literature about the anterior tibial artery. So I contoured this plate and put it like a rim plate. I buttressed and make raft, rafting. And I checked the posterior slot under fluoroscopic and direct vision. And after that, I fixed the fibular head and put the enter uh, lateral plate to uh, increase the rigidity and there is a very big fracture so these screws are holding the fragment as well and this is immediate uh, post operative radiogram uh, this is three months yes three months follow-up radiogram and you see the incision and these are the functional clinical uh, pictures. Uh, would you like to comment on this patient? Very nicely done, very, very nicely done. Thank you. So uh, for time's sake, I want to uh, show you three slides, uh, the most important uh, slides, I think. Uh, this is the German Knee Society's 10 segment CT based classification system. Uh, they uh, divide the posterior lateral uh, fragment uh, into posterior lateral central and posterior lateral, posterior lateral lateral. So Dr. Frosch, uh, this is the posterior lateral approach without fibular osteotomy. You can see only this uh, part of the joint. And they recommend in this uh, paper, if you want to see uh, the whole posterior central lateral and posterior lateral lateral, you should uh, choose a fibular osteotomy or lateral femoral condylar osteotomy. And uh, as I said, there is an, a risk of injury of anterior tibial artery. We know that from the joint line, the anterior tibial artery can pass three to six centimeters below the joint line. And as I said, a 3.5 millimeter plate's length is five centimeters. So there is a risk of uh, putting this plate in vertical position. And in most uh, articles, we, uh, we see that the plates are uh, put parallel to the joint for the sake of this uh, injury. And our, uh, I want to share our moderator's uh, article about this posterior lateral incision. They have 21 patients with fibular osteotomy and they reported no specific complications related to the surgical approach uh, like common perineal nerve injury and lateral instability of the uh, knee. So my take home messages, malreduced tibia flat uh, fractures go to total knee arthroplasty five times more in 10 Video years. Uh, the most frequent malreduction takes place in posterior quadrants. Even non-displaced posterior medial fragments could displace later and result in subluxation, so they should all be fixed. And uh, I recommend CT-based evaluation and approach selection for these uh, heart fractures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akan. We're going a bit late, so we won't go in for any further questions. Now I would request Dr. Roger Bingham to take over charge. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, let me just check if you can see the screen there. I'm going to go full screen with the Asia Pacific logo. Um, I'm going to advance the slide. Can I get a visual or audio that that's advanced? Can anyone see the declaration slide? So there's one on the screen. Yep. Okay. So case-based discussion here. Uh, thanks very much to the panel, the moderators. Please cut me off whenever time is getting short and uh, we'll just make some points along the way. 
First case, male 75, struck by a car, uh, typical Australian comorbidities, and it's a closed fracture. These are our only pre-op shots taken in the trauma bay, and uh, I'm interested in uh, the treatment of proximal tibial shaft, what you think in terms of uh, mainly mainly fixation approach uh, rather than time and, and delays, ethics and CT scans and so on. What do you think? If the patient uh, general condition is okay, I, I just follow. I would like to follow the ATLS principles. Um, if it is or if she is okay, I would try to fix it uh, with an IM nail. Uh, eight hours. Yeah, absolutely. So I think most people would want to nail that. Anyone want to speak in favour of plate or uh, frame? Uh, for me, uh, in my hospital, no frame direct. Uh, I'm nailing. If, yeah, so in terms, of, okay. in terms of I'm now, I'm interested in how many people are semi-extended versus how many people uh, like to do a mean parapatella, complete open approach versus uh, maybe uh, an infrapatella with an E-flex. Uh, in this particular case, I would go for uh, suprapatellar nailing in the, in the semi-extended position, I mean for 10 or 15 degrees of knee flexion. But yeah. if you don't Anyone have... Yeah, but if you don't have an access to, to suprapatellar nailing, I mean, for the equipment instruments, you can also use a parapatellar approach, find the trochlea and uh, put the guide wire over there and nail it down with, with at least three proximal locking and two distal uh, conventional locking. I, I, I think it would uh, appropriate for this particular patient. But if we have some technical issues, you can also... And uh, you, you should know how to how to solve them during the operation. I mean, uh, clamps, polar uh, screws, or other stuff. Roger, uh, yeah. I, I would just like to say, you know, the mere title of your topic that says proximal tibia, uh, that sort of gives me a sort of a doubt if there is the the articular surface is actually involved or not. So I would be right. more worried about is this total any form of extension into the uh, you know, the uh, knee joint is be would be yeah. my biggest here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly, certainly a proximal fracture, and you need, may need to address that with some percutaneous screws, even a plate nail combination. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just keep putting slides forward, and anyone jump in if you want to stop me. So um, I did exactly uh, what was suggested there, using a super patella, semi-extended, 30 to 45 degrees of mm. flexion, <clears throat> and we've got five locking the screws there including some that have uh, gone through from the fracture where it's been clamped and reduced uh, temporarily. We've got the immediate post-op shots. You can just see some staples in the suprapatella area on the lateral x-ray, and then we can see uh, one of the screws working its way out at about the six-week mark. We've got our three-month and uh, six-month shots there, showing that the screw wasn't bothering him too much proximally, so we left it, and uh, his rotation was clinically uh, acceptable and compared to the other side. So this leads on directly to case number two, where we've got uh, a similar demographic uh, male with similar lifestyle choices who's got a segmental fracture. So um, the, the point, I guess, is very similar to most of these, except if the nailing, how you deal with the inter intermediate segment, and uh, does it change anything else that you might do? What are your thoughts? Hakaran. Uh, it will not change, but uh, I think uh, in the previous uh, patient, I will choose a, some larger nail. Uh, the loss of reduction maybe is related with uh, the size of the nail. And in this segmental fractures, uh, we should uh, avoid the middle segments rotation in order to avoid vascular injury to the periosteum. Uh, when we ream. So I put a one cortex shunt screw uh, during reaming of this uh, middle segment, and maybe I will choose one millimeter uh, smaller nail for this type of uh, injury in order not to uh, devascularize the medial segment, but it's a very good fracture for an IM nail, I think. Absolutely. Any, any tips on rotation alignment from uh, the panel, the moderators? 
Yes, I, you know, especially the proximal segment, I would probably just sort of suggest a very, very mini open and use a small DCP plate just to convert this three segment into a two segment first, but unicortical. That means it really does not pierce, get into the articular surface. But end of the day, I would still opt for an interlocking nail. And, it, and I don't have to worry much about the middle segment being uh, getting rotated during the rimming. So um, just a mini, and, uh, and thereafter, if you want to keep it, you can keep it, otherwise even uh, remove the plate should be fine. And of course, not on the medial, but more towards the lateral side. Where there is the soft tissue cover, yeah. So I put this one in as the contrast to the first case because I've, I've moved away from the suprapatellar nails and now I do a lateral parapatella semi-extended extra articular. So the important thing there is you're not entering the knee joint. That was the main reason I moved away from the suprapatella nail because even if I lavaged it, even if I used arthroscopy, I still found so much debris in the knee, which admittedly we do with the retrograde femoral nail and not worry about it too much. But I, I just thought, I'll try this technique out. You can see there the position of the patella being pushed. Uh, you can see here with uh, the use of a couple of uh, both coronal and sagittal plane blocking screws that I was able to push the nail through it. And we used uh, some chain screws, uh, as was mentioned, to, to help with the intermedullary segment uh, when we were reaming. A little bit smaller on the nail so that we didn't have to ream too much. Looked it up at the top with a similar sort of configuration. I think the uh, measurement of the nail length was malfunctioning that day. It's a little bit short, but uh, we, we certainly were able to treat that entirely closed or via mini percutaneous means. And you see the initial post-operative films there with the staples. Then we're at the six-week mark, uh, very long end cap, even couldn't save us there, and uh, at the six-month and the 12-month mark. This man did, did quite well. Um, he actually was bothered by his nails, so we took that out, and you can see there the uh, shot upon removal and then at the one-year mark afterwards. Um, got away with that one. Case three, again, anyone slow me down if, if you want to cover anything. Five-year-old male, um, minding his own business, out of nowhere, firearms uh, came to uh, the play and he was uh, treated at a hospital nearby. So entry wound is on the lateral side, exit wound is on the medial side in the direction where you see all the shrapnel pretty much over the medial belly of the gastroc and he's been treated with a long 4-5 uh, profile plate um, by the surgeon, along with the debris de Mont. I'm um, interested in particularly uh, Dr. Taha's um, presentation, the first talk of the session. He mentioned the need, maybe we don't need medial plates. Uh, this man's now incarcerated, so he's come over to me, and I'm trying to decide, am I going to leave the construct? Do I add a medial plate? Do I need grafting? Should I swap it for a nail? Do I use a nail plate combination? What do you think? How bad was the wound uh, over the medial side? That means, uh, uh, yeah, I, I would probably done the same. I would not want to touch uh, anything on the medial side. The medial plate may be selectively, in this case, may not be indicated because of the type of injury that he has had. You're going to disrupt quite yeah. a bit of the biology there, and that is the only one he's depending on union. I think this was very correctly done, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. So these x-rays are immediately post-op. Um, there wasn't a large wound medially. Most of the uh, you know, debris was still contained, and, and apart from that, which had exited through maybe two-centimetre uh, wound, and uh, the, the lateral-based entry wound was used uh, partly for the plate and uh, for debris de Mont. Are the distal um, screws locking head screws? Because I can't tell from the x-ray. Yeah, so he's locked entirely in the proximal screws, okay. and then you've got... Uh, down the bottom, there's at least two locking screws okay. at uh, one and three holes. This is like an internal fixation principle, right? Not an external, but right. internal fixation principle. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone for a medial plate, anyone for a graft, anyone for just leaving it and seeing what happens? What are your thoughts? I would I would wait. Um this is a physio and it's comminuted, although it, it is extending into the shaft, but because nobody has touched that area and you've got a very good fixation, I would just wait and see. I wouldn't rush into what time of a gunshot injury it was. Like, is it a rifle or a handgun? You don't know. A uh, shotgun. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh so
what's the purpose of the back slap here? You just to have an additional support or yeah. no, it's uh that's that's his initial post op shot in the other hospital. So oh, um I, I don't know. I think it may be just a minimize movement of the quads, uh, sorry, the calf muscles, anterior compartment. Mm-hmm. His fibula is still intact. That acts like an additional splint here. So that should be sufficient yep. enough to support the plate. Uh, yeah, no, I, th- I thought this, the same thing. And, and I couldn't help myself with the defect and obviously the rear two being released earlier this year. So I went back in and, and got some bone and um, took it from the same side femur. So you can't actually see the medial wound there. It's covered in that shot. But um, I point this out that if you are going to use the system, maybe start off with uh, the 11s. The, the, we had a couple of uh, malfunctions with the 10, and you certainly get a much better bone graft harvest if you're using the 11, 12s, and 13s. So I, I used a, a fairly small incision on the medial side to go back in and graft it. There is actually some bone in there despite what it looks like. Um, but I agree, the principles of that single lateral plate, I think it's – the internal external fixator, so it's uh, it's satisfactory. I haven't touched the lateral wound. His uh, biochemistry has been stable, so from an infection point of view, I think we're at least uh, under control, and uh, I haven't got any more than the post-op shots to show you for that case. Sort of uh, male with similar habits. He said a gunshot wound, which was treated, including an arterial injury and repair using an X-fix, and he's gone on to have uh, an intramedullary nail and plate. I put this up simply to show you again another problem with the rear. That's the rear two and the size 10 and the broken tangs, they're called. Um, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. That was only the second or third time I'd used it. But um, we certainly use it from the point of view of bone graft harvesting, but also to clean the canal. Again, yeah, just, that was the size 10.0. So watch out with caution. On the 10 point zeros. Um, yeah, look at that. Uh, he had a touch on me wounds, as you can see there, uh, after his prolonged ischemia with that arterial repair. Um, I've nailed that with a actual parapetella semi extended approach. In case number one uh, or two, in terms of getting a cortical read and, and stability. Unfortunately, day one post op, he had uh, altered sensation in his distal. Um, in his uh, deep perineal nerve. And uh, when we went back in, we found the vascular surgeon said uh, not only tied off his artery, but they tied off his DPN, but uh, we released that vital suture and it's recovering. Uh, hopefully there's time for at least one more case. This is a woman that uh, I inherited, came from Sydney to move to Melbourne. She's one year after an IM nail and uh, she has the fracture and the non-union has shown. 12 months, she's uh, a healthy woman. There's no real risk of non-union here. She's a non-smoker, not on prednisolone. She's a little heavy, but um, the non-union workup revealed just a little bit of organ D deficiency. That was all. Interested in your thoughts on this proximal fracture with a 12-month nail breakage? Mm. I guess removing it itself uh, would be a challenge, uh, number one. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, removing itself would be a challenge. Uh, at this stage, I would still, I would probably consider getting a, a plate fixation done and trying to, it, this is more, does it look like a hypertrophic non-union or, yeah. Yeah, oligotrophic maybe. There's certainly some hypertrophy in, in parts of it. Yeah. Uh, consider a uh, bone graph, a combination so of lateral, long lateral plate, lateral, absolute lateral. stability, yeah, and bone graft, okay, yeah, um, autogenous. Which um, I guess rightly or wrongly, I uh, went back in and took the nail out. Um, the t- proximal half is easy to get out. The the distal half, what I use is the um, operates or the reverse cutting thread on the screw because the internal diameter of the nail is 3.5 millimetres. You can use the operates for a 3.5 screw and it drills down um, and then you can back slap it out. So it's just as if you had a stripped 3.5 or a 4.5 screw, you can put that in and then attach it to the back slapping device. I've gone for the double plating there and absolute stability or maybe a bit of absolute instability. Um, Take your choice, and I've used uh, some distal femoral autogenous graft there, mainly mm. Kent Ellis. 
I've used the um, incisions existing for the nail and then made a separate incision to crack the fibula and put the medial plate. What does everyone think? Well, a question here. Were two plates really required? Yeah. What does everyone think? I, I, I thought they were. I didn't know if I could get enough through. Uh, I did the medial plate first and then the lateral second. Um, yeah, obviously you could do it in a couple of ways. Yeah, my, my preference would be like just a single plate. I try not to touch on the medial side the far best possible. So, yeah. Govinel, uh, would you have done anything different? Uh, I, I would go for uh, three point, not for 3.5 plating. I would go for a 4.5 millimeter compression type lateral plating. Uh, not touching the medial side for uh, preserving the blood supply coming from there. And I would try to compress it as far as I can possible. Hmm. My, my issue is that this, this has been going on for quite some time. And, and my question, did you divide the fracture site or you just did the plating? Yeah, so that's, I, that's why I've got such an extensive incision on the medial side. I've gone in basically uh, post-remedial and uh, done a very thorough debris amount. I've drilled up the non-union. We've got bleeding bone. We've excised a, a lot of bone, as you can see, on the lateral post-op x-ray. Okay. And uh, then we've grafted maybe 5 to 10 cc's of bone. Okay, so stability. So, right. be, could be, so in this situation, putting the two plates, you're making it very rigid. And it may actually, um, uh, like, it, 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 it in, in this situation, I would like to have some kind of, of, of uh, like motion there to, to uh, help with the, with, the, with the healing, especially that I won't be able to get an absolute stability on this. So um, I, I would put a, a single plate on the lateral side um, and I, I would bone graft at the same time as, as you did. Although some people say that since this is a uh, hypertrophic type of non-union, um, the issue here is is, is 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 the stability more than the uh, uh, than than the blood supply, uh, but yeah. I don't want to go in ag again. So I may I may put the a, a bone graft and use one 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 plate, and it will be a locking plate like what you have what you have done. Yeah. So pretty much the theme is one single plate. We can't really get absolute stability. We can see the cortex is, is reasonably opposed on the lateral border and on the anterior border, but there's that big post-remedial area. But absolutely, we cannot get a true absolute stability with this case. And, Roger, uh, Roger, any thoughts on, sorry, Roger, any thoughts on nail pale construct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, guess, I guess my approach, uh, I had the wrong philosophy. And so even with maybe the correct implant or a, a correct possibility of implant uh, that maybe I haven't used it in the right way. So maybe a nail plate combo is a really good choice there from the point of view of the, the relative stability you need and more biologically friendly. You can see here, um, this is at the six month mark when my non-union was persisting and then the patient developed some drainage. So I took it back and uh, debrided everything just to get some cultures. I've got some uh, calcium sulfate beads there with antibiotics. And uh, we've come back and patient declined surgery. And there we are now, 12 months after original nail, six months after I've treated her. So she's 18 months now with uh, drainage and broken implants. Hmm. Where are we headed now? I think you should uh, take everything out, uh, throw out the abridement and irrigation, take the cultures and Probably I would go for an, a circular type frame or uh, maybe tailored spatial frame. Uh, I don't try again to put something internal. If the patient characteristics is uh, suitable for external fixation. Yeah. This yeah. will be the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you should have gone to this a bit earlier. This is, uh, you know, I, I work at three hospitals and luckily uh, there's a frame specialist at every one of them. So uh, I handed this one over. She's had a debris amount. Uh, everything's out. All the screw holes have been over-drilled and uh, some grafting applied. 
And uh, at one year, despite the appearance here, it was uh, stressed like the uh, original paper from Hammer in Sweden um, for the, the Rust-type score derivation to show uh, that it united. We have time for another from the panel, Rhoda? Um, yeah, we have five minutes. Five minutes. All right, let's talk about this 48-year-old male, previous tibial ORIF, not done at our hospital. And once again, a uh, place I work is the, the main statewide hospital for prisoners incarcerated. So he uh, he, he uh, turned up. Uh, one of his screws was backing out. Uh, this wasn't bothering him too much, but uh, the key thing was... His assault while he was in jail, um, and uh, then he came in with this fracture here. So maybe it's not projecting well, but there's a, a periprosthetic fracture below the uh, postromedial plate, um, and it's it's um, yeah maybe not quite well shown there. But what are your thoughts in terms of how to deal with this one? Maybe taking some screws out, dropping a nail down. Is it a frame candidate? Is it one we can treat with a cast? For, for me, it's cast conservative. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly no wrong answer to there. From a prisoner point of view, they, they don't tend to be the most compliant patients. And I guess he's not a great operative candidate, but he's, for me, not a great non-operative candidate. And uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, I, uh, I treated him in a cast for a week and gave him a chance, but he was just walking around on it. Um, in the in the in the prison ward, so uh, given the, the displacement there, we thought we'll we'll go back in. I took that screw um, and just pushed it down, uh, letting it like, rather than go around the back and fish around for it. I just I just left it there. It seemed to sit okay, and swapped that lateral plate. Anyone do anything different? Mm. No. Yeah. It's a fairly good fixation, except just a bit worried about the screw at the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, he's, he's actually been like that for nearly nine years. Um, and yeah, you're right. I guess it was the option of going and, and doing a post remedial approach. I didn't think I could use a nail here just because of the screws. I'd have to do a formal uh, removal on the post remedial approach. So I just continued that lateral incision and percutaneously applied those three screws distally. Yeah, <laughs> he walked. He walked on it, of course, um, as he was always going to, and he, he's gone on to heal. And there he is at the six month mark. Screw at the back, as you see, is just happily sitting there somewhere, um, <laughs> not troubling him too much. So uh, I guess in the interest of time, we'll skip case seven and eight, and uh, hand it back to the moderators. I'm uh, just going to hit the stop sharing button. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Uh, we're just in time, so we'll go. The next talk is open table shaft fractures. Jane Ward from the UK. Hi. If you could put my slides up, that'd be great. Well, are you not going to be sharing your own slides yourself? Uh, I did send them in advance. I can share my screen if it's easier. Yeah, yeah of course. So you're allowed to share your screen. Okay, can you all see? Absolutely. So I say it's a, it's a good morning from me and uh, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody else. Thank you so much for the invite. It's a, a superb meeting so far. So on behalf of the OTS in the UK, I'm going to talk about open fractures. So here in the UK, we've got some really good national guidelines, which are the BOST, the British Orthopaedic Association for Standards and Trauma. So it means that all open fractures in the UK come to a major trauma centre where there's orthopaedic and plastic surgeons working together. And essentially, we're going to debride them within 24 hours together. And then we're going to try and do our definitive soft tissue coverage and our definitive fixation, whatever that may be, in one combined sitting at about 72 hours. Every unit in the UK is slightly different. And certainly in, in my centre, our preference is for an intramedullary device and then free tissue transfer with either a gracilis or an ALT, an anterior lateral thigh. So it's really easy. We nail it, plastic slap it, and that's the lecture done. But unfortunately, not all our cases fit quite so nicely. 
So I thought I'd present some ones that were proven to be a little bit more challenging. So our first case is a 24-year-old gentleman who came off his bike and he's got a medial femoral condyles, patella and a tibial fracture and all of these are open. So my first question then to the panel would be really in terms of timing. What, what are you going to do and, and when are you going to do it and what are your priorities? I guess without without fail, it's going to be a soft tissue concern would be our big uh, thing. And do you have anything to show how bad the soft tissue is? Uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll just give you an insight. So this was an absolutely catastrophic uh, soft tissue defect. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not really one soft tissue procedure that's going to be able to cover all of this. So we thought that we would do this stage and um, with the priority being trying to cover the joint first. So in his first sitting, he gets debridement of everything uh, and he actually gets his definitive fixation of the joint, anatomical reduction, and then that's been covered with a gastroc flap. And then we're going to come back and address the tibia at a later stage. Um, so this is our infix, and I didn't know if anyone on the panel was familiar with an infix in open fractures. So talking yeah, about... Yeah, I've worked with Mark Kelly. Are Sorry, say again? Are you talking about a supercutaneous plating? Sort of. So uh, if you think most of the time you, you ask the registrars or the re residents, how, how do you temporarily stabilise an open fracture? You're going to get, oh, we're going to externally fixate it and then we'll come back later. The problem is with some open fractures, where do you put your X-fix pins? Especially if you think about someone who's had fasciotomies and you're putting your pins through the only good bit of soft tissue you've got. So in fixes, if the subcutaneous board of the tibia is looking at you, quite good just as a temporary stabilization. It doesn't need to be adhered to the bone. You're not doing any more stripping. It does exactly the same thing with perhaps a little bit less harm. So his joints been addressed. He's got a definitive gastroc. He's had an infix, which we know is going to be a temporary plate and it's going to be redebrided and come out at the time of definitive surgery. And this is where we are. So now we've got to think about how we definitively going to address the tibial shaft and that defect. <coughs> Uh, and that's what his infoot looks like. Uh, he's got some bone in continuity. Now, the plastic surgeons then say to me, this is still a big defect. So an ALT, the pedicle is not going to cut it. The only soft tissue option for him now is going to be a free scapular flap. It's a big procedure and it's going to take them a long time. So they said, oh, it'd be really good if you could uh, crack on with your nailing at the same time as, as we raise our flap but we, we need the patient to be lateral to get to his scapula. So I was thinking, well, you know, we're all, we're all familiar now with, with lateral femoral nailing. Why don't we try and, and nail his uh, tibia in a, in a lateral position? And actually with the uh, super patella nail with a, with a bad side down, you can do that and, and it wasn't too much of a problem. I, I agree with what um, Dr. Bingham was saying about a super patella nailing going through the knee. Uh, for me, for with open fractures, you've got quite a high chance they're going to get infected and the nail's going to have to come out. So if I can, for an open fracture, I'm going to try an infrapatella nail. Uh, but I say to help the plastic surgeons with their more important 12-hour operation, we did this laterally. Um, and you can see he's now about two years down the line. He's back working as chef and from quite a, a catastrophic soft tissue injury insult, he's had a, he's had a fairly good outcome. Any questions before I, I carry on to my next case? How much were you able to get his knee range of motion? Was it a stiff knee? Did you get a stiff knee at the end of the then or the functional? Well, what, was good. No, not really. We, we kept him uh, straight for about two weeks from a soft tissue point of view, just to let the, the gastroc settle. He's never had an external fixator. His knee's never been bridged and he's had quite early definitive fixation. So as soon as the plastics were happy, we were able to move. He's actually now got a little bit of HO um, on his medial femoral condyle. Uh, so he's got a little bit of crepitus in deep flexion, but, but otherwise not too bad. Good. Uh, Jane, any thought? Sorry. For how long did the plate stay? Three, a couple of days? So the plate stayed until we did our definitive nail. Uh, and we will go back and do that 
uh, we'll say ideally 72 hours. He was longer because he was a little bit mucky. So he went back, had another clean. And uh, so the plate stayed for a week. It was a week between uh, original injury and his scapula flap. Any, any, any evidence on how long the internal the infix can stay on? Or like, uh, do you consider uh, coating it with the antibiotics? So we don't uh, coat them with antibiotics, uh, a really good question, because our guidelines are that we should try and do our definitive soft tissue reconstruction so and intervention at 72 hours, really not more than that. Um, after you get into a, a week, uh, the chances of your free flap, it's a little bit more tricky for the anastomosis for the vascular, for the plastic surgeons. So somewhere between 72 hours to five days is what we leave our infix on for. And I say these, okay. these are guidelines, like we try and get 72, we, we just certainly don't get there all the time. But I thought it was quite a good example of uh, a soft tissue actually where an infix is probably better than an external fixation. And uh, if you can see your entry point, I think you can pretty much nail in whatever position you want to. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, less severe soft tissue injuries, I've, I've talked to Mike Kelly about this. What do you think in terms of like a, a, a minor grade two or ones, where you're going to go in, you could plate it, you could plan to leave the plate, maybe some unicortical screws that you could still let you drop a nail in there. Is that something you do or is it is it routine for you to want to take that nail out on a second look? Um, I wouldn't. I think certainly a plate is a brilliant to, uh, adjunct to some plating and some of the cases that you show, that's what I would do. I wouldn't now, though, leave my original plate that I put in. So I'm going to plan my plate that's going to be helpful for my nail but at my time of definitive fixation, that plate's going to come out and I'll probably put a clean one, maybe back through the same holes. When I first started practice, like I left them in and then you're always really worried, especially if they have to go back to theatre because of a sub flap abscess, that it's, uh, it's your original dirty plate. So I, my dirty infix is always going to get changed. Yeah, I'm always doing the same with a grade three, but with a one or a two, never quite sure whether I should uh, clean it, close the wound and consider leaving it. Right. Well, speaking of uh, uh, Mike Kelly, uh, this is a uh, 50 year old gentleman. Uh, he's smoker. He's unemployed. He has a 3B that uh, actually goes somewhere else, which is unusual for us. Uh, and they X fix it and it comes to us. So uh, I've said that my, my preference is always a nail. Um, I kind of like try and nail everything. Even for me, this is a bit too distal with a big intra-articular segment. So my plan is to, to orif this. Plastic surgeons, it's easy for them this time. They just need an ALT. So I take him to theatre and uh, my strategy, his wound's on the, on the medial side, so I'm going to plate the medial side. And I don't think a medial plate's going to be quite enough. So through, uh, through his good soft tissues, I decide to plate the fibula. Despite doing that, though, it still remains really, really unstable because of this separate fragment here. So this is completely loose um, and, it, and it's come out. And every time uh, we, I take it out, even with medial and lateral plates, I, I can't get the stability and, and I know it's going to fail. So the, the paper from Mike Kelly in Bristol is about keeping devitalized de but um, important cortical bone. You can see this is the loose segment here. And I say this has been completely out. It's been out, it's thoroughly washed, and for stability, I've had to put it back in. Now, we have to go back, remember our patient, he's smoking, he's not working, and uh, despite all of those things, that actually is one of the quickest open tibias I, I've ever uh, got to heal. So I think there is a place. I'm not saying that all tiny bits of loose bone should be kept. They're not. They're anitis for infection, but for very important cortical bone segments which actually confer a lot to your stability one could argue that actually they're probably as important as articular fragments and shouldn't just go in, in the bin without thought whether they could help so i thought that was a, a good one to, to prove that um Can what I, about the the panel uh is anyone else keeping the bone in open fractures no <laughs> may i make a comment <laughs> can we return to the previous slide please uh, the first slides the uh, pre-op pre slides. Yeah, that, that was it. Yes. Um, when uh, I evaluate the patient and the radiogram, I uh, want 
to know that what is the main side of instability, what is the most comminuted part, and where should we, uh, where should we uh, put a buttress plate? The distal part went on to valgus, and there is also a translation into the lateral side. So, and the medial side looks uh, great. And you said that the sequestrated fragment is the, on the lateral side. So, uh, by reducing the medial side and uh, removing the lateral uh, uh, sequestrated segment by anterior lateral plating, I will. Uh, prefer anterior lateral plating to support uh, this and you can also put some antibiotic cement beads and after the infection results you can also bone graft a absolutely if this was a, a closed injury that's exactly where the plate needs to be because it's failed in valgus the, the problem is is that where his wound is 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 where this has come out here uh, and the plastic surgeons look at me and they're like, mm -mm, you're not making any more incisions up the tibia because their only option they've got is to put their flap on the medial side. They're going to anastomose that with the, the PT. So you, my plating, I agree, mechanically was not right. But as we've heard before from the plateau lecture, the soft tissues are the most important and I've got to get the coverage first. So, so that's why. Then I will prefer uh, a supportive uh, external fixator from the lateral side, maybe one shunt spin uh, below the fracture and one or two shunt spin above the fracture. Yes. And remove the sequestrated segment. Good thoughts. All right. So um, I don't say keep all the bone, but sometimes uh, there is some bone that's actually going to help. Um, I think I'm now on about my sixth open fracture where I've uh, kept bone that previously I would have taken out. None of them have got infected. They're all three Bs and the bones incorporated in all of them. So uh, as Mike Kelly is my old boss, uh, I think he's probably right. We saw with the plateaus how they fall into the young high energy um, and then the elderly bone failure and, and open fractures are obviously the same. So this is now the other end of the spectrum. She's got an 82-year-old lady, she's on steroids, she's an insulin-controlled diabetic, and she has a, a 3B open fracture. So with a patient like that, uh, again, a, a huge uh, wound, who would even try or who would say, you know, you're better off, love, with one operation and it's going to be a baloney amputation? I, I would personally give her an option of what you did just now, rather than in, it's more like a supercutaneous plating, the plate could actually be outside and give her an option. Uh, you just said 3B, right? It wasn't really a C, B. Not C. Okay. So do, I think an option, like you can totally put a plate outside rather than an external fixator, which is much more cumbersome. And uh, if the wounds are well enough, uh, I've seen some patients, Patients actually are able to actually walk with it if it's well done. Yeah, that would be a good option. That's that would be my approach for this. Is there anyone who's for primary amputation? Eighty-two-year-old steroids, insulin. Yeah, not for no me chance. either. I, it's a it's an easier surgical operation. It certainly requires less thought. But she's never going to mobilize. She's probably in the NHS, actually never going to get out of hospital. So for me, an amputation in this age is pretty much a death sentence. So I thought, well, let's have a have a look. So she goes to theatre for her debridement to infix again uh, so that she's not having to have external fixation, temporarily bridging a knee. Obviously, she's got sort of old lady tissues at the top. And this is her, her defect here. Now, as you get a bit elderly, the uh, plastic surgeons, they will more than happily try and do a free tissue transfer, but usually the quality of the vessels are not up to it. So the plastic surgeons say to me, this lady cannot have a free tissue transfer. Is there anything else we can do? So I'm a bit worried about putting a plate there if I know that it can't be covered. Anyone got some thoughts now? Was a rotation. Okay, go ahead. 
in these patients, sometimes uh, she is an elderly lady, and we have a big uh, soft tissue defect, and also the uh, bone is uh, comminuted. Uh, deliberately, I acute shorten the bone. It increases the stability, also it decreases the size of the soft tissue defects. Maybe by controlling the uh, oxygenation of the distal part, uh, we should try. And then we could fix it by uh, this type of plating or external fixation. And you, you did the right thing, I think. Wow. I'm never going to present cases that have gone well. I'm not going to learn anything from that. Um, so that's what I thought we'd do. We would shorten her. That makes the soft tissues a little bit better. And the plastic surgeons can do something local with a bit of grafting. Uh, and I thought I would use a, a nail plate construct because essentially we've got a proximal one tip table fracture. They're very unstable. So I'll drop a, a nail down that as well because I've said she uh, is not going to tolerate an amputation. So my absolute goal for an 82 year old is to get her to walk on this. And I'm not convinced with a single plate that I'm going to let her weight bear. And I don't believe you can do partial weight bear. She's either not weight bearing or she's going to have to fully weight bear to live. So my plan was to drop a nail down, um, super patella, um, I say for approximately one third, left that plate on, put that anterior. And, and I'm you know, feeling that this is a good outcome. But you can see why I had a, a fairly upsetting case Um I only ever saw her sat down and she seemed like a normal size lady to me. However, she wasn't. She was quite short. And when I shortened her even more, she was a little bit too short for our shortest tibial nail. And that's a, a straight humeral nail that we've had to drop down there. She's done absolutely fine. She's kept her leg and she's more than happy with her, with her shoe raise. So my big learning point is exactly as you said. I think shortening is super useful in the elderly but perhaps that first lets you get an AO about pre-op planning, I could have used a bit better then. Okay, any, any other questions on that case? So in my country, you know, the, where the average height of ladies it may, may be just about under five, we are often faced with situations when even in fresh cases, we are you, I mean, forced to use humeral nails for the tibia. Because such short nails, tw 22 and 26 and 28 don't come for tibia. So we've been using these quite frequently. It was absolutely fine. My problem was the fact that I'd already made the um, super patella uh, approach. And I'm trying to protect her soft tissues. So it was quite challenging to put a humeral nail in from a super patella point of view, because obviously the jig's not long enough. So we, we ended up just having to put it on the put it in on the extraction device and then just did all, all the locking freehand. Um, anyway, so I, I wish that I'd considered that. So I've learned that if you are shortening, you know, uh, got to have the, the right kit available. If you had the Midas Rex, you could have cut the distal portion as well of a tibial nail. OK, yes. Uh, yeah, I've never done that, but uh, I know some of my colleagues have. I think I'd struggle with that. Uh, so we've got an 81 year old now who's uh, on long term steroids for um, airways disease. Again, she just falls over in her own home. She has a 3B tibia and that's her, her fracture. So we're, we're right down the other end, something we see uh, a lot. Um, and these are her post debridement um, films. And again, especially because it's now distal, there's no local option and she certainly can't have a free tissue transfer. So this is a slightly easier amputation. Anyone for amputation here? I think we should give her a chance uh, to, to spare the, uh, her limp. Uh, I would go for, uh, in this particular uh, fracture type, for anteroliteral plating because uh, as far as I can see, there is a huge medial soft tissue defect over there. Maybe some shortening also uh, to cover uh, the medial side. Maybe uh, after that, put her in a vac uh, if the plastics uh, 
does not do not want to interfere uh, with the management of the patient. But before doing uh, this kind of management, I, I probably will have a long talk with the patient or the family uh, for the secondary uh, procedure of below knee amputation. <sighs> Yeah, she's she's super high risk. NHS patients are usually fairly compliant and will say, look, whatever you think is best, doc. And it's not that the plastic surgeons, you know, don't want to be involved. It's just they, they have nothing they can do to help this lady. So that's what I thought. I thought we should try and give her a chance. We're not losing anything if we have to amputate later on. But again, because I can't yeah. get soft tissue coverage, I'm really worried about any subcutaneous plates on the tibia. They are at some point, vac or not, going to become exposed. So I thought, well, see if we can nail her and then we can be a bit safer to apply our back. But of course, nailing her is difficult because we've got no, uh, not really any uh, distal tibia in which to, to lock our nail. So um, Bob Handley in Oxford has described this technique um, and you can nail quite well, normal tibial nail, purposely put it through the plafond, try and shorten to get the tibial shaft just to sort of invaginate into the metaphysis there and lock it into the talus. I've used the Synthes uh, angular stable locking screws to try and get a little bit more purchase in the soft bone. And um, actually, uh, it did fine. She had her back uh, and she's uh, been in hospital pretty much uh, every Christmas since with her recurrent chest infections. But a tibia has gone on to unite infection free, which is a, a bit lucky, if I'm honest. Uh, I think. I have, this, uh, sorry, I have no, experience with. Uh, I have experience with that kind of uh, expert tibial nail uh, with this kind of ankle for ankle fusion, and uh, all my patients have broken nail at the distal locking hole. Uh, do you experience the same uh, thing with this kind of? Uh, ankle fusion with this type of nail? I, I haven't seen that, but I mean, this lady, she hard, she hardly walks. It's really just standing on the leg, really, to go from bed to chair. And uh, I think if, if you're doing any more than that, that's probably a risk. Uh, yeah, uh, after I experiencing that uh, nail uh, failure, nowadays I just try to switch that. I would put a retrograde nail from the calcaneus uh, to go upside because those kind of nails are much more durable than when you uh, compare with the tibial nails. So um, would you put a tibial, you mean a tibial nail in from the bottom or a hind foot nail in from the calcaneum? Yeah, hi hind foot nail. I have to admit, I've had more problems with the, those, the hind foot nails, which is why I went from the top with this. Um, and the problems I've had with the hind foot nails is all the screws seem to back out in the calcaneum. Even the the striker uh, nail, which is slightly offset, you still have a problem with those posterior screws. You don't get much purchase unless you go into the calcaneo cubal joint. I found that the wound on the, on the heel often breaks down, but the, the worst I've had is quite a few uh, uh, peri-implant fractures at the top of that nail. The advantage, I think, though, for that is that if she does come to a baloney amputation, which was obviously in this case a very, very high risk, then if you've done a hind foot nail, you haven't really scuppered your BKA. And I was worried if this didn't work, if she ends up with a BKA, I've made things worse if I've seeded an infection up her into medullary canal. Um, if you are going to do this, even in her, perforating the plafond can be quite difficult. So we found using a long um, Elizabeth wire just to puncture through to get into the talus uh, can be a good strategy if you can't get your ball tip guide wire to go. Anyway, better to be lucky than good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, think I, say, I, I forgot to start my timer, so do let me know when I, I should stop. I've just got two more cases. So... 32-year-old gentleman, um, he had a closed tailor navicular dislocation on one side and an open tailor, uh, tailor extrusion on the other, and there was no fracture. So I was very pleased. I was thinking this is going to be a soft tissue problem only. So his talus is dirty, like really, really dirty. Um, uh, and he went to theatre, obviously, to have this cleaned and reduced and an external fixator applied. 
it remained dirty. So he had sequential debridements. He grew a lot of different type of bugs, anaerobes, gram negatives, and he remained with nasty looking soft tissues until somebody took his talus off out and sent me a photograph and said, well, we've taken the talus out. What, what do we do now? So um, what, uh, does the panel have any thoughts about what to do? The talus is now in the bin. Don't put again. <laughs> <laughs> I will put a uh, temporary external fixator uh, to control infection. And when I think it's okay, we can do uh, tibiocalcaneal fusion. And if there is a plantar sensation and we don't want to uh, decrease the height of the patient, you can uh, make a segmental bone transport uh, to uh, not to uh, shorten the patient and you can it's also safe for an infected patient and you can achieve a very good uh, tibiocalcaneal infusion definitely so uh, i think the first thing uh, was to to stick to principles and to get rid of the infection um, i think the safest way to do that exactly as you said is, is external fixation so these are just uh, cement beads with some added vancomycin, some gentamicin, palacost, and it has X-fix. And he really stays in that until his soft tissues are pristine. With the cases like this, we like the patients to have one sort of unnecessary return to theatre when we go and have a look and actually no more debridement or no more cleanings to be. And then we know we're sort of safe to proceed. Um, and we talked about options. That was definitely really high up for all the reasons you said. Uh, it's safe from an infection point of view. And arthrodes is uh, tibia one to his calcaneum. And I was going to lengthen him with a proximal corticotomy at the same time. It was going to help encourage the fusion to heal. Uh, however, I, I'd uh, been somewhere recently and he's a young guy. He's like, oh, I'm not sure if I want the frame on. I mean, nobody ever wants a frame. But he said, are there any other options? Um, so what I thought we could perhaps do is 3D print him something to try and uh, stop him having a frame. And he said he would prefer to, to have this option. He was actually a very well motivated patient and he could weigh out the pros and cons himself. So again, at the same time as definitive soft tissue coverage, that's a, an ALT. It's a good fasciocutaneous flap. We had a, a 3D printed uh, implant made with, with a jig. Uh, it's got an articular uh, sort of bearing for his talonavicular joint. Um, I thought about, uh, I know some of my colleagues in Africa have done a, just a talus, but I thought because he's lost so many soft tissues, I didn't think I'd get any stability and I would worry there'd be nothing to hold it there. So uh, I went for uh, this implant where you can put a, a hind foot nail up through it I was nervous, if I'm honest, he was really infected. That is a lot of metal work. If that gets infected, then um, I think he is looking at a BKA. We've supplemented that with the bone graft, also using the rear. And I have put local antibiotics in this time in the form of Ceramant G to, to cover all of the trabecular metal. And uh, this is him now. Uh, everything's healed. He's fully weight bearing and he's now at the stage where he's going to have his ART uh, cosmetically debulked uh, because he's back to, to doing what he wants to do. I don't know. I did I do the right thing or should I have done a frame? You did an excellent thing looking at the outcome. <laughs> uh, may I make a comment? Mm. Uh, the, the distal uh, screws, the calcaneal screws are bent a little bit. Yeah, well, they've now so, broken, actually. Ah, broken. Um, in this cage type uh, non-unions, when you put a cage and put some bone graft, uh, most authors um, evaluate the fracture healing by taking CT cuts. Uh, what is your opinion about uh, I hadn't thought about that, to be honest. I think he's he's actually now quite far down the line. So he's two years. Both his screws broke at about eight weeks. 
um, and speaking to some of my colleagues who's done some more of these, that's not uncommon that they break. And I, I think that he must have some degree of fusion because as time has gone on, nothing has changed out on his x-ray. Um, I hadn't thought about CTing. I think it's a great idea. I think I should do that to see um, you know, how much union he's got. Okay. I've got one of these distal femur coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm interested in uh, whether or not you think a debridement, another debridement, you know, at what point are you happy to put the metal in in someone that's got a known, you know, bad dead organisms in there? How much debridement do we need? So when you've had, uh, say, a trip to theatre, when you've done no debridement, then we'll say we're happy on our next sitting to go for it. With the really muck, mucky ones, I, I know the experience from the bone infection unit in Oxford is that they'll try and do everything as a single stage. But I think if you are putting a huge amount of metal work in, you've got to be as sure as you can be. Hence the ceremony as well, which I think is good. Or um, some of my colleagues are, are coating plates, as one of you mentioned, with some vancomycin powder. I've got one last case. Sorry, Jane, um, I have to stop you because we're running no a bit problem. late. I hope you don't mind. No. Thank you very much for a very impressive presentation. So now we have Dr. Khairul Mohammed from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He'll talk on the distal tibial intraarticular fractures. Khairul, up to you. Any issues? You're muted, Chairo. I will unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, he's up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, excellent. Okay. So what I'm going to do is... Um, okay, let me get this thing sorted out first. Okay, we're going to be talking about uh, distal tibia and triarticular fractures. And it's going to be divided into, into three main segments uh, in which I'll talk about uh, surgical approach strategies and this sort of uh, concept of a periosteal window. Uh, we'll have cases with regards to that. Uh, we'll talk about this sort of strategic implant constructs uh, based on fracture displacements, which we've lightly touched about on, 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 on Jane's cases. Uh, and then we'll uh, bring up the idea of this sort of joint stability from uh, joint containment and ligament stability uh, to prevent post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So as the first part, we'll talk about these sort of approaches and a balanced mechanical construct. We'll probably go through this and then, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, uh, case one, uh, 41 year old with a C-type fracture. You can see that severely comminuted C-type um, uh, fibula is intact. So that's probably the, 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 the thing to look at. So this is probably an axial uh, sort of injury. Uh, mainstay of treatment for all the trainees out there that, that CTs are, are pr practically mandatory in these sort of situations uh, to look at the, the articular surface. And if we, if we take that sort of yellow line there that you, that you can see, and we look at the, 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 the cuts, we can actually see the articular surface there. And the, I think the most important thing from, from, from this, this, uh, this view is actually to see the, the two impacted uh, pieces which are in, within the actual fracture site itself. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, when we have all of this information, what's the choice of surgical approaches uh, which, which uh, we have? Okay, so if we take this segment itself and if we, if we have a look at it, well, the most logical one would, would, would be um, looking at a, a direct anterior approach. So we have from this is uh, soft tissue, which is the skin. We have the fat. Uh, we have a layer of, uh, of fascia, 
that we have the blood vessels and we have the periosteum. So if we look at this from, a, from an anterior aspect, we're actually going straight down to the, into the fracture site and we can actually look at the, the impacted, uh, impacted piece, okay? And that's how it'll look like if, if we're actually doing this sort of anterior approach. Okay, a direct visualization uh, without much um, without much uh, uh, problem to the uh, to the periosteum. Okay. Now, traditionally, if we were to use the sort of anterior medial approach, which is which is classical in a lot of these sort of uh, uh, tibial plafond sort of fractures, we're actually going through the the anterior medial aspect. We're lifting through the the sort of uh, blood vessels. And this increases the risk of flap necrosis. So if we, if we look at it from this perspective, uh, we can actually see that there's a large comparison here. Uh, and if, if, sorry. Okay, so this is, this is bringing the idea of this sort of periosteal window. So if we're looking directly at, uh, through the, the, the fracture, direct at the fracture itself, then we're actually leaving a, a smaller periosteal window com in comparison to the posterior medial aspect. Okay, and in this sort of periosteal window, we don't need to, to devascularize the, the, the bone because less periosteal stripping will, will be required. Okay, so in these sort of situations, we can actually put an, a sort of epiperiosteal plate in this sort of position, and that again reduces the sort of vascularity. So in this patient, you can see that we've, we've done it through a small incision. Uh, uh, allowing us to actually look at the, the, the uh, articular surface, the impacted fragment, uh, reduce the fracture percutaneously. We can actually see that, okay? So what's, what's uh, highlighted here is that small periosteal window, which was, dis which was developed by the actual fracture itself, and the application of the plate on the, with, on the periosteum to actually help uh, prevent any more uh, um, vascular insult to, to this sort of injury. We can further close the 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 uh, the, the retinaculum and and the tendons, and and that that should theoretically improve the vascularity. So to these sort of situations. So as a comparison, we've we've had this this sort of case where the, a large periosteal window uh, was uh, was developed because of the nature of the injury, and a subperiosteal conventional plate was used. Okay, so in these sort of situations, theoretically, a larger area of avascular bone was, was actually exposed. Yeah, and, and therefore, yes, you can see a larger, uh, larger area of the bone because you need to facilitate the, 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 the placement of a conventional plate. But we need to know that that actually devascularizes the bone even more. Okay, so in this case, we have a 31-year-old with a C-type fracture uh, who was involved in a polytrauma. I haven't included all the other uh, radiographs, and he's a drug abuser. You can see that it's severely comminuted. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a large comminution anteriorly. The fibula is intact again. So this is a lot. This is a very severe sort of injury, and it's actually loaded. Okay, this is the the sort of periosteal window that was developed from the uh, from the uh, injury itself. Uh, because there's a large medial, uh, medial uh, comminuted area, a plate was actually applied on the medial aspect. You can see the, the temporary K wires there. And this was the fixation. Yeah, so not bad. But the question is, was this periosteal window just too big uh, to allow proper healing or a coverage of the bone and also the healing of the, of the soft tissue? And, you know, at 40 days, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is what we got. So, you know, it's, 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 it's something to think about because one of the problems when, when, with regards to, to pylon fractures is, you know, what is the actual approach that we, that we need to do when it comes to assessing the most important part, which is uh, the, the, the articular surface. Okay, this is, a, this is another case. We've got a 57-year-old with a C-type frac uh, uh, fracture of the pylon. Now this this involves the the the, the fibula as well. Uh, the the fibula is 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 pretty much a, a, a simple sort of fracture, so that can be done probably through an open reduction and internal fixation. Uh, the metaphyseal region of the of the distal tibia is is uh, comminuted, so we can probably do that via medial uh, uh, minimally invasive approach. And if we look at the medial malleolus, now this is this is something that 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 we probably need more more investigations with. 
and that's the CT that, that 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 was done. We can see that the medial malleolus is 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 elevated. Is the shearing forces, and there's possibly uh, an, an articular involvement as well. Okay, so we can probably do a, a, a limited, uh, uh, what we call a limited open reduction internal fixation. Okay, so what we did was we actually slid a plate on on the on the on the medial side. Yeah, we can see that that plate uh, slid on the medial side with a little hook, a little ear at the at the distal end. We actually developed the plane anteriorly, and we can see the uh, reduced the, uh, the depressed articular fracture on on the medial side, uh, and then put in the, the the screws. The the fixation on the on the fibula was done through a conventional open reduction and internal fixation. Yep. So because the, the incisions are on both sides, both medial and lateral, so therefore this, the, there's, there's no conflict in terms of the distance between these, these two incisions. Okay, so that's, that's the end result of, of, of this, this patient uh, eight months down the line, and that went on to healing pretty well. Now, now the question is: we, we've 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 addressed some of the issues of, of incisions of how uh, when we're addressing the, the the sort of articular surface. Now, how do we actually add that on to the incision if we're going to think of using a longer plate to 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 fix the sort of uh, seat? Uh, we've converted it to an A-type fracture now, and we want to com connect the the articular block to the to the metaphysis and the diaphysis. So the question is, how are we going to, or what sort of incisions do we need to use? So I think this depends on the initial uh, failure mechanism. Uh, we need to look at tailored displacement patterns, and I and I think it's very important as well to uh, to think about the, the the fibula fracture configuration. Okay, and then the implants that can be used. It's, it's very important to remember in closed cases, like Jane mentioned, that in, in these sort of cases, we need to apply the plates uh, on the area where we want to buttress the initial uh, injury mechanism. So, for instance, we've got a, 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 a case down here which shows a, a, a pylon fracture which has failed in compression. So, therefore, the, the area where we need to concentrate on is on the lateral or anterolateral side. Uh, so therefore, if in this example, we can see that the, the plates, the fibula was, was fixed, the buttressing was done on the anterolateral aspect, uh, and then me uh, immediately that was fixed percutaneously. Another thing that I think is very important is actually to look at the lateral view because the talus can also be displaced both anteriorly and posteriorly. So, so this actually helps us in terms of, of, of going whether we're going to be placing the plates both anteriorly or posteriorly. So in this case, we can see here that um, the, uh, the talus has actually displaced posteriorly. So the main area of buttressing will, will, will need to be on, on the, on the uh, posterior aspect. So because uh, the, the, the sort of, um, this, that's something that, that, that we really need to think about. Now, what I'm bringing here is, is, is case number four. So we've, we've, we know that this is a tension failure uh, injury. Uh, it's gone into, into, uh, into varus. And here we have a list of the, the sort of surgical approaches. Now we can see that the fibula is comminuted and, and, and that can be approached theoretically if it's, that's alone through a lateral approach. Okay, uh, the medial malleolus is displaced and sheared up. That traditionally goes through a medial approach. Um, the articular surface can be uh, addressed through an anteromedial approach. Now the question is in, in these sort of situations, if we look at this diagram, can we actually do all these sort of incisions um, uh, to fix this? And th there will be conflicts because the, the, the incisions are too close, the skin bridges uh, are, are too small, and we will definitely get skin necrosis. So, so what we need to think about is when we're actually doing this, okay, we can do a minimally invasive approach for the, for the fibula through a small incision. Okay, we can go through an anteromedial approach to assess the articular surface. Uh, and then also slide the, the medial plate from that and develop the, the plane using the, 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 the plate. And because the importance of, if we look at the original x-rays, the importance is that the buttress needs to be on the medial side. So that, that needs to be stressed. And uh, the, the screws can be, can be actually put in percutaneously. 
Now we go to the uh, another form of, of, of injury. This is a compression failure sort of uh, pylon fracture where there's a valgus deformity. So if you look at the individually these, these sort of fractures, uh, we have uh, lat the, um, the fibula can be approached through an open reduction internal fixation uh, through a, a standard lateral approach. If it was if that was the only fracture there. Okay, the, the medial malleolus, again, through a medial approach. The articular surface, in this, in this case, we can see there's, there's a large anterolateral piece, so that can, do, that can go through an anterolateral approach. And when we put all of these together again, you know, we can see that the, the, the skin bridges for, for both the anterolateral and the lateral approach will be a bit too close to, to, to each other. Um, so, you know, what are we, what are we thinking? So this is what was done. We know that the, the uh, anterolateral plate was, is, is primary thing to actually help reduce the, the sort of fracture. And that needs to be put in inside the, inside this, uh, uh, on the anterolateral aspect. Uh, the fibula actually can be approached through uh, a, a direct lateral approach. And if we look at the anterolateral and the lateral approach in these sort of situations, the, the, the sort of uh, distance between it uh, is, is actually quite far. Uh, so, so we can actually use both of these, 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 these sort of incisions. And the medial malleolus can be approached through the, uh, basically through a, a, a percutaneous uh, uh, incision. Okay. Now, this is, this is something, something else because this is, this is a posterior uh, displacement of the talus. Uh, I don't have the, the, I didn't put up the, the, anterior, uh, the APs, but we can see here that there's a posterior lateral uh, malleolar fracture. There's a displaced um, uh, fibula fracture and, and this sort of posterior malleolus goes, goes quite high up. So traditionally, again, fibula is through lateral uh, the posterior malleolus or, or the large fragment there is through a posterior lateral approach. These two incisions are definitely too close to each other. And, and in these sort of situations, we can actually go through one standard posterior lateral approach. Okay, therefore you need to readjust the placement of your, of your fibula plate, which will go uh, uh, posteriorly. Now the main buttressing on, on these sort of uh, cases is on the posterior aspect because that's where we don't want the talus to go. So that's where we put the plate on the, on the, on the posterior lateral aspect. You can see here that the, there are actually two plates put on the uh, uh, posterior malleolus there. And this is an anterior column failure where the, the talus has actually displaced anteriorly. Uh, we can see that the fibula is also fractured and then you also have a vertical shear sort of uh, uh, injury of the medial malleolus. So if we go through one by one again, standardly, uh, these are the possible incisions that, that we would list down that we would do for each of these sort of, of fractures. Okay, so we've got four there. Uh, and if we're going to resolve the, these sort of injuries, uh, by putting this, we know that it's an anterior displacement. So the main, the main uh, buttressing will be anteriorly. So the fibula can be reduced through a, a standard sort of uh, uh, lateral approach, uh, or sort of uh, a minimally invasive approach. Uh, the medial malleolus, again, you can, you can slide uh, the, the plate through the medial side. And a standard anterolateral approach to, uh, to, to put in the sort of rim plate and also slide the, 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 uh, the buttressing plate. Uh, can also be applied. So in these sort of situations, you can actually prevent or, or, or resolve some of the conflicts and hopefully the skin bridges are, are, are large enough. Any questions at the moment? Uh, anything that you'll, you'll, you'll do differently in, the, in these sort of situations? Ayazi, can I ask you? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, when, when you were mentioning about all the cases and all that, uh, just uh, curious to find out regarding the a uh, soft tissue component of it. I'm talking about ligament injuries that you may actually encounter. I'm sure it cannot be without one. Yeah. Do you address them directly or do you come back for it another day? Another day. Okay. Okay. Can I can I hold on to that question and then and then answer it during the last segment of my yeah. of, of my yeah. talk? Okay. All right. So um, if we go on to the next part, uh, what, what I want to discuss about some of the strategies uh, that I employ for, for these sort of articular uh, fracture reconstructions. Um, 
see, we can, we can see here that, uh, again, we have a, a 54 year old with a type, uh, three, uh, C3 close fracture. You can see it's in, in, in varus. The fibula is, again is, is also fractured. And on the lateral view, there's probably not, not much displacement of the talus either anteriorly or posteriorly. Now, this is, this is as the patient comes in three months down the line where, when it's been done somewhere else. These, these are sort of the chronology of things. Um, you know, percutaneous wires to the medial aspect, an AP screw to fix the posterior malleolus, uh, an intramedullary sort of fibula uh, uh, fixation. And you can see the patient's in a cast with, with uh, some wires to help distract uh, the, the actual fracture. Uh, yeah, I think everybody's uh, sighing now. You know, we're, we're, we've got six months down the line. Uh, we can see that that it's it's some of the implants have been removed. Uh, there's some healing, and at at 13 months the line, uh, down the line, this is what we get. Okay, so you know, is is this a good result? Uh, I mean, if we look at it from a from a perspective that there's no infection and there's no non-union, and then yes, it's it's, it's a good result. But this is just bad luck uh, because uh, it's it's a it's a bad injury or from a uh, uh, fr you know is is it just poor technique or is it a poor performance of a good technique? I mean I, I'm I'm of the opinion that this is probably a, a poor performance and and this is a, a very poor technique. So this patient actually came in, um, you know we we had the CT scans done. We can see a large defect. It's elevated. Posterior mal uh, ma uh, malleolus is 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 mal united in that sort of position, and you know he came in actually for, uh, to to have the uh, uh, basically an intraarticular osteotomy to get that thing sorted out. Now, if we if we look at these these sort of situations, then this this is some of the sort of fixation strategies uh, that that I would employ. Um, in 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 the in the first in the first aspect, you know, uh, we need to disimpact the central uh, the the central fragment uh, to the posterior lateral fragment. And if we think of the the sort of tibial plafond as a, as a large circle, if we go through this by fixing the, the impacted piece onto the postural lateral fragment. And then you can hopefully derotate that and then fix the, uh, um, uh, the medial fragment to the postural lateral fragment, and then uh, go on from the medial fragment to the impacted fragment, and then close off the, the, close off the articular surface with the anterolateral block. Now, sorry. Go back one slide. Okay, so this is another uh, uh, thing that can help us. If once we've fixed the, the, these, these sort of fragments, we can actually use the fibula once it's actually been fixed. We can actually fix the, temporarily put in some K wires from the, uh, from the fibula to the postural lateral fragment, and that'll help it from actually moving. And this, this will help us actually reconstruct the articular block. Another thing, once that's been done, we can actually fix that posterior lateral uh, uh, fragment with some KYs from, uh, from, with some screws or KYs from anteriorly that will fix the, that piece to the, to the sort of uh, anterior tibia. And then subsequently, we can put the, the wires from, from medial to lateral and then, and then go on with the, with the, with the, uh, to complete the full circle of the, of the plafond. Okay. Uh, does anybody do it in any other way other than this? Uh, Kairul, just one question. Like sure. uh, you, you said, you said pinning the uh, workman's fragment to the fibula. Do we do it in all cases because uh, uh, the workman's fragment is often a constant fragment? Uh, yes. In virtue of attachment to his ligaments. Yes, so, correct. Like, yes. You, it's I, it's so it's, it's in all it's, cases. No, it's 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 te it's it's temporary, really, to to actually get the articular block together. So if we're going through um, if we're going through a, a sort of postural lateral approach, then then we can actually see how that relates to 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 the to the fibula and also the the the, the level of the syndesmosis. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I I do it, but like when uh, when the tibia fibular uh, uh, relationship, sorry, uh, is disturbed at the by rupture of the postural lateral ligaments. Otherwise, yes. like uh, I treat as a constant fragment and then go again building upon that. Correct. Yes. Correct. Exactly. So that 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 brings us quite nicely to 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 the the, the final segment of 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 our talk, um, and um, you know. 
we if we've done such a great job with the articular congruency, I, I think that a, a stable ankle joint is actually articular congruency plus intact ligaments. Okay, so this is this is the the, the sort of heading of of this. So you know we we've we've had these sort of cases. You know we had very bad pylon fractures. You can see that the the uh, the, the the talus is actually displaced anteriorly. Uh, we can see you know uh, severely comminuted intraarticular fracture, and and this is what was done. We've adhered to all the ideas that I've mentioned in in part one and part two, and I'm looking at the articular surface, and I'm pretty pleased with myself. You know uh, I've I've reconstructed that um, to be a bit. Um, to be a bit uh, critical about myself, then I, I would think that if you can see here that at the anterior joint line, the space is slightly smaller than, than, than the posterior. So, uh, you know, it, it, does that mean that my, my joint is, is incongruent? Now, we, we can actually draw the lateral talus station and the uh, distal tibia articular axis, uh, distal tibia axis, um, and, and we can see that the, the, the talus station is, is slightly anterior. And this, this will only mean that the talus is actually uh, uh, sublux anteriorly, okay? And, 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 you know, I thought, well, is, is this, is this, does this mean much? This is what we got later on, you know? Uh, so this is probably some of the things that I, I've, been, I've been blaming on, you know, poor injury before. But I think that the, 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 the articular congruency or, or the sort of bony congruency is good, but then there must be something else that, that I'm forgetting. Okay, uh, here's another case. We can see that the talus is actually displaced anteriorly, severe comminution, large uh, impacted intraarticular piece. Uh, again, we've, we've followed this sort of principles. We've buttressed it medially. We've buttressed it anteriorly. And we can see that the talus, again, is, is, is under, uh, under the, the, the plafond quite nicely. We draw the, the talus station. We draw the distal tibial axis, and it's anterior. Yeah. And this is what we're developing. You know, uh, this this probably increases uh, joint reaction forces and contact pressures within the ankle, and will probably develop um, uh, uh, osteoarthritis of the ankle. Okay. Now, this is this is just a, a drawing of the distal tibial axis and the Taylor station. We can see that the the, the distal tibial axis DTA actually goes through the the Taylor station. And this is this is good to know because it bisects it in 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 all all positions of the foot, either dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, or, or 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 neutral. And we can see if the if the if the drawings, if you have a pack system, then you can actually draw it. Uh, you can look at the the, the sort of uh, uh, um, uh, curvatures of the of the plafond and also the talus. And if if they're not within each other, then then there will be a displacement of of the of the talus itself. Now, how do we decide when the ligaments are, are, are injured or not in, in these sort of situations? Um, well, number one, it's, it's easy to say high index of suspicion because uh, that's, that's, that's probably the first thing that we need to know. We, we've, we've had so many talks today and they've talked about ligamentous injuries in the elbow. We've talked about ligamentous injuries uh, in, in, in tibial plafond fractures. And we also need to bring it to, to, to the ankles as well. And what's the, I mean, what's the value of preoperative MRIs? Uh, so, you know, these, this is something that, that we need to, to, to think about. Okay, so when one thing is actually to examine the patient after we've actually done the, 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 the bony congruency. So anterior drawers, posterior drawers of the, of the ankle immediately after you've actually fixed will actually help you. Okay, uh, the sort of tilt test is, is good to actually see uh, if, if, if there's gross instability, because in, in some of these situations, you're not actually exposing that, 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 uh, that, that particular area. Okay. And last and and last thing to 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 actually show is 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 to see whether uh, doing intraoperative ultrasounds uh, while while you're stressing it, because I think this is this is very important to uh, to to think about. It's it's pretty easy to be uh, to to be done, because if we if we're doing this, you can you can actually see that in an intact, uh, like say this is the calcaneal fibular ligament that we're doing, and you can see that there there will be some play there. Okay, but if 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 this was to be done in the in in the sort of uh, 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 laxed uh, uh, ligament, you can see there's a, there's a large excursion of the of the ligament itself. 
Okay, and not necessarily that the, that the ligament is 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 actually torn in these sort of situations. If it's severely elongated, then this will also affect the the, the stability of 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 the ankle postoperatively if it's not addressed. Okay, so we've had this 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 is the last case, uh, 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 forty one year old type C uh, fracture. You can see uh, this is this is basically the the, the perineal tendons, the fibulas uh, in in here. This is the fibula itself. This is the area of the calcaneal fibular ligament. This is the anterior talar fibular ligament. You can see that it's, they're both deficient there. Okay, this is the medial deltoid down here. You can see that's uh, absolutely smashed. So this is uh, a, a posture medial sort of approach. We've actually addressed the medial, uh, uh, posterior medial aspect of the medial malleolus with a, a anti-glide plate. Uh, these plates are pretty good because you can actually uh, parachute the, the the reconstruction of the of the of the medial deltoid through the plates as well, uh, so that helps in terms of the strength of the of the repair, and then that's the the final reconstruction of the ATFL and CFL. So in summary, I think it's very important that we need to formulate these sort of uh, uh, operative approaches based on our understanding of uh, failure patterns, uh, displacement of the talus, uh, and fibula involvement. And in addition to that, how we're going to bring uh, both the tibial articular surface and the metaphysis together. And this will also uh, provide us with, with some idea of how we're going to do a uh, uh, sort of balanced uh, mechanical construct. And I think this sort of limited direct uh, or open reduction internal fixation and with the idea of this sort of uh, uh, soft tissue friendly plate applications is very important to prevent any soft tissue complications. And last but not least, we need to remember of, of uh, examine for ligamentous instability after we've actually fixed the, uh, uh, the bones uh, anatomically. And if, if there are some laxities, then these need to be reconstructed. And I think uh, to answer Kuma's question, uh, I actually do that in all in one setting. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Stop uh, can I have a question? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, after making two or three incisions around the ankle, uh, do you have any special uh, wound care management uh, or do you get any help from incisional wax for something different? Uh, actually, when, 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 I, when I've adhered to those, when I, when I look, I, I usually start off by putting in all the traditional incisions first. Uh, and then when I've, when I've collected all the incisions that I would like to use, then I would, I would start minimizing to make sure that uh, I have um, an, an adequate skin bridge. And so far, you know, as, as long as w w one thing that I find is if we're uh, addressing the articular approach, if your incision is too proximal with a large peri uh, per uh, periosteal window, then the, the skin actually goes into necrosis. But so far with, with this sort of technique, I've been able to close all the, all the skin and, uh, and the soft tissue and, and so far not many problems. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have some practical tips for the timing of the fixation? Uh, only wrinkle signs or another? Story? Yeah, yeah. I, I, if if in in most situations, yeah, I didn't touch on 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 timing, but in most of the time when these patients come in, uh, I I usually put them on an external fixator. Uh, I, I, I distract it. My, the, the main goal of the distractor is actually to put the talus back underneath the plafond. So both on AP and lateral view, they should be, uh, the talus should be anatomically reduced. Uh, this will actually help me in terms of getting a CT after that, then I'll get a better view of, of the articular surface. Uh, and not to forget, uh, you know, the, the initial displacements. Then all of this information will actually help me in terms of uh, planning things out. In terms of when to actually do the definitive surgery, when 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 the when the soft tissues is 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 is, is better. Again, I, I agree with you. Uh, the wrinkle sinus is, is is enough for me to actually go back in. And, and Cairo, like uh, yes, at sir. the end of at the end of it, like if your lateral stellar station is slightly anterior, what do you do about it? So it's if your lateral stellar station is slightly anterior, what do yeah. you do about it? Yeah, I think I think then then that 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 what, what I mean uh, before closing up the patient or once once the uh, once uh, everything's been done you've closed up and the patient's gone back to the ward. No, before closing. 
before closing, yeah, I think in in those situations, uh, I'll I'll do all the the anterior drawers uh, uh, and tilt tests, um, get it under image def- intensification, see if it if it displaces or not, and and if it if it does, most I I would say the majority of the time the sensitivity of these sort of anterior drawers is is pretty high, because when I see these sort of chronic cases of instability, it does match with the with the with the MRI. Uh, so I would I would actually uh, extend my incisions. Um, uh, if if we're going posterolateral, lateral, that will be fairly easy because you can extend it anteriorly. You can bring the f- uh, the flap of skin anterior, which will allow you to to uh, to address both uh, calcaneal fibula and also uh, the anterior talar fibula ligament. Okay, can we move on to right, the? Yeah. Yep. Dr. Jamal? Jamal? Sir, unmute, unmute you. Yeah, we've got the last presentation by my friend from Japan, Dr. Yushi Watanabe. Yes. Can you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, complex tibia non-union and uh, good morning, uh, good evening, and good afternoon. <laughs> the, I, I, I bring the three cases. The first case is that uh, 22 years old, beautiful lady was hit and injured by a train and uh, proximal it shaft uh, tibia fractures. And uh, one year after uh, she was referred to our hospital and uh, he, she also has the pelvic fracture and the proximal femur fractures. The problem is the left femur, uh, left tibia. The problem list is a hypertrophic non-union, malangulation and probably a plastic deformation of our fibra. How would you treat this non-union? Someone? <laughs> Hi. May I comment? Yes. Uh, I will put an external fixator, uh, hmm. one pin proximally and one pin distally. Hmm. Move the, uh, if there isn't any uh, of course, torsional deformity. We we know that this is a various deformity, and in the lateral plane, it isn't so bad. So, a monoplane deformity, like. So, I prefer a fixator assisted nailing in this patient. And if the lateral side uh, callus prevents me to uh, correct, Yes. I will do an percutaneous osteotomy, and by reaming, I think the reaming material will fill up the medial side. But Dr. Okay. Hakan, the fibula seems to be maybe a hindrance to what you are saying. Would of you course, I, I will, I will uh, break the fibula to. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> break, I think it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, breaking the fibula will be good. <laughs> Uh, I use the uh, chipping technique. I think the chipping technique is not familiar to the most audience here. So let me explain the chipping technique. Now we uh, present uh, this technique in 2007, the cases uh, uh, of non-union with shortening and deformity. And uh, we put on the uh, external fixator on and uh, chip the non-union site and acute shortening and gradually elongations. This is a typical case. According to the uh, original technique, this case is remove the iron rod and place the external fixator pin and chipped and uh, realign and shortening and gradual lengthening and weight, but uh, uh, it takes uh, much time to uh, 
consolidation. So I used the, uh, during the chipping, during the surgery, I chipped the non-union side and the external fixator on and reinstall new IM load and take the external fixator off during the surgery and this time. During the surgery, external fixator on and I'm load reinstall. After surgery, a little bit uh, worse, but I think it's acceptable. Three months, almost heal. One month, healing and alignment is good. Yes. This is uh, the another case is uh, we are chipping technique. The tips of the uh, chip, our tipping technique is first the small skin incision, not the exposure to fracture site, and chip the bone with as little soft tissue splitting as uh, possible by using chisel or osteotomons. And uh, this uh, technique is sometimes can be uh, exchanged from uh, bone graft to the bone chipping. For example, this is a, this is a femur case, 25 years old male, and the segmental fractures, one year after the uh, oligotrophic non uh, Some Some surgeons use the uh, bone graft, but uh, this is another case. This is a chipping technique. After six months, uh, it, it has been healed without bone graft. In other cases, uh, we can use the, this technique uh, for uh, shortening. The, this, uh, the 41 years old male and uh, three, two or three years ago, he has the uh, injury and uh, four times he took, uh, he, he, he was took the operate but the uh, hypertrophic non-union with three centimeter shortening. I put the uh, external fixator on the IM load is installed and the chip the non-union side after gradual elongation and proximal locking. Four months, it was healed, one year. And our, the advantage of the chipping technique is two. The first, the acceleration of the fracture healing, and second, co collection of malalignment. Uh, I'd like to show the second case. The 65 years old, close but very unstable femur, uh, tibia fracture, uh, he were, uh, fell from the second floor of his own house. At the first hostel, the I'm nailing on the day of injury was done. What's the problems with this fixation and what will happen? Somebody? It is not nicely reduced in the lateral plane. Mm -hmm. Yes. Others? And also the fixation rigidity isn't uh, stable. Mm -hmm. We should maybe... Uh, put some additional blocking screws because this is a metaphysical fracture and the medullary canal is... Uh, <laughs> although there is one uh, screw from anterior to posterior side, I will not depend on this screw and put some uh, blocking screws. Mm. I agree. How about the uh, fibra fixation? Uh, Dr. Tornetta showed that uh, it isn't mandatory to fix all uh, fibular fractures, but most of the time uh, mm. for rotation and length, I uh, fix the fibula. To, uh, it helps, I think, uh, reduction of the tibia, but if we think that it will 
unite late or there, uh, we should need some revision. Maybe it is logical uh, not to fix the fibula unless there is a tibia fibular syndesmotic injury. Mm. Uh, uh, we know that the fixing the fibula uh, just increases the torsional strength. Yes, but we don't know. But we don't know that it adds something positive to the clinical outcome. Mm. <laughs> I think uh, in these cases, uh, they should uh, fix the fibra. It takes the fibra displaced and the uh, malangulations. Three months failed I'm nearly broken the lock screws proximal and distal and displaced. The problem listed, delayed union, malangulation, failure of screws. The revision <laughs> prayed and the bone graft was done. <laughs> Terrible. Nine months after from the injury, he was sent to us Nine months after he was referred to our hospital, uh, the problem listed oligotrophic non union, malangulation, failure of screws. Uh, the patient is a CEO of a small business. He has not been able to reintegrate it into society due to prolonged treatment and is experiencing psychological problems. How would you treat this non union? Is there any infection uh, symptoms? Fortunately, the, uh, he complained of the pain and he cannot uh, uh, put on the food, but there are no infection signs. It is our technique. Uh. <laughs> If you are good at if you are good at that, uh, the ring fix at doing ring fixators, yeah, you can do ring fixator. Yeah. But probably I would go for removing all the broken screws, all the metal hardware, yes. and uh, put some uh, uh, tissue for the cultures and <clears throat> for the frozen section. And if it is uh, infection free, yes. I would go for uh, I am nailing uh, without. Uh, uh, with a uh, bit rim nailing uh, and at least with three locking screws in the distal fragment uh, and maybe using polar screws or something like that. Yes, I agree. What about Taylor special with your chipping method? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, the chipping method is a key <laughs> phrase in our, my presentation today. Yeah. I, my strategy is uh, put on the uh, ring uh, at the distal fragment and uh, chip the fracture site and most uh, temporarily fix the external fixator and the real line and put on the uh, install the IM load. Remove everything. Cut the fibra, osteotomy was done. Place the ring external fixator and the chipped real line and temple fixation by using the R external fixator. And I'm load was in. Reconstruct one month, one year. Any question? <laughs> nice job. Can you get back to the last X-ray, please? Is it? The, the, the last slide. Yes. At the union aspect of it, was did he have any disabilities, especially at the ankle joint? Was there some sort yeah. of subluxation? Um, it looks a little bit rotated, but the uh, 
I compare to the uh, other side. The, he has the. This is the, his uh, natural, and okay. uh, so as long uh, as the functional the outcome is good, I think it should. Yes. Be okay. Yeah. He complained no pain, but a little bit the range of motion is uh, limited a little bit. Okay. But uh, he, the, he 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 was satisfied with the result. Yep, as long as he is happy. <laughs> <laughs> the final cases. In the 42 years old male fall from the second floor of a factory while walking and the right pillow fracture and the right fibra and the other fractures. The, the problem is this. This pillow fracture. Two weeks uh, open reduction of the performance, but uh, not uh, but bad. But fixation was done. And uh, four weeks uh, breakage of the Great, and uh, I, I don't know why they compared the uh, desire of external fixator. They were not uh, familiar to use this uh, kind of the external fixator, and infection was occurred. They removed their external fixator off, and uh, antibiotic uh, loaded cement was placed, and he was transferred to us. The problem is uh, osteomyelitis, non-union, pyogenic arthritis, bone defect, and deformity. How would you treat this non-union? Some opinion? Very bad case. <laughs> Is a soft tissue okay? Soft tissue was bad, but not so bad, and only the uh, sinus uh, uh, discharge. Uh, so the infection is still persisting. Yes. Hmm. Not so, not so severe, but the sinus drainage and uh, uh, the fistula like this. Maybe a Taylor special frame. Mm. Still be no, an option, I think. Mm. <clears throat> Any other option? <laughs> I think first you should go for uh, debridement and debridement again, and maybe mm. you just uh, would go for uh, a proximal osteotomy and lengthening mm. the. Uh, bone uh, with the compression of the distal side and get the alignment. But I think it's a, a tough case. And that ankle joint probably uh, would go to fusion. Hmm. I, 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 I use the uh, muscular techniques uh, the, at the first uh, removal of the integrated uh, cement beads and realign as possible. It depends on the skin condition and the temporary fix by stymon pin from the foot. And, uh, and the antibiotics, cement spacer was put on. And then the weight removed the uh, stymon pin and shipped and realign. And uh, from retrograde nailing, anchor fusion nail, and uh, put on the uh, bone graft with the artificial bone graft. The first muscular technique, first stage. The skin not so bad now. The blight, temporary fixation, and the tourniquet off and the uh, uh, additional development that are done put on the uh, cement and close. And incidental vacuum assisted closure was used. And this is the first mask ray. On the uh, second stage, this is our cement 
in this membrane here. Remove the cement spacer. And uh, still our alignment was not good. So chipped here, realign. And from retrograde, I'm load was formed and the uh, subtella joint. Uh, I, I'd like to save the subtella joint, uh, but uh, a little bit uh, in phase. And uh, cancellar spawn and beta TCP com mixture. And uh, graft is the back. Six months, the bone is good. Okay. Nice side. Take home message is chipping technique is used for, for deformity correction of fracture related complications. Any question? This is this is relative. Uh, this is relatively. I wouldn't say new. Uh, you mm -hmm. said it's been there for some time. You have presented this about. Uh, you have written an article about this. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So this is something to consider. I think it's a good learning uh, uh, message what? that we will be taking home from this. <laughs> Omar, have you seen this before? <laughs> Sorry? Omar, have you seen this before? No. no. I haven't either. I haven't either. Very I, nice. I, I, I haven't, haven't either. either. Uh, no, the, the thing is, it is uh, very interesting. It's the thing is, uh, will we be able to replicate this in our center is the question. <laughs> You just have to try it out and then yeah, know. Try it out. Just try it out. No other way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Thank you very much. Any Thank questions? Much. Anyone with time? We're just going to call it Yoshi technique now rather than chipping. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Uh, what are the top three tips for people that want to use your chipping technique? You know, how, how wide should your osteotones be? How, how big should the zone of chipping be? What are the, the best advice you can give people wanting to try it? Yes, uh, and... Uh, Yoshi? Pardon? No, uh, Roger is basically asking... Yeah? Uh, what are the tips that you will give in a quick, quick uh, a sentence or two? What is mm -hmm. the zone of area that you would actually want to... Uh, chip, do the chipping. What is the large area? Uh, and uh, the, 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 the tips is a uh, uh, long boy here. You cannot decide. The, the osteotome is the longitudinally press and hit. It's the tips. And uh, if the, uh, sometimes I use the uh, transverse direction, but usually longitudinally is the very important tips. In line of the bone. Simple mm -hmm. as that. Yeah? yeah, in line of the bone. Yeah. Right. Anyone Thank else? You, Dr. Watanabe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, then I guess no more questions. So we... Yeah. I have a final question. Is yes. there any special instrumentation you use? Pardon, pardon? pardon? Any special instrumentations? He's using a chisel and an osteotome. Oh, just yeah, a yeah, yeah, one? I, I, no, no, not special instrument. A teaser or osteotome. Usually you use it. No motorized uh, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no special instrument. You're going to get one in the hardware shop soon. Mm. <laughs> okay. Thank no you. Story. Thank you for. <laughs> no, so so we've come to the end of today's make. program. I would like to thank our guest especially, uh, and I consider uh, Dr. Jane Ward to be our guest because she's not from the Asia Pacific region, and the rest of us are actually Asia Pacific people. But I would like to thank you all for 
your wonderful presentations, for having taken off your time to give some, such wonderful lectures. Thank you very much. And we call it a day for today. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Akan. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Uh, Yogesh, we end it.